Chapter One The steel toe of my boot slammed into the blonde merc's knee with a satisfying crunch. He went down with a curse, but the two men holding my arms didn't release me, even as I struggled in their grasp. The blow had been more luck than skill, but it was enough to make the fourth mercenary pause before trying to grab my legs again. I planted my feet and pushed back as hard as I could. The men behind me barely budged. I was a decently strong woman, but they each outweighed me by fifty or more pounds and the physics just weren't on my side. My self-defense tutor had warned me that one day I would regret slacking off in lessons. Turns out she was right. Stop fighting, you little bitch, or I'll stun you again, the blonde warned. He climbed to his feet and waved his stun stick as if I needed a visual reminder. He wasn't the ship's captain, so he must be the mercenary commander. He was young for commander, but mercs weren't known to have long lives. The ship's captain stood back while the merc crew tried to wrestle me farther into the ship. The skin around his left eye was fiercely red. He'd have a shiner by tomorrow, thanks to me. That blow had been more skill than luck, but not enough to save me. The captain was a handsome man, older, with dark hair that was gray at the temples. He looked like a gentleman, not a bounty hunter, and that had allowed him to get close enough to grab me. The rest of his crew was standard-issue mercenary, big, mean, and calculating. As soon as I'd caught sight of them, I'd known that I'd made a mistake. I hoped it wouldn't be my last. I fought on, determined. As long as the ship was still docked, I had a chance. I could escape and disappear into the crowd of the space station until I could find another ship. I was good at hiding. The blonde lost his patience. Before I could kick him away, he hit me with a stun stick. I screamed as my body lit up in agony. The mercs dropped me. My head hit the metal deck and pain blazed bright before dulling to a low throb. The world went dark and floaty. John, what are you doing? Don't hurt her, the captain shouted. If she shows up with so much as a bruise, von Hasenberg will kill the lot of us. Where do you want her? One of the other men asked. She can stay in my... The captain started, but the blonde, presumably John, cut him off. Put her in with Locke. That'll teach the little hellion a lesson. It's not like he's using the space anyway. The crew laughed uneasily. Whoever Locke was, he made them nervous, and it took a lot to rattle a merc crew. Yay for me. I tried to struggle as they picked me up by my arms and legs, but my muscles weren't responding, thanks to the blow to the head. And the nanobots in my blood that should have been repairing any tissue damage were also susceptible to the stun stick. They'd recover in a few minutes, but until then I had to wait for natural healing. Nanobots, or nanos, were available to anyone who could afford the exorbitant price tag. I'd been injected with them as a newborn. A door squeaked open and the men cursed quietly as they tried to maneuver me through the opening. Put her on the bed, the captain said. Carefully. Why, Gerald, you shouldn't have. A deep voice rumbled from within the room. I didn't, the captain snapped. She's worth three times what you are, Locke, so you don't want to make me choose which one of you to keep, he continued. Keep your comments to yourself or I'll purge you. Same thing happens if you even look at her sideways. One of the men grumbled something too low to catch. She gave you that eye. Locke asked. Did you try to get some on the side and she took offense? Stun him, the captain said flatly. The electric hiss of a stun stick was followed by a grunt. I'd never heard anyone get stunned without screaming. It didn't seem possible. I cracked my eyes open a tiny bit. The light panel on the ceiling glowed softly. Were there supposed to be two of them? She's coming too, one of the men warned. I squinted, trying to get my vision clear. And when that didn't work, I closed my eyes and willed the nanos to work faster. They weren't affected by my desire for speed, sadly, so I resigned myself to wait. Everyone out. Pull up the separator and leave it up, 
Let's see how the little princess likes her new palace, John said. The faint ozone smell of an active energy field reached my nose. Booted footsteps exited the room. Then the door creaked closed and locked with a metallic thunk. I wiggled my fingers and toes. It was a start. You alive? Locke asked. Mostly, I slurred. They stunned me, then dropped me headfirst onto the deck. I'll live. Where are we? Station orbiting Theta Sagittaria Dwarf One, I said. I sat up and closed my eyes against the lightheadedness. In addition to my throbbing head, I was sore from being hit with a stun stick twice in an hour. Overall, it could have been worse. But not by much. Damn, he muttered. I was with him there. I didn't know why he was concerned, but I knew that we were just two short jumps away from the gate that would deliver us directly to Earth. That only gave me a little over a week, in open space, no less, to escape. I cracked my eyes open. I sat on a narrow cot with a thin mattress and no sheets or blankets. A quick glance confirmed I was in a standard holding cell on a Yamato frigate. Only the Yamatos etched their house symbol, a crane on every door. Far more interesting than the Yamato door was the man sharing the cell with me. Even through the slight distortion of the blue energy barrier, I saw that deeply bronzed flesh wrapped his heavily muscled frame. Broad shoulders tapered to a narrow waist with rippling abs. Defined arms and muscled legs completed the picture. It was only after I'd stared for a solid five seconds that I realized why I was seeing quite so much of him. He had been stripped down to only a skin-tight pair of black boxer briefs. I jerked my gaze up to his face and blinked in surprise when I met luminescent eyes. But when I met his eyes a second time, they were brown. Ocular augments existed, but as far as I knew, they permanently altered your eyes. It could have been a trick of the light but it was worth watching. His gaze was sharp and direct. Several weeks' worth of dark beard shadowed his jaw. His hair was the same length, and I wondered if he normally kept his head shaved. The scruffiness made it hard to tell his exact age, but he was probably a few years older than my 23. Like what you see? He asked with a smirk. Yes, I said after a few more seconds of frank appraisal. Surprise flashed across his face. But why would I lie? He was beautifully built. He was perhaps not conventionally handsome, but he had a deep, primal appeal. One glance and you knew that this was a man who could take care of problems. I had that deep, gravelly voice, and he was temptation incarnate. Now that I wasn't mesmerized by the amount of flesh on display, I saw that he was chained to the wall behind him from both ankles and wrists. The chains disappeared into the wall and their length could be adjusted. Right now, they were short enough that he couldn't sit comfortably. Whoever he was, the mercs weren't taking any chances with him. I stood and wavered as sore muscles protested. Damn stun sticks to hell. With the bed taking up more than half of the floor space, there was barely any room to walk. I knew from the schematics that the cell was a meter and a half wide by three meters long. The barrier dropped down just past the two-meter mark, leaving my unfortunate cellmate trapped in a one-and-a-half-by-one-meter box. He wouldn't be able to lie flat even if they released the chains enough to let him. The barrier was blue, which should mean safe, but I'd known some people who thought it was funny to reprogram the system. I carefully reached out a finger and pressed it against the field. I didn't get shocked, so I wouldn't have to worry about avoiding it. Today was finally looking up. What are you doing? Locke asked. Exploring. He raised a skeptical eyebrow but didn't say anything else. In addition to the bed, the only other features of the room were a tiny sink and on the other side of the barrier, a toilet. The cell wasn't designed to be permanently divided the way the mercs were using it. The barrier was meant to hold the prisoner away from the door while the cell was cleaned or maintained. Do you know how many crew are on board? I asked. 
At least eight. Maybe nine. A merchant ship of this size could be efficiently managed by as few as six, but the standard crew size was between eight and ten. If it was loaded out for maximum crew space, they could have up to fourteen. The lights flickered, and the floor vibrated with the subtle hum of running engines. The captain wasn't wasting any time getting underway. I moved around the room, touching the cool steel walls seemingly at random. I knew we were being watched, and I didn't want to make our audience nervous just yet. First time in a cell. It's rather small, I said. Locke barked out a laugh. You get used to it. Let me guess. You're a surfacer. Surfacers were people who grew up primarily on planets. Every day they woke up to big blue or green or pink skies. Lots of solid ground under their feet and plenty of room to roam. Spacers, the people who grew up in the ships and stations floating around and between those same planets, seemed to think that surfacers had it easier. Even I knew that wasn't always the case. What gave me away? I asked. I'd lived entirely on ships and stations for the last two years. I'd gotten used to the smaller spaces, but I still longed for the wide open blue sky in my home. His answer was interrupted by a male voice through the intercom speaker. Stand away from the door. I had not expected anyone so soon, and this cell didn't give me much room to fight. Chains rattled behind me. I glanced back as Locke stood to his full height. At a meter eighty in boots, I was a tall woman. Locke still had me beat by at least ten centimeters. Damn. Why were the attractive ones always criminals? The door swung inward to reveal a young man with a shaggy mop of blonde hair that looked like it had never seen a brush. He held an armful of frilly fuchsia fabric and a stun stick. Give me any trouble and I've got permission to zap you, he warned. Give me any trouble and you'll get a boot to the teeth, I replied. No permission required. He almost smiled. What do you know? A merc with a sense of humor. It was like I'd found a unicorn. I'd have to blame it on his age because he looked all of 16. You're having dinner with the captain, he said. Here's your dress. He dropped the frilly monstrosity on the bed. No, I said. I didn't balk because of the frills, which were horrible, or the color, which was equally horrible. I refused because it was a dress. I had no problem with dresses in general, but on a ship full of hostile men... It was smarter for everyone if I didn't go out of my way to advertise the fact that I was female. Um, no to which part? He asked hesitantly. I'll dine with the captain, but I'm wearing my own clothes. I had on a sturdy pair of black cargo pants, heavy black boots, and a long-sleeved black shirt. I wasn't trying to win Monochromatic Monthly's Best Dressed Award, but black was easy to find, easy to match, and generally didn't show any dirt or grease stains as fast as other colors. Win, win, win. Uh, I tilted my head ever so slightly and let my expression frost over. I'll dine with the captain, but I will be wearing my own clothes. He ducked his head. Yes, ma'am, he said. Right this way. A deep chuckle followed us out. The kid gripped the stun stick like he expected me to jump him at any moment. I guess word of my arrival had already spread to the rest of the crew. And honestly, if they'd sent anyone else, I probably would have made an attempt at escape. If it came down to it, I would go through the kid if he stood between me and freedom. But it wouldn't be my first choice. As we walked, I took in my surroundings. The captain had not spent much on interior upgrades. The walls were flat gray metal. The floor was steel grating and the lights were few and far between. I saw at least three major wiring issues that would get them grounded if a safety officer ever bothered to do an inspection. The ship was holding up well for her age, but it was apparent that either the captain or his crew didn't truly love her. I, however, saw plenty to love. Access panels were open or missing. The wiring issues would be an easy way to disable some key ship systems, and the layout matched the reference layout so I could find my way around even in the dark. 
the kid led me to the captain's chambers, which were exactly where I expected them to be. Yamato had been making this style ship for approximately a thousand years, give or take a few, and I was suddenly very glad that they liked to stick to tradition. The captain's entertaining space was brightly lit, with real wood floors, thick rugs, and antique furniture. A table that could seat sixteen dominated the middle of the room. Two place settings were laid out on the right side. The captain sat in an overstuffed chair next to a sideboard that was being used as a liquor cabinet. He rose to meet me. The skin around his left eye was already darkening. I pulled on my public persona, affixed my politest smile to my lips, and tried not to think stabby thoughts. Thank you for the dinner invitation, Captain. Of course, my dear, of course, he said. Ada, may I call you Ada? He continued before I had a chance to respond. I know we got off to a bad start, but now that we are underway... I thought we could put all of that behind us. I know your father is quite eager to have you home. I'm sure he is, I murmured. Albrecht von Hasenberg was nothing if not thorough. When his security team couldn't find me and drag me back for my engagement party, he went above and beyond by posting an enormous bounty for my safe return. Of course, he told the news, he was devastated that I was missing. He failed to mention that I had left of my own volition, or that I'd been gone for two years. Can I get you some wine? Or perhaps brandy? The captain asked. Wine would be lovely, thank you, I said. I knew where this road led. I've been playing this game since I could talk. The captain wanted something, and he thought, rightly, that House von Hasenberg could help him get it. As patriarch of one of the three high houses, very few people in the universe wielded more power than my father. As the fifth of six children, I wielded no power in House von Hasenberg at all. But the good captain didn't know that. And outside of the consortium, my name carried its own power. Captain, please, call me Gerald, he interrupted as he handed me a glass of wine with a shallow bow. Gerald Pearson. At your service. I let a chill creep into my expression, and he flushed. You did not interrupt a member of a high house if you wanted to keep breathing. By acknowledging who my father was, he'd moved me from bounty to potential ally. And now I was quickly moving to superior. It was his first mistake. But I didn't hold it against him. He'd never had to swim with the glittering sharks of the consortium. I had, and I excelled at it. I hated it, but I excelled at it. Gerald, I said with a dismissive little sniff, have you already sent word to my father that I was found? Of course, my lady, he said, practically tripping over himself to get back into my good graces. I'll let him know as soon as I return to the ship. I also sent along a copy of our flight plan. Interstellar communication could be slow, but we were close enough to the gate that the message had probably already made it through. I would not put it past my father to send a fleet escort to meet us at the gate. My escape time just dropped to three or four days. I sized the captain up as I toyed with my wine glass and made polite small talk. He was not a merc who had worked his way up to captain. He didn't have the hardness, the craftiness that mercenaries wore like second skins. A true merc commander would never be so easy to play. Shall we dine? He asked. Yes, thank you, I said. I made sure his wine glass was kept topped off and waited until the second course had been cleared away. How can I help you, Gerald? I asked in my warmest tone. It took two more courses, but eventually the story came out. He was a merchant fallen on hard times, but he still had a ship. He'd partnered with the bounty hunters specifically to hunt Locke. They found him a few days ago, but Locke had killed two men during his capture, including the previous commander. The mercenaries didn't respect Gerald, and he was afraid they were plotting his demise. And he was just so lucky to have found me because his third cousin once removed was married to a von Hasenberg's second cousin's sister-in-law, and he just knew he had a great deal he could contribute to the house, 
considering he was almost a family. I nodded along and made all the right encouraging noises. The picture became clear. Even if I managed to overpower Gerald and take him hostage, the mercs wouldn't care. He'd already created the flight plan, so the ship would deliver us to Earth without any further input from him. It was time to end the evening. I should go, I said. You should stay, he slurred. You can sleep in my room. He staggered to his feet. I considered it. He was drunk enough that he'd probably be asleep as soon as he hit the bed. But I needed time to devise an escape plan, and I couldn't be caught wandering around the ship. So I just had to make sure this wasn't my last dinner with the captain. I stood as well. Gerald, you naughty man. I laughed and lightly touched his arm. I never sleep with a man on the first date. He flushed and spluttered. I didn't mean... The tone of the engine changed, and my stomach dropped as the FTL drive engaged. We traveled far enough away from the station for our first jump. The lights flickered as the ship switched to auxiliary power. The hum of the engines ratcheted up and then went silent. Less than a minute later, my stomach settled and the main engine started up again. Depending on the age of the ship, it would take up to a week to recharge the FTL drive for the next jump. I had to be gone before that time was up. I will see you tomorrow for dinner, yes? I asked with a coy smile. Yes, yes, of course, my lady. The lad will see you back to your quarter. He flinched. I'm terribly sorry for your accommodations, but I'm afraid the mercs won't like it if I move you. It is fine. I like it. It makes me feel safe. And I was surprised to find that it was true. The same kid from before was waiting for me outside of the captain's door. I wondered if he stood there all the time. And if so, was he looking out for the captain's interests or the mercenaries? What's your name? I asked. Charles. But everyone calls me Chuck. Chuck? I'm Ada. Pleased to meet you. He ducked his head but didn't respond. We returned to my cell by the same path we'd taken earlier. When we arrived, the display next to the door showed Locke still standing in the back section. He had to have been standing for hours, but he wasn't slumped or fidgeting. I made a quick decision that I hoped I wouldn't come to regret. The captain said to lower the barrier, I said so that if I need to use the facilities, they are available. Mm. Chuck stole a glance at the control screen, but he clearly had no idea what to do. I swept past him. Allow me. I don't think... But I was already tapping on the screen. I lowered the separator, set the lights to stay on all night at a dim setting, and lengthened Locke's chains. He wouldn't be able to stretch out, but at least he could sit and I would remain out of his reach. Easy peasy, I said. I could teach you if you'd like. The kid eyed the video display with distrust, but it was easy to see that Locke remained chained. I prayed that Locke wouldn't move and give away the fact that his chains were longer, but he still stood in the same position. I wondered if he was sleeping standing up. Was that even possible? I don't need help from you. Chuck said. The crew is teaching me everything I need to know. He swung the door open. Now get in there and don't give me any trouble. I entered the dim cell and the door slammed closed behind me. Without the energy field separating us, Locke seemed bigger, more immediate, and vastly more dangerous. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Just had to keep reminding myself that we both wanted the same thing. I tilted my head slightly toward the door, and Locke barely shook his head. I hadn't heard the kid leave either, so I had to assume we had an audience. Did you miss me while I was gone? I asked. No. Ah, oh, that's too bad. Would you like to hear about the captain's quarters? No. 
I couldn't help the slightly evil edge to my smile as I began to describe, in excruciating detail, the captain's dining room. Every rug was lovingly described, as was every vase, flower, piece of furniture, and place setting. After five minutes, Locke stepped away from the wall with a rattle of chains. He's gone, but feel free to keep talking. I was nearly asleep. Did they feed you? I asked. He shrugged. I... I'd spent three months as part of a Merc crew shortly after I left home. I'd been on my own for the first time and thought, incorrectly, that being part of a crew would help my homesickness. It wasn't a total waste, though, because I learned a great many lessons in that short time, and the nomadic lifestyle helped me stay ahead of Father's security team in the crucial first months. One of the lessons I learned was that bounty-hunting mercenaries, by and large, were ruthless and sadistic. Even the higher-tier crew I joined was not exempt. They loved to torture their captives by providing just enough food to prevent the captive from dying, but not enough to prevent constant aching hunger. It also kept the captive weak enough to be easy to manage, so in their minds, it was a win-win. Locke did not look weak, but according to the captain, they'd only had him for a few days. I pulled two dinner rolls wrapped in a paper napkin out of one of the pockets on my pants. After all, what was the point of pants with so many pockets if I wasn't going to use them? And if they failed to pat me down after dinner, then that was hardly my fault. Sadly, nothing else would transport well, so it is bread or nothing. But I'm willing to give you these two delicious rolls in exchange for your name, I know the Mercs call you Locke, but I don't know if that's your first or last name or something they made up. You're trying to bribe me with bread. Yes. Is it working? I made a... I know who you are, Locke said. It was my turn to be surprised. I might be a von Hasenberg, but I'd never been in the spotlight like my four elder siblings. Those four all looked like younger versions of our father. Even poor Hannah and Bianca. I had the golden skin, dark hair, and blue-gray eyes of our mother. Only our youngest sister, Katerina, shared my coloring. And so you are? I prompted. Marcus Locke, he finally replied. Pleased to meet you, I said. I tossed him the bread, napkin and all. We might be making polite conversation, but I had no doubt that Mr. Marcus Locke would eat me alive if I ventured too close. Marcus Locke? The name sounded familiar. I mentally sorted through the rosters of important people in all three high houses, trying to place him. I knew he wasn't part of House von Hasenberg. He couldn't be directly part of House Yamato or House Rockhurst either, because he would have their name. So either he was a distant relation or an in-law... But I couldn't remember. Where had I heard that name? And who had he pissed off to get such a bounty? Let me save you some time, he said as if reading my mind. I'm Marcus Locke, the so-called devil of Fornak Zero, and the man with the highest bounty in the verse. At least until you showed up. It was only thanks to long practice that I managed to keep my expression perfectly placid. Now the chains made sense, as did the Merc's wariness. The Royal Consortium claimed that Marcus Locke had killed at least a dozen of his commanding officers and fellow soldiers during the suppression of the Fornax Rebellion. Then he disappeared. The Consortium put out an ever-increasing bounty, but so far no bounty hunter had been able to bring him in to claim it. Rumor had it that he'd been caught six or seven times, but every time he had escaped and left nothing but a pile of bodies behind. Marcus Locke was a deserter, a killer, and a traitor to the consortium. And he was just the man I needed. Chapter Two How long did it take you to perfect that mask? Locke asked between bites of bread. 
I raised one imperious eyebrow and stared down my nose at him, even though he was taller than me and across the room. After seeing the expression work so well for my mother, I'd practiced it in the mirror and wielded it without mercy. Lesser prey would flee at the merest hint of it. So, of course, Locke grinned. That long, huh? Longer. I sat on the bed and rubbed my face. After being on all evening with the captain, I was exhausted. Haven't had much use for it lately. I must be out of practice. You're supposed to be trembling with fear. It takes more than your pert little nose in the air to scare me, darling. He drawled, dropping the G. As if to emphasize his point, he stretched his arms and rolled his massive shoulders. He slid down the wall and sat. I suppose I have you to thank for this. He rattled the chain that bound his leg to the wall. At least now he could stretch out his legs. Seemed like the neighborly thing, I said. I scooted back and wedged myself in the front corner of the cell, where the bed was pushed up against the walls. I'd slept sitting up before, and being in a corner made it easier. With the bed attached to the floor, at least I didn't have to worry about him dragging me closer. Afraid. Smart, I countered. He grunted. Ships and stations usually operated on universal standard time, so it was the clock I was accustomed to. And right now, it was well after midnight. I needed to talk to Locke about a possible alliance, but I needed to be on point to get it right. I couldn't just steamroll over him like I'd done with the captain. He leaned his head back against the wall and closed his eyes. All of that glorious skin and muscle was on display, which prompted a question. Why'd they strip you? He cracked an eye at me. Easier than patting me down after I kept coming up with shivs. It seems they didn't share my appreciation of a good blade. You going to talk all night? Maybe. Would you like me to lull you to sleep with tales of the captain's tablecloth? His groan was answer enough. I slept fitfully through the first half of the night. I kept imagining Locke prowling closer, which would jolt me awake. But every time I checked, he sat on his side of the cell. After the fourth time, I eyed his chains, calculated the distance, and curled up on the end of the bed farthest from him. Lying down helped, and I slept better. I awoke to the cell door banging open. Rise and shine, princess. Captain says you get to use the crew head. John, the blonde merc who'd wrestled me into the ship, stood in the doorway. I could hear the derision in his voice when he mentioned the captain. Perhaps Gerald wasn't wrong about the crew plotting his demise. I obediently followed him down the same path I'd taken last night. But instead of turning left into the captain's quarters, we went right toward the crew quarters. More people were up and around this morning, and more than one merc eyed me a little too long. I passed another woman, but any hope of sympathy died when I met her baleful stare. She wore the dark camouflage fatigues that seemed to be the merc uniform and had her long hair braided down her back. Female mercenaries weren't rare, but they generally preferred either more gender-balanced groups or higher-tier squads. Being the only woman on a ship that could spend months in space was a tough gig, especially with the men that made up most of the merc squads. Cream of the crop, they were not. John stopped and pushed open the door to the crew bathroom. You get five minutes, he said. Then I'm coming in after you. He held up a control tablet with a lecherous grin. I stepped into the room and bolted the door. He could use the tablet to open the lock, but I wasn't going to make it too easy for him. The room was tiny, but brightly lit and surprisingly clean. A toilet, sink, and shower were the only features. No towels or personal items were anywhere to be found. I took care of business, then splashed water on my face. I'd love a shower, but there was no way I was taking my clothes off on this ship. A glance in the mirror revealed dark under-eye circles that made my eyes appear more gray than blue. 
my deep brown hair stuck up in every direction. Without a brush, there was only so much I could do, so I French braided it to contain the worst of it. My upper arms sported fading bruises from where the mercs had grabbed me. The lock clicked open and the door swung inward. Time's up, princess, John said. He looked disappointed that I was fully clothed and merely standing in front of the sink. It had been less than three minutes. He pulled me out by my upper arm and made a show of dragging me back to my cell. I let him pull me along instead of ruining the show by easily pacing him. Picking my battles was a skill I'd learned the hard way while growing up, but one that I had eventually learned. It took until my early teens for me to realize that banging my head against my father's will got me nowhere. Feigning compliance while ultimately working toward my own goals worked much better. All of my siblings had learned to be crafty in their own way because the other option was to become a slave to father's will, and we were all too stubborn to let that happen. I held my tongue, barely, as the merc shoved me into the cell. I suggest you hug the door, princess. It's exercise time. With that parting shot, he closed and locked the door. A few seconds later, the whine of motors and distinctive sound of chain links hitting the floor echoed through the cell. As much as I hated obeying orders, I backed up until I was leaning against the door. Locke was still an unknown, and with the amount of chain spooling out, he was going to have the run of the cell. I didn't think the Merc was stupid enough to actually let Locke reach me, but it would be close. That Merc must really hate you, Locke said. He rolled to his feet in a movement so smooth it was a thing of beauty. Or it would have been, if I didn't feel like a gazelle mesmerized by a lion. I'm pretty sure he's the one I nailed in the knee, I said, watching Locke warily. Then I didn't try for a shower, so he couldn't drag me out naked. I think I ruined his week. Do you think he's good at math? Locke asked. He was still near his side of the cell, but he was looking at the chain coiled on the floor. Shall we find out? Even knowing it was coming, the lunge was nearly too fast to see. The chains snapped taut with Locke less than a foot away. The Merc had been okay at math, but he was bad at kinesiology because Locke leaned forward until his chest nearly brushed mine. Sure, his arms and legs couldn't reach me, but that didn't mean I was safe. My, what big teeth you have, I murmured. The better to eat you with, my dear, he replied without missing a beat. I gripped the door handle behind my back, so Locke wouldn't be able to drag me farther into the cell. I rested my free hand on his chest. His flesh was warm and firm. He leaned into my hand. Up close, he was massive. It had been years since I'd felt dainty, but standing next to this wall of solid muscle, I did. Been a while since I was this close to a lady of a house, he said. His face was mere centimeters away. Don't make me stab you, I breathed. I knew the Merc was just outside, watching the video, and I didn't want him to know that I'd stolen more than bread last night. I'd hate to leave a hole in this beautiful chest. He chuckled, and some of the pressure eased off of my hand. Do you trust me? He asked in the same barely audible tone. Not even a little bit, I said. But you want off this ship? Yes, but not in a body bag, I said. You drive a hard bargain, darling. But fine. Give me your knife. What part of not in a body bag led you to believe that's even a possibility? I hissed. Too late, he said. I heard a shout from outside, and in a damn rookie mistake, I stopped focusing on the immediate threat to focus on the new sound. I caught the movement out of the corner of my eye, but I was too slow. Locke pinned me against the door with his upper body and his mouth covered mine. The kiss was hot and hard and over almost before it began. Metal screeched as the motors engaged to reel in the chains. Locke retreated across the room. 
I touched my lips. If he'd gone for my neck, he could have done enough damage that even my nanos might not have been able to save me. But instead he'd kissed me. Why? Locke was pulled all the way back to the wall and the energy divider went up with a hiss. The door unlocked behind me and I stepped away to allow it to swing inward. I composed myself. Then did the opposite when I heard the captain's voice. Are you okay, my lady? He asked. I'm not sure, Gerald. I sniffled. Everything was fine and then that man was loose and he was attacking me. And thank you so much for rescuing me. I wailed and threw myself into his arms. There, there, he said, awkwardly patting my back. John made a mistake, but it's all fixed now. Locke is safely behind the barrier. Why don't you lie down and rest and I'll have someone bring you breakfast? Oh, thank you so much. But don't forget to feed him, I said with a little shudder and a tilt of my head. I don't want him looking at me like I'm food all day. Of course, of course. Don't worry about a thing. The captain left, and a few minutes later, the kid from the night before, Chuck, came in carrying two trays. One was laid out with bacon, eggs, and waffles. The other held a bowl of oatmeal. Chuck glanced at me, the barrier, and me again. Um, can you... John must have forgotten. He set the food on the bed and backed up to the open door. Sure. I followed him out and stopped in front of the control panel. Are you sure you don't want to watch what I do? Just in case you need to know how. Chuck didn't say anything, but he didn't look away either. I showed him how to raise and lower the separator, as well as lengthen the chains so Locke could feed himself. Understand? The kid nodded and ushered me back into the cell. Thanks, he whispered before he left. Making friends, Locke asked. The mercs are holding the kid back. If I can help him, why wouldn't I? Why does anyone from a house do anything? For personal gain. He was not wrong. And it stung. I didn't mind helping the kid. And in other circumstances, I would have done the same. But in this case, the kid was between me and freedom, and if I could win him to my side, it helped me. But it took one manipulator to spot another, and Mr. Kissy McKissy face over there wasn't off the hook. Kissing me was his own form of manipulation. I tried to win him to my side with food and conversation. He went with a more direct approach. And the hell of it was, it was working. He'd had the opportunity to hurt me. And because he didn't, I found myself more willing to trust him. I needed to be careful, or I'd be outmaneuvered and left behind. I dumped the eggs and all but one slice of bacon on top of the oatmeal. It wasn't super appetizing, but calories were calories, and I doubted he'd complain about getting extra. I kept the waffles and remaining bacon slice. Reach out your hands as far as you can, I said. I should have put the food on his side, then released the chains. But I hadn't been thinking. He lifted his hands, but made no effort to take the slack out of the chain. If you don't want to eat, that's cool too. I set the bowl down and picked up my slice of bacon. God, I loved bacon. I eyed his bowl. Hand it over. He had stepped away from the wall and taken the slack out of the chain. I gripped the very edge of the bowl. No sudden moves. Because if you startle me and I drop your bowl, that's tough, I warned. I passed the bowl to him without incident. He wolfed down the food. They definitely had been starving him. I don't suppose you'd fill this with water, he asked, holding out the bowl. His chains weren't long enough to reach the sink. I carefully took it from him, rinsed out the residue, and handed it back full of water. He drained it. Again. I saw the slack in the chain just before my hand moved into range. He was fast, but this time I was faster. I pulled back and he caught nothing but air. I suppose that's what I get for trying to be nice, 
I muttered. Don't be that way. You know you'd do the same if the situation was reversed. I finished my breakfast and set the tray aside. I sat cross-legged on the bed and closed my eyes. I needed to focus and plan. Meditation had never been about empty stillness for me. Instead, it was when I did my best thinking. I cleared my mind of everything except the problem. Escape. This ship should have an escape vessel with a short-range FTL drive. New, modern warships with the fastest computers could jump several thousand light-years at a time. Ships like this Yamato frigate could jump several hundred, depending on how old the computers were. The escape ship could jump less than a hundred and probably closer to fifty. That, plus the increased recharge time between jumps, meant it could easily take a month to get back to a populated planet or a station if you weren't close to a gate. Gates were essentially giant specialized supercomputers. They could accurately plot safe jump endpoints millions of light years away. Gates generally operated in sets of two or more, not because it was required, but because if you jumped a million light years and didn't have a gate to calculate your return trip, you were either stuck or you risked jumping with bad data. More than one ship had ended up in an asteroid in the early days of FTL drives. To get to a jump point, you entered the queue. Depending on the gate's age and level of activity, it could take anywhere between hours and minutes to clear the queue because the gate could only calculate a fixed number of jump points at once. Older gates were the slowest, but they were often in deserted sectors. So it balanced out. Gates also worked as communication hubs, because they talked to each other via faster-than-light transmissions to calculate safe jump points around other ship traffic. FTL communication required vast amounts of energy, and a very precise, very expensive setup so most verse communication bounced through the gates rather than being sent directly with FTL transmissions. We were several hundred light years from the closest gate. The escape ship should have emergency supplies for 14 people for four weeks, assuming they hadn't been raided by the mercs. It was a glorified lifeboat, meant to hold the crew until their SOS reached a nearby ship. But for me, it was my ticket to freedom. So... Step one. Verify the escape ship existed and was in working order. Step two. Convince Marcus Locke that we'd make better friends than enemies. It was hard to manipulate a manipulator, but I wasn't the daughter of a high house for nothing. One thing I had to give my parents credit for. They raised all six of their children as if we were the direct heirs. We all had the same tutors, learned the same secrets, and honed our skills in the same consortium ballrooms. As the fifth child, I might be nothing more than a political pawn to be auctioned off to the man with the most to offer the house for my hand in marriage, but I'd learned everything required to be a von Hasenberg. Of course my parents didn't do it out of the kindness of their hearts. Let's not be crazy. They did it because I was expected to spy on my future husband's business and personal life for them. After all, House von Hasenberg came first even if I was sold to a man from a rival house or business. And father wondered why I fled. I turned my thoughts back to escape. Step three. Create a big enough distraction that Locke and I could make our way to the escape ship. My original thought was that Locke would be the distraction. But I wasn't sure I could bring myself to condone killing ten people, even if I wasn't the one pulling the trigger or holding the knife. You asleep, darling. No, I said without opening my eyes. And my name is Ada. You asleep, darling Ada. I cracked one eye open enough to scowl at him. I'm rather busy plotting my escape. Did you need something? You're never going to escape just by sitting there, he said. Of course not. I will escape through the ceiling. Or perhaps the wall. I haven't quite decided because it depends on whether I decide to trust you. I closed my eye and pretended to go back to my meditation. There is no way out through either of those. I made a noncommittal sound. I've spent more hours in these cells than you can imagine. There are no weak points. No way out except for the door. 
if you say so. I agreed easily. I waited. It took longer than I expected, but finally he growled. Where? I opened my eyes and met his stare. I will tell you when I trust you. Or you're making shit up. I shrugged. I could be. But I'm a von Hasenberg and this is a Yamato ship. We're competitors, you know. I know as much about Yamato and Rockhurst ships as I do about our own. Maybe more. How do I earn your trust? I smiled at the phrasing. He would have done well in a consortium ballroom. So I gave him an honest answer in return. Slowly, I said. But we may not have time for that. Captain Pearson sent our flight plan to my father before our first jump. Depending on how fast my father can free up ships and where they are, he's likely to have an escort waiting for us at the gate. If he received the message extremely quickly, it's possible he'll scramble a ship to meet us here. But that's less likely. Then I suppose Albrecht von Hasenberg won't miss the opportunity to bring in the devil of Fornag Zero. Not if he knows you're on board. He'll pay your bounty out of his own pocket just to be the one to bring it to the consortium. And there will be no escape from his ship. You don't know what I'm capable of, darling Ada. He rumbled. His voice alone was dangerous. It vibrated over my skin like a caress. And every time he called me darling, my heart tried to do a little flip, even though I knew it wasn't an endearment. Yeah, I didn't know what he was capable of but I knew that he was trouble. Chapter 3 Locke and I each spent the rest of the day lost in our own thoughts. I tried to talk to him a few times when I grew tired of thinking in circles, but he just grunted at me or answered with single syllables. Apparently, the knowledge that my father's fleet was en route had goaded him into moving up his own escape attempt, and he had no time for idle chatter. I ended up with two plans— one where Locke and I worked together, and one where we were adversaries. It was a fair guess that we'd both be going for the escape ship, so I had to either reach it first or make myself indispensable to its launch. By the time Chuck came to retrieve me for dinner, I still wasn't sure which plan was more likely to play out. I was so wrapped up in my thoughts I didn't notice that a third person had joined us for dinner until I was already halfway into the room. Hello, Gerald, I said. And I believe you are John, yes? I asked the blonde man who had dragged me back to my cell earlier. I smiled shyly. I kept the smile as he grinned lasciviously and bent to kiss the back of my hand, though I wanted nothing more than a smash a knee into his face. His presence meant he was angling for the open commander position. He also changed the game, and I subtly altered my persona. Mercs in general didn't take well to superiors, and this one in particular seemed to like his women meek and afraid. Even so, dinner was trying. John sat across from me, thank heavens, so I didn't have to ward off wandering hands. But his gaze rarely strayed above my breasts, and all of his comments were so rife with innuendo that it could hardly even be called innuendo. I kept my voice soft and my eyes down, though he never bothered to look that high all while mentally plotting the most painful demise I could come up with. Feeding him alive to the lava worms of Centaurii Delta-7 was currently in the lead. When the proximity alarm started blaring, I was in a dark enough mood to almost hope for a rogue asteroid. Or perhaps just a very carefully placed micrometeoroid that would find its way through the murk sitting across from me. I'd happily deal with the hull breach for hours if the universe would be so kind. Mayport! Show me the outside cameras, the captain barked, and silence the damn alarms. The far wall lit up with video feeds from outside the ship. It wasn't an asteroid. It was far worse. A Rockhurst battle cruiser filled the display. The designation marked it as one of House Rockhurst's personal ships. Somehow, I didn't think they were here to pay a social call. Incoming communication. The ship's computer intoned. Answer it, the captain said before I could caution him against it or find a place to hide. The video came up and Richard Rockhurst's face came into focus. 
the fourth of five Rockhurst children. He was a handsome man with the trademark Rockhurst blonde hair and blue eyes. At 25, he was only two years older than me, but he'd been in command of one of House Rockhurst's most prominent ships for nearly six years. The responsibility had hardened him, and the amusing young man I had played with as a child at consortium events was nowhere to be found. Rumors of the ship's more heinous problem-solving techniques were rampant, though no one had enough proof or enough power to officially charge him with criminal conduct. His expression didn't even flicker at my presence. He'd either known I was on board or gotten much better at hiding his thoughts. Ah, oh, Captain Pearson. I see the rumors are true. You have found and rescued my lovely betrothed. Hello, Lady von Hassenberg. I decided that quibbling about semantics would do me no favors. We weren't technically betrothed, as he hadn't asked and I hadn't accepted. But it had been a long-standing assumption that one day we would be. I'd left before anything official was finalized. My escape had not improved the already strained relationship between our houses. I inclined my head a fraction. Captain Rockhurst, I am glad to see you are well. As I am sure you are aware, my father has been notified about my rescue and subsequent travel plans. Indeed, my lady. That's why I'm here. Once he heard I was in the area, Lord von Hosenberg asked me to personally escort you home aboard the Santa Celestia. Of course, Captain Pearson, you will still receive the bounty for her rescue. If my father asked a Rockhurst to so much as take out his garbage, I'd eat my own boot. But neither of the two men sharing the dining room with me sensed anything was amiss. In fact, John was practically rubbing his hands together at the thought of getting paid earlier than expected. What was Richard planning? Shall I begin preparations for a transport shuttle? Richard Rockhurst asked. Of course, my lord. I will prepare our docking bay. Gerald said. Thank you. And please keep Lady von Hosenberg a safe distance away. I know docking accidents are rare these days, but I won't risk my future wife. Gerald was already nodding. Yes, my lord, quite right. She'll be perfectly safe here in my quarters until your party arrives. Thank you, Captain. I will contact you once our transport shuttle is prepared. The video screen went dark. How did you send word to my father? I asked. Was it encrypted? Gerald looked affronted. Of course it was. I used the high-priority merchant encryption channels. The encryption on the merchant channels was as easy to break as wet tissue paper. All three houses routinely monitored merchant traffic. Why, oh, why hadn't he used the diplomatic channels? At least those took some effort to crack. We need to jump. And we need to do it right now, I said. My lady, calm down. Rockers is going to return you to your family even quicker than I could, Gerald said. Besides, our FTL drive won't be ready for another three days. Rockhurst is not on your side. He's not on my side. He's a member of a rival house who just happened to show up in a battle cruiser, exactly where you said you were taking me on the insecure merchant channels. Because you used the merchant channels, my father will be hustling ships out here. But since they're not here yet, we're on our own. You're overreacting, princess, John said. I've dealt with the Rockhurst before. You just don't want to acknowledge when you're beaten. The Santa Celestia can hold two battalions of highly trained shock troopers with room to spare. It is routinely used to clean up messes that House Rockhurst once swept under the rug. The only reason they haven't blown us out of the sky... I'm guessing, is because they want me as a political hostage. The rest of you are collateral damage. Now even the captain was looking at me like I was crazy. Mayport, prepare the docking bay for transport shuttle arrival. Yes, Captain, the ship's computer replied. Opening the docking bay port. Expected completion, ten minutes. Merchant ships didn't have landing bays so they had to rely on older docking technology. And since a dock port was essentially a hole in the side of the ship, it was protected by heavy blast doors that had to be opened before ships could dock. 
John, why don't you go find a couple men to meet the Rockers' team? I don't expect trouble, the captain said with a glance at me. But it wouldn't hurt to be prepared. I'll send word when the shuttle is on its way and we'll meet you in the docking bay. John looked like he wanted to protest, but he decided leaving was easier than arguing. The captain refused to listen to my warnings, so we sat in tense silence as the minutes ticked by. Docking port available, the computer chimed. I clenched my hands together and sat like a statue. This would be the one exception where I would appreciate my father's interference, but the outside cameras showed the Rockhurst ship and nothing else. I had warned the captain and the mercs, so I no longer felt responsible for them. They had chosen their own path. Now I just needed to get myself off ship as soon as possible. It seemed like an age had passed when the computer finally said, Incoming communication. But it had probably only been 15 minutes. Accept, Gerald said. Richard's face once again filled the screen. We're all set over here, Captain Pearson, if you're ready for us. We're ready, my lord. Fantastic. I regret that I have to stay with the Santa Celestia, but I'm sending my second-in-command and my most trusted security agents to escort Lady von Hasenberg back, as well as my purser to settle our account. Thank you, my lord. I will go meet them in the docking bay while Lady von Hasenberg rests here in comfort. Richard nodded curtly, and the video ended. You won't tell him that we locked you in a cell with luck, will you? The captain asked hesitantly. No, I said. I didn't plan to tell Richard anything because I didn't plan to allow him to capture me. Gerald looked relieved. I'm going to lock you in. For your own safety, you understand. I'll be back with your security escort. I nodded. Already I could see the transport shuttle breaking away from the Santa Celestia on the video monitor. I had precious little time to act, so I needed the captain to leave already. He finally did, locking the door behind him. I went to the wall and slid open the cover to reveal the control panel. A password prompt greeted me, but I pulled up the hidden diagnostic panel and entered the default Yamato override codes. I didn't even blink when they worked. No one changed the default codes, because only a couple dozen people in the verse even knew they existed. And while Yamato changed the codes every so often to try to keep rival houses out of their ships, older ships often weren't updated to the new codes. I shut down several of the warning systems and unlocked the escape ship hatch. I pulled up a video of the docking bay. John and another merc lounged against the wall. The captain hadn't arrived yet. No one seemed armed. A glance confirmed the Rockhurst transport shuttle was nearing our ship. I pulled up voice control and added myself as a captain. Mayport, this is Ada von Hasenberg. Authorize. Welcome, Captain von Hasenberg. You are authorized. Mayport, close the docking bay port. Unable to comply. An inbound ship has already started the docking sequence. Mayport, unlock the captain's weapon locker. A panel to my left slid aside to reveal a neat array of weapons that looked new. I strapped on a blast pistol holster and loaded my pockets with knives and extra energy cartridges. Finally, I slung a blast rifle over each shoulder. The vid screen revealed that the captain had made it to the docking bay, as had the shuttle. The docking process was underway. Mayport, unlock the captain's quarters. I heard the lock disengage. I closed the weapons locker and moved back to the control panel, weighted down by my weaponry. I wanted to see what would happen in the docking bay. My own exit depended on how Richard planned to play this. The docking door opened and Gerald moved toward the shuttle with a smile and extended hand. A blast caught him in the chest. The two mercs didn't even have time to raise their weapons before they were cut down. A squad of eight emerged from the shuttle with military precision. They were in full combat gear, including full-face helmets. On the control panel, I quickly requested a copy of the surveillance video be sent priority to my house account. It was going to be a good bargaining piece against Richard. 
Now it was time for me to go. I exited the captain's quarters and stepped out into the hallway. The ship went dark. Mayport, switch to auxiliary power. I got no response. The Rockhurst soldiers had taken out the lights and ship's computer, but left the life support systems, including gravity. And they did it in less than a minute. If they had some sort of plug-in override, that would almost be worth risking certain death to retrieve. Sometimes even I couldn't outrun my von Hasenberg genes. Shouts erupted from the hall that led to the crew quarters as the mercs tried to figure out what was going on. I needed to move before they decided to come this way. But I was frozen in the dark. Luminescent eyes glinted in my memory. I headed to the holding cells, counting doors and following the schematic in my head. Once I reached what I hoped was the right door, I fumbled until I found the manual release. Lock? Been having fun, darling. His voice rumbled from the dark. A squad of eight Rockhurst soldiers just took out the captain and the power. A Rockhurst battlecruiser is pacing us off our starboard side. I'll pay you a hundred thousand credits to get me safely to a planet or station with an interstellar port and let me go. You can have the escape ship after that. I've already unlocked it, but the mercs might have the same plan at this point. You have five seconds to decide. I was met with silence. Marcus? What are you waiting for? He said from directly in front of me. I froze as he lifted one of the rifles from my shoulder and pulled a pair of knives out of my pocket. Holy shit, he was loose, and I couldn't see a thing. How had he gotten out of the chains? I fell back on my training. So we have a deal? I asked coolly. Yeah, we have a deal. Wait here, he said, pushing me just inside the cell. If you see anyone, shoot them. I laughed quietly. I can't see shit, I admitted. I know, but I won't be carrying a light. So if anyone is, shoot first, ask questions later. I'll be back in three. I didn't hear him leave, but I had the sense that he was gone. I pulled the pistol from the holster and flicked off the safety, grateful for once that my unconventional childhood had included weapons classes. I wasn't a sniper by any measure but if someone came down the narrow hallway with a light, I'd have good odds of hitting them somewhere fatal. Time stretched thin. Distant yells and blaster discharges echoed strangely through the ship. The docking bay was past the crew quarters. So was the escape ship. The overhead access tunnels would get us close, but the firewall between the bays and the rest of the ship meant we'd have to go through one of two main hallway hatches to reach the escape ship. I began to wonder if Locke had left me behind. The credits I'd offered him were a fortune by any standard. But if he'd decided I'd slow him down, he could have realized that being alive was better than being rich. A boot scuffed on the floor from the direction of the crew quarters. My heart sped up. Whoever it was didn't have a light. But Locke had not made a sound either time he moved. And I was loaded down with items that would make noise the second I shifted a centimeter. I barely breathed. Where are you, you little bitch? A female voice whispered from just down the hall. If she had night vision, I was so screwed. The air shifted in front of me, and a hand or arm brushed against the doorway. Ah! Her quiet exclamation was cut short on a wet gurgle, followed by a soft thump a little farther down the hall to my left. Don't shoot, Locke whispered. It's me. I re-engaged the safety and holstered the pistol. About time, I hissed. Oh, sweetheart, did you think I'd leave without you? I didn't bother to confirm what he already knew. I tried not to think about the woman's body just down the hall. It turned out the darkness was good for one thing, at least. I couldn't find you any goggles, so you'll just have to trust me and follow my lead. The soldiers have three mercs pinned down in the mess hall, and for the moment they're at a standoff. We'll have to take the access tunnels to come down behind them. I was not looking forward to crawling through the access tunnels in the dark. Even with lights, they were claustrophobic. In the dark, one wrong turn could mean endless hours spent finding the correct path again. 
but the other option was a much longer route through potentially locked-down maintenance areas. So I swallowed my fear and focused on the next problem. I need to rearrange my gear. I jingle loud enough for them to hear on the Santa Celestia, I said. Before I could protest, Locke rifled through my pockets, rearranging knives and ammo to his liking. It was quick and professional. His hands didn't stray. My pockets felt lighter and I wondered if I'd been left with any weapons. I checked my holster. I still had my pistol. Locke must have been watching me. You have your pistol and a knife in each back pocket. Your side pockets each contain an extra energy cartridge. I have both rifles and most of the rest. Good job, by the way. You'll have to tell me how you managed to raid the captain's private stash. Nothing else worth having on this heap. I knew Captain Rockhurst wasn't coming over for tea, I said. I thought it best to be prepared. He chuckled, and the sound wrapped around me in the dark. How well do you know this ship's layout? I found you in the dark, I said. As long as the access tunnels still match the reference schematics, I know where to go. Good. You lead. The ladder is just in front of you and the hatch is open. But if I say down, you flatten yourself to the deck. No questions. Understand? And wait once we get to the other side. I'll go down first. If you can lead us to the farther hatch, that would be better. I'll see what I can do, I muttered. I stepped forward with my arms out until I found the promised ladder. I mentally pulled up the schematic for the ship. This tunnel should lead back over the cell we were in for 15 meters or so. Then it would branch left and right. The left branch would take us over the crew quarters. The right branch led deeper into maintenance areas. And then, after a few more turns, to the second bay access door. I'm right behind you, Locke said as I hesitated. I wasn't sure if that was supposed to be comforting or intimidating. Chapter 4 With nothing but the map in my head, I crawled through the dark, cramped tunnels until I was sure I was lost. When Locke hissed, Down! Behind me, I flattened to the floor. I didn't know what he saw, but since I saw nothing, I deferred to his judgment. He crawled up beside me though he was mostly over me in the small space. There's an open panel ahead, he whispered in my ear. Is this our exit? This wasn't the first open panel we'd encountered. So far, we'd been able to cross them without incident, though not without a lot of unflattering flailing and wiggling on my part. I thought about our route. We should have dead-ended into the firewall. Does the tunnel go left and right but not straight? I whispered back. Yes. Hallelujah. I'd somehow managed to find the exact exit I was looking for. This is it. You'll drop into a hallway that runs right and left, same as the tunnel above it. The hatch into the docking bay and escape ship bay will be directly in front of you. There's no cover in any direction. Stay put, and I mean it, Locke whispered. We have a deal, and I don't want my payday getting shot, but be ready to haul ass. I can't see, remember? Unless you get some lights on, the only thing I'll haul ass into is a wall. Leave it to me. Just be ready. He crawled over me toward the access panel. For such a big man, he moved nearly silently. Guards down the hall, he whispered after a moment. You are just over a meter from the access panel. I want you to very quietly move up until you can feel the edge of it, and then wait for me. Okay, I whispered. I heard the faint scrape of cloth on metal, and then silence. I pushed myself up onto my hands and knees and crept forward. I wasn't as silent as Locke, but I was quiet enough that I doubted anyone down the hall could hear me. I slid my left hand forward and my fingers hit open air. I traced the edge of the opening. This was definitely the access panel. The ladder should be on the near side, but I wasn't going to risk exposing my hand to check. Now I just had to wait. I hated waiting. The silence echoed until I wasn't sure if the soft footsteps I heard were real or imaginary. I flattened myself to the floor of the access tunnel. 
the footsteps became clearer. Someone was approaching from the hallway to the right. Had one of the mercs made it through the maze of engine rooms? The steps were quick. Whoever it was could see. Distance was hard to judge with the way sound bounced down metal hallways, but the unknown person had to be getting close to the final turn that would dump him or her directly into the Rockhurst soldier's line of fire. A few seconds later, the footsteps slowed, then stopped. For a brief moment, the ship seemed to hold its breath. Then the hallway erupted in blaster fire and curses. A high-pitched scream from down the right hallway proved that at least one shot had found its target. The left hall reverberated with another round of blaster fire until it abruptly cut off with a scream. Oh God, oh God, oh please, oh God. The soft, moaned litany came from the right hallway. It was hard to tell with my ears ringing from the blaster fire, but it sounded like the kid. Chuck. Had he been shot? I pushed myself up, even though I knew looking would do no good. It was still dark as pitch. Warm, wet hands gripped my wrists and pulled me headfirst out of the access panel. I flailed, trying to find something to anchor my feet before I broke my neck on the floor. The hands shifted to my waist and hauled me down and forward. I went for the knife in my back pocket. While I do love to watch a woman with a blade, Locke drawled as he set me on my feet. We need to move. You could have warned me that it was you, I hissed. Now where's the fun in that? I huffed at him and tried to move right, only to be blocked by his arm. I think I heard Chuck. We need to see if he's okay, I said. He's dead. I paused. I could still hear the kid moaning. It seems your definition of dead and mine aren't the same. I said, trying again to push past him. Trust me, he's dead. He just doesn't know it yet. But a shoulder in my abdomen prevented me from continuing. Locke lifted me so that my torso hung down his back. He clamped a hand around my legs and took off at a quick jog. I wrapped my arms around his waist to keep my upper body from flopping around. What happened to the rifles? I asked when I realized they should have been bashing me in the face. I left them in the cell, he said. Too much trouble to hump them through the access tunnels. Clearly, my observational skills were on point in the dark. We lurched sideways with a loud curse from Locke. An energy bolt passed close enough that I could feel its heat. The world spun and jostled as Locke moved quickly. He stopped and dumped me off his shoulder like a sack of potatoes. I hit hard on my left side. Pain lanced up my arm, intense enough to bring tears to my eyes. You said there were eight soldiers. Locke snarled in my ear. There were eight. Now there are eleven, and three of them are between us and the ship, and no doubt calling for backup. He pulled the pistol from my holster. Don't die. His presence faded. Lady von Hosenberg. An unfamiliar male voice called. Lord Rockhurst sent us to rescue you. Are you well? No, I am very much not well, you idiot. I muttered under my breath. Louder, I called back. How do I know you are Richard's troops and not more mercs trying to steal me for the bounty? Are you alone? I have no idea. My abductor dropped me here. I think he broke my arm. I cannot see anything. A light clicked on in the distance as bright as a dying star. I could see the door to the room outlined against the light, as well as make out the dark, bulky shapes surrounding me. My mental map had failed after Locke's dash through the cargo bays, but this looked like a storage room. The light drew closer. I curled up and cradled my left arm. I let the tears fall down my cheeks. It wasn't really acting because my arm hurt like the devil, I didn't think it was broken, but I had no doubt that the bruising would be epic. The light bobbed into the room. They'd sent a video drone. I could hear the low whir of its motor. I shielded my eyes as they adjusted. The blocky shapes in the room resolved themselves into storage containers. Locke had dumped me on top of a waist-high container, and I'd landed on the latch bar with my arm. 
I pushed myself up with a groan. This was not how I'd planned for today to go. The drone floated around the room. The soldiers must have been satisfied with whatever they saw in the video because a few seconds later, two big men in combat armor entered. Guns first. They swept the room before coming over to me. One kept lookout while the other attempted to pick me up. I slapped away his hands. I have had enough of being carted around like so much baggage, I said in my iciest voice. My legs are perfectly functional. He backed up with a murmured, Yes, my lady. I slid off the container and almost made a liar of myself when my left knee buckled. I fell into the soldier I'd just yelled at. Fantastic. My high and mighty, untouchable lady routine was certainly off to a good start. He held my arm until I'd regained my balance, then let go without a word. I need a light stick, I said. I cannot see anything. My lady, he started. I hit him with my mother's favorite expression. He reluctantly pulled a short light stick out of a cargo pocket and handed it to me. I clicked it on and the room became clearer. Thank you, I said. With only one soldier between him and freedom, I assumed Locke was already on his way to the escape ship while I served as a distraction for these two. I had a knife, but the odds were better that I'd stab myself than do any damage to two trained and armored soldiers. I was a decent shot because shooting guns was fun. Knife lessons were grueling, dangerous, and best avoided whenever possible. This is Bravo Team Lead. We have secured Lady von Hasenberg, the soldier next to me said into his mic. We are in Cargo Base 6, at least one active threat. Please advise. I couldn't hear the response through their helmets, but both soldiers nodded. We're evacuating you to the transport shuttle, my lady. Please stay close, the team lead said. The two soldiers shepherded me out of the room, one in front, one behind. We moved slowly as they scanned for threats. I thought up and discarded plans with blazing speed. While I would love to defeat two soldiers, who each weighed twice as much as me, in unarmed combat, I didn't think it was entirely feasible. Thanks, Brain, for imagining some alternate reality where I was infinitely more capable. But if I stepped foot on that transport shuttle, I became, at best, a political hostage. At worst, my abduction would set off the long-simmering animosity between our houses and plunge us into war. And somewhere between those two was the possibility that Richard would insist on going through with the marriage I'd been avoiding. No matter what happened, I became a liability. At least in the eyes of my father. So I did the only thing I could. I ran. Thanks to the team leader, I knew where we were, and the map in my head snapped back into place. The next time we came to a cross hall, I waited until the lead soldier had cleared it. Then I bolted. Stop! The second soldier shouted. I ignored him. I doubted Richard had given them permission to kill me, and while I'd seen a stun stick, I hadn't seen a stun pistol, so they'd have to catch me the old-fashioned way. With them weighed down by their armor, I was faster. The light stick cast weird shadows on the wall as I ran, but I could see, and that was all that mattered. The video drone followed me. I swiped at it, but missed and nearly lost my footing. I decided one problem at a time was all I could handle, and right now, distance was my friend. Footsteps pounded behind me, closer than I would have liked. I darted left at the next hall and hoped Locke hadn't left yet. With a long straightaway in front of me, I sprinted. I might not be infinitely capable, but I could run. It was a skill that came in handy more than once over the last two years. I'd chased down thieves and outrun mobs, and in one memorable case, did both at the same time. I'd also had a few close calls with House von Hasenberg security where literal running was the only way to escape. And nothing motivated quite like imminent capture or death. The video drone paced me but the footsteps fell farther and farther behind. Running blindly when there could be more soldiers lurking ahead wasn't ideal, but I was out of options. I had to get to that ship. I turned left and ran down the short hall that would take me back to the main hallway. All right, and another 30 meters or so and I'd be there. 
please let the ship be there. I glanced left as I turned right into the main hallway to see if the soldier's backup had arrived yet. My body found what my peripheral vision had not. I slammed into a wall of muscle that barely gave under the impact. An arm clamped around my waist to prevent me from rebounding to the floor, and a blast pistol went off behind my head. The video drone exploded in a shower of sparks. Locke had already pulled me back into a run by the time my brain caught up with the fact that he hadn't left. And he was wearing clothes. He looked so much like a merc that it took me a second glance to process that it was really him. When he pulled me into the port leading to the ship, I resisted. We need to open the doors. The manual overrides are out here, I said, trying to pull back. It would be easier to move the moon. No time. We'll blast them, he said. The doors that enclosed the bay were wired with explosives that could be activated from the escape ship. But that was truly the last resort because it failed as often as it worked. When Locke didn't stop to close the port door, I dug in my feet. The door! No time! He snarled. I shook myself loose. I'm making time. I won't be responsible for depressurizing half the ship. You go on. He left me. I cursed him silently while I pulled the heavy door closed. If we blasted the outer bay doors with this door still open, every unanchored person in the cargo bay would be ejected into space. And with the ship's power partially down, I wasn't sure the safety doors would close to protect the rest of the ship. While I had no love for the Rockhurst soldiers, they were just obeying orders. The mercs could go to hell, but it would be nice if Captain Pearson's family could recover his ship in one piece. I turned and ran for the escape ship. Locke was already closing the door, the bastard. I slid through the narrow opening and kept going. Once I made it to the bridge, I realized the ship was already powered up and ready to fly. Locke shouldered past me and took the captain's chair. Of course he did. His hands flew over the console with obvious skill, though, so I held my comments. Mostly. Stop grumbling and strap in he said without looking up. I dropped into the navigator's chair and clipped in. A quick look showed that we already had a destination plotted. Before I could check the stats, the outer doors blew and Locke cursed. I looked up from my console and saw that only one of the doors had blown. While the depressurization had slightly opened the other, it was going to be a tight squeeze. Warnings started blaring as Locke's hands raced. He unclipped from his seat and moved to the rarely used manual controls. What are you doing? I asked, alarmed. Computer won't take us out, he said. Going to have to do it manually. I swallowed. I knew how to fly a ship manually. All pilots did in case of emergency. But most pilots practiced just enough to pass the test and to be able to land a damaged ship in a large open field or to dock to a station with docking assist. We did not learn how to finesse an escape ship out of a partially open bay door without tearing a hole in the hull. Can you? I squeaked. I cleared my throat. Do it manually, I mean, without killing us? His eyes glinted as he glanced at me and his lips curved into a smoldering grin. Don't worry. I'm good with my hands. Heat flushed through me as I imagined those big hands on my body. Criminal, I reminded myself. Killer. He'd almost left me behind. But he didn't, an internal voice whispered. It sounded a lot like my neglected libido. Two years on the run didn't leave much time for fun. While casual hookups were common in the consortium, at least then you knew what you were getting. And you'd likely known the person for years. Hooking up for a one-night stand with a stranger wasn't usually my style. But looking at Locke, I might be willing to make an exception. Hold on, Locke said. He opened the docking clamps and nudged the controls. The ship slid sideways by a meter. Proximity alarms blared faster than I could silence them. Touchy, he muttered. My burgeoning confidence in his ability plummeted. Dying in space was not high on my list of ways to go. 
but at least my father would be pleased that I'd chosen death over capture. Do you want me to- I got it, he said without even letting me finish. With nothing else to do, I checked our plotted course. We were jumping to the only settled planet in range, Tau Sagittarii Dwarf 9. The ship's computer had little information about TSD-9. It was Yamato-controlled, which was nice with a rockhurst on our heels. It seemed to be a mining planet. The most interesting thing about the planet was that it was in synchronous rotation with its sun. So rather than having a typical day-night cycle, one side of the planet was always day, and the other was always night. The screech of metal on metal pulled my attention back to the window. We were nearly out of the docking bay, but our escape had not gone unnoticed. A half dozen fighters spread out before us, and a larger retrieval ship was en route from the Santa Celestia. I started the pre-FTL sequence. The engine noise increased, and heavy shutters covered the bridge windows. Screens flickered on, showing us the same view we'd had before, but now via video. All three houses had tried removing the windows in various ways over the years, but those ships never sold as well as their windowed counterparts. Humans liked natural sight. Incoming communication, the computer chimed. Declined, Locke and I said at the same time. I had no doubt that Richard already had someone hard at work on overriding our ship's system. It was much harder to do because override codes didn't work remotely. But it was possible. Another metallic screech, and we cleared the Mayport. Diagnostics showed that we had sustained only minor hull damage, nothing that would prevent us from jumping. It took a second for it to sink in. I can't believe you did that without killing us, I said. Well done. He grunted as he swiveled away from the manual controls. A few seconds later, alarms blared. I watched on my screen as he overrode the safety warnings and prepared to jump. The lights flickered and my stomach dropped. Normally, I wouldn't condone jumping so close to other ships, but desperate times called for desperate measures. FTL drives required enormous amounts of energy, but weren't 100% efficient. Some of the energy escaped at the initial jump point and caused a shockwave. For a little ship like this, the shockwave most likely didn't do any damage, even to the fighters nearby. But a large ship could easily destroy smaller ships when it jumped. It was why jumping close to a station was heavily discouraged, unless you wanted to start a war or get blacklisted. The engine steadied and the window shutters retracted, leaving a clear view of the vast emptiness of space. And for the first time, the magnitude of what I'd done hit me. I was alone on a tiny lifeboat, in the middle of nowhere, with a man twice my size. And he was a known murderer. Without the adrenaline driving me, fear crept in. Chapter 5 Locke turned to me. Do you want to explain why Richard Rockhurst wants you enough to board a merc ship for you? No, I said. It didn't surprise me too much that he'd figured out which Rockhurst was after me. The Santa Celestia was distinctive to anyone who knew ships. He grinned. Fair enough. But you should have told me it was Richard from the beginning. You could have saved yourself a pile of credits. I would have helped you escape for free just to see the look on the bastard's face. You two have history? Locke's expression went cold and flat. You could say that, he said. His tone did not invite further discussion, and for once, I obliged. He unclipped from the manual controls and disappeared behind me. I steadied my nerves and idly played with the control panel when what I really wanted was to back up to a wall and keep him in sight, preferably while holding a gun or two. I heard him rooting through a container. I checked on our navigation. We were six hours out. I would love to get some sleep, but I wasn't sure if it was prudent or possible. I'm going to shower, Locke said. The door to the bathroom hissed open, then closed. When I didn't hear anything else for a few seconds, I risked a peek. The room was empty. I sighed out some of my anxiety. 
with lock contained. I used the time to stand up and look around. My knowledge of this ship was minimal because none of my training had included a scenario where I'd be on one. The bridge and the main room of the ship were basically the same. The back of the room had a tiny bathroom tucked into the port corner, a short hall connected to the exit, and a hatch to the lower engine level. Each side of the room had two columns of fold-down cots mounted to the walls. The cots were stacked three high, so there was room for twelve people to sleep. When they were all folded down, a narrow aisle down the middle of the room would lead from the bridge to the back of the ship. With the cots folded up, a bench ran the length of both sides of the room. Harness points were embedded in the underside of the lowest cots, so the survivors could be strapped in for takeoff or landing. The black harness straps stood out against the gray of the rest of the room. After two years on bland gray stations and ships, I missed the blue and cream walls of my old bedroom. One of these days I was going to have to decide on a planet and settle down and stay put, if only so I could paint my room something other than metallic gray. I hadn't tried it yet because in order to completely disappear, I'd have to cut all ties to my family, including my sister's. That wasn't a step I was quite ready to take. I was so caught up in my dreams of family and colorful walls that I missed the bathroom door opening. Movement in my peripheral vision jolted me out of my thoughts. I spun around, then froze. Locke had shaved the stubble from both his face and his head. The newly revealed skin highlighted a strong jaw, high cheekbones, and full lips. His black shirt clung to his broad shoulders and clearly outlined the flat planes of his chest. He narrowed at the waist, but still the shirt clung tenaciously, hinting at the defined abs underneath. I loved that shirt. His legs were encased in standard-issue Merc fatigues and dark gray camouflage, and he'd found a pair of black boots. He'd looked dangerous before, but now he looked deadly. It took all of my training not to flinch and back away when he approached. Your turn, darling, he said. There are extra clothes in the locker. He jerked a thumb at the vertical storage locker across from the bathroom, then gave me a once-over. Though I don't know if there'll be anything that fits. I was tall and slender, though I liked to think of myself as lithe rather than gangly. I had a fair bit of muscle, but nothing compared to most mercs. Thanks, I said, and my name is Ada. Locke crowded into my personal space, but I steeled my spine and refused to give ground. His slow smile did all sorts of terrible things to me. I know your name, Ada, he murmured. It was the first time he'd said my name without the derisive, mocking lilt, and it was far more devastating than I'd imagined. I suppressed my reaction and smoothly stepped around him. Excellent, I said. Dodging handsy lordlings without giving offense, or getting groped, had made me something of an expert at extracting myself from these situations. I was beginning to think you'd forgotten. I tossed over my shoulder. When the expected response didn't come, I glanced back at him. He stared at me with intense focus. The look made me want to freeze and hide, but I continued onto the storage locker. I couldn't afford to let him know just how much he was affecting me. One hint of weakness and he'd pounce. I dug through the locker and luckily came up with a set of men's clothes that would fit. I also grabbed a rucksack for my old clothes since they were the only other set I had. I could do laundry once we landed. I could feel eyes on me, but I refused to glance his way. I stepped into the bathroom and locked the door. I slumped against the tiny counter. Excess adrenaline made me shaky. I took deep breaths and listened for movement. I heard nothing but the constant low hum of the engines. Locke could easily breach the door. Even if he couldn't just unlock it with the ship's system, which he could, he could probably knock it down. It was a flimsy illusion of safety, but one I clung to. 
I wanted a shower, damn it. I undressed quickly. I had blood smears around both wrists where Locke had grabbed me out of the access tunnel, and my left arm was bruised. My nanos would be hard at work repairing the damage, but it remained tender to the touch. Nanobots were so expensive because they were crafted specifically for each individual's DNA. Cheaper generic versions had been tried, but since the infinitesimal robots circulated in the bloodstream, the body often saw them as foreign invaders and attacked. The results were not pretty. The nanobots were supposed to be good for life, but I'd gotten boosters every year with the latest and greatest new versions. When I left home, the boosters stopped. I couldn't afford them on my own, so now my nanos were two years out of date. I hadn't noticed any side effects, but it made me a little paranoid. One often didn't notice the silver spoon until it was removed. I unbraided my dark hair and ran my fingers through it. My hair hit just below my shoulder blades and was wavy enough to have a mind of its own. It had been longer when I lived at home. Cutting it had hurt. But long hair was more of a liability than an asset when you lived on stations and ships. I wet a washcloth in the sink and stepped into the circular shower stall. A ship this small didn't have a water recycling system. I had to settle for a sonic shower, but it was better than nothing. I hit the button for the longest possible shower. The shower screen advised me to lift my hair and close my eyes. I did both and also held my breath. Scientists swore up and down that the cleaning fluid was non-toxic, but I'd still rather not breathe it. Warm mist ghosted over my skin from the nozzles encircling the shower. A chime indicated I could open my eyes. My skin tingled as the sonic waves agitated the cleaning fluid. I helped it along with the washcloth. An additional round of cleaning started for my hair. A sonic shower would never compare to a real water shower but at least I'd lose the grimy feeling on my skin. My hair was another matter. Even with the extra cycles, it wouldn't get completely clean until I could wash it properly. Sonic showers just weren't designed for women with long hair, though they tried. Two rinse cycles and a warm blast from the overhead dryer, and I was done. I took a deep breath to prepare for anything, then opened the opaque shower door. The bathroom was empty and my clothes were exactly where I'd left them. Tension drained out of me. Showering was a risk I'd purposefully taken, but I hadn't realized just how wound up I'd been. I pulled on the boxer briefs that were my only option for clean underwear. They were surprisingly comfortable. Sadly, there'd been no extra bras, so my dirty one went back on, followed by the black shirt and dark camel pants. I was glad to see that my shirt didn't cling as much as Locke's had. Even so, I looked like his mini-me. A quick rifle through the bathroom cabinets produced a grooming kit with a wide-tooth comb. The shower had applied a detangler to my hair, but it didn't help much. I worked out the worst of the tangles, then left it loose to finish drying. I transferred the two knives and two extra energy cells to the pockets of my new pants, even though I didn't have a gun. Being prepared had saved me on more than one occasion. I bundled up my old clothes and shoved them in the rucksack, along with the comb. Locke wouldn't need it. That done, I squared my shoulders and shored up my defenses before stepping out of the bathroom. Locke was sitting in the captain's chair, staring out into space. He half turned at the sound of the door but didn't speak. I set my bag on the end of the starboard bench and then read the directions on how to lower the upper cot. It was as far in the corner as I could get on this ship, and it would give me a view of the entire room. The Santa Celestia has enough extra energy storage on board to jump again in less than 12 hours, possibly as few as six, I said. They could only do it once or twice before the energy was depleted, but those extra jumps mattered. All three houses were racing to get the energy requirements down and the energy storage capabilities up in our new ships, especially personal house ships. Smaller House von Hausenberg ships could jump once, jump again in six hours, and jump again in twelve hours. 
After that, they required two days per jump, and nearly a week without jumps to fully recharge the system. We'll be on planet before they make their first jump, Locke said. Yes, but I'd rather be off planet again before they make their first jump, I said. So I'm going to try to get some sleep. Once we land, there won't be time. So eager to be rid of me, Locke asked. He stood and stalked toward me. Yes. No, but the faster I'm off planet, the easier it'll be for me to hide, I said. I ignored his approach and snapped the cot into place. He stopped close enough that I brushed up against him when I reached up to raise the safety rail. I refused to back away. I met his gaze with a flat stare of my own. Do you know, he said conversationally, that you're the first person in a very long time willing to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with me without flinching or backing down. Even the mercs had more sense. It makes me want to see how far I can push you before you'll break. That drew a dry chuckle from me. The mercs weren't von Hasenbergs, and they hadn't spent their whole life dealing with the sharks of the consortium. I'll break, and thanks to my childhood, I know exactly when. I kept those memories tightly locked down and held his gaze. But it won't be today. He pushed closer until our chests touched. My nose hit him in the chin and I had to tilt my head back to meet his dark eyes. I gripped the cot's safety rail to keep from retreating. I'd gotten myself into this little pissing contest. Now I had to get myself out. Preferably in one piece. Locke's nose ghosted along my chin and down my neck. I stood stock still as his breath heated my collarbone. You're afraid, but you don't let the fear rule you. Locke rumbled against my skin. My belly did a little flip that had nothing to do with fear. You manipulate those around you to suit your will but you risked being left behind to save a bunch of mercs and soldiers intent on capturing you. You're a puzzle, Ada von Hasenberg. If you're done with the intimidation routine, I said calmly while I trembled internally, I'd like to get some sleep. Locke threw his head back and laughed. I could feel the deep vibrations where our chests still touched. It wasn't exactly the reaction I had expected, but it did get his teeth away from my neck, so I'd call it a win. Eventually, he stopped laughing, but he took one look at my face and broke out into a chuckle again. Don't look so put out. I wasn't laughing at you. Right, of course not. My mistake. I glanced away, strangely hurt. Locke eased my face back to him with a gentle hand. His thumb traced a blazing path of fire over my jawbone. I've never met a woman quite like you, he said. That's because you haven't met my sisters, I said lightly. I have three of them, and they're all just like me. Oh, I doubt that. I've met a fair number of consortium ladies. None were like you. You're far more interesting than any of them. I didn't want to be interesting. It would be better if Marcus Locke thought of me as a quick payday that he needed to protect until we reached the agreed-upon spaceport and nothing else. And when had he been exposed to consortium ladies? I was still contemplating the answer to that question when Locke wrapped his hands around my waist and lifted me up to the cot, nearly two meters off the floor. And he did it with complete ease. Heat curled low and threatened to send me up in flames. I slid away from temptation into the middle of the cot. Thank you, I said. You're welcome, he said with a knowing smile. Sweet dreams, Ada. Good night, Marcus. I pulled the lightweight blanket from its storage compartment and spread it out. I laid down with my head toward the back of the ship facing out from the wall. I could see nearly the whole room from here, including Locke sitting in the captain's chair. Under the cover of the blanket, 
I slipped a sheathed knife out of my pocket and clutched it close to my chest, like a child cuddling a teddy bear. I didn't think luck would attack me in my sleep, but I was not above being prepared. I slowed my breathing and let my eyes wander. I drifted off, watching Locke gaze into space. I awoke with a racing heart and a death grip on the knife. I knew my dreams were dark, but they dissipated like mist in my conscious mind. The hand clamped around my forearm, however, didn't dissipate. I jerked back and the hand slipped away. This is the second time you've pulled a blade on me, Locke rumbled. I'm starting to take it personally. My eyes popped open. A quick glance confirmed I still held the knife. It also confirmed it was sheathed. I hardly think a sheathed knife is dangerous, I said. Besides, you should know better than to grab a sleeping person. You were having a nightmare, he said. I slid the knife back into my pocket and sat up. Grit gathered in the corners of my eyes. I rubbed my hands over my face and tried to get my brain to kick into gear. How long was I out? A little over five hours. It's almost time to clip in for entry. Five hours shouldn't have left me this groggy. I'd kill for a cup of real coffee. Hell, I'd be happy with a cup of the synth stuff at this point. I shook myself out of caffeine dreams and climbed down the ladder set into the wall between the cots. Every muscle protested. I must have been tense in my sleep, fighting off invisible demons. I didn't have nightmares often, but when I did, I usually went all out. I stepped down to the floor and lifted my arms overhead, stretching left, then right. I folded forward and put my hands on the floor, enjoying the stretch along the backs of my legs. After I'd put sufficient distance between me and Rockhurst, I was totally getting a massage. I figured getting captured by Mercs and fleeing for my life with a murderer meant I was overdue for a little luxury. And the one true perk of being daughter of a high house was the ability to afford luxury. My house accounts might be under surveillance, but I'd funneled money into several private accounts before I escaped. I straightened to find Locke watching me with deep brown eyes. Every so often the light would catch them just so, and they'd flash, luminescent. If one of the other houses had achieved ocular implants of his level, this was the first I'd heard of it. All of the implants I knew about permanently altered your eye color to milky white and glowed in even the faintest light. It made it easy to determine who could see in the dark. If implants existed that could be hidden behind normal-looking eyes, that would be a strategic advantage. I tilted my head, studying him as he studied me. I hadn't planned for more than escaping the ship than running again. But I was tired of running, especially now that every merc in the verse had heard of me. I wanted a house and not to have to look over my shoulder every minute of every day. My von Hasenberg genes kicked in. Perhaps luck was the key to that future. Father would drop my bounty if I gave him Locke. Oh, he wouldn't do it easily. But Father could be swayed with the right incentive. I shook off the thought. Locke had helped me, even if it was just for the money. While a true von Hasenberg would have no trouble stabbing him in the back in appreciation, I tried to keep my backstabbing to a minimum. But by the calculating look on Locke's face, I wasn't the only one contemplating a double cross. I'd need to be vigilant once we landed. After I paid him, I needed to disappear. I stretched one last time, then dropped into the navigator's seat. Tau Sagittarii Dwarf 9 loomed large in the front window. We were approaching at the border of light and dark, so the planet looked like it was broken in half. Only a few faint lights glimmered on the dark side of the planet. A giant metropolis this was not. Atmospheric entry in five minutes, the computer chimed. The window shutters slid closed, leaving us with video screens. I tried not to think about how long it had been since this ship had received routine maintenance. 
Landing was hard on ships. The screens showed a bleak brown planet. A line of white-capped mountains marched across the border between light and dark. No greenery or oceans broke up the monotony. We were close enough to tap into the planet's information network. I pulled up the depressingly short wiki entry. It was dated a month ago. TSD-9 used to be a Yamato mining planet. Then the ore ran out. The miners and the diplomats moved on to the next planet, leaving behind the seedier elements that were all too happy to take over. The wiki warned that the dark side of the planet was best avoided. Smugglers had taken over the abandoned mining shafts, and outsiders were unwelcome. Those who wandered in often went missing. Lovely place, this planet. The light side wasn't any better, as it was rife with mercs. Every so often they'd go bounty hunting through the smugglers' tunnels. The largest city, Gamma Mine, sat in perpetual twilight on the border between the two worlds. Getting a better ship was going to be tricky. Usually I'd just book passage on the first ship off planet, but I had a feeling the options were going to be few and far between. This wasn't exactly a booming tourist location. I could afford to buy a new ship, but throwing that much currency around after landing in an escape shuttle would raise some eyebrows. Atmospheric entry beginning, the computer chimed. Locke settled into the captain's chair and clipped in. The planet filled the video screens. After time and space, it was always weird to realize that you were intentionally hurtling yourself at the ground in order to land, and that there was ground at all. It had been over a year since I'd set foot on a planet, because I'd mostly bounced around between space stations. Stations always had flights available at the last minute and weren't always the strictest about checking documentation. And the biggest stations were larger than surface cities anyway, so it was easy to get lost in the crowd. The escape ship shivered as it decelerated. We had to slow down before we slammed into the atmosphere or we'd end up in itty-bitty pieces spread over half the planet. All of the data on my screen showed our entry was proceeding as expected, but the next ten minutes were the hardest on the ship. A few minutes later, the telltale buffeting of atmosphere vibrated through the ship. The turbulence got worse as we descended. Thankfully, these seats had shoulder harnesses. I'd landed in a subpar ship with just a lap belt before and came out bruised for my effort. We were on course to land at the small spaceport in Gamma Mine. The city was both our best chance of getting off planet again and our best chance of getting caught. If the mercs caught wind that the two highest bounties in the verse had just landed in their backyard, we wouldn't have a moment's rest. Locke's hands moved across the screen and the ship blared a warning. Before I could ask him what he'd done, the ship dropped like a rock, throwing me into the shoulder harness. Blood rushed to my head and I fought the red out that lingered on the edges of my vision. If I didn't know better, I'd assume we were accelerating toward the ground. Another alarm went off before Locke silenced it. The uniform brown landscape shifted into hills, valleys, and fields as we descended. We were coming in way too fast. My hands flew over my own console as I tried to slow our descent, but he'd locked me out. What are you doing? We can't come into the spaceport like this. They'll shoot us down. When it came to casualties... Spaceports defaulted to protecting the assets already on the ground unless they had a really, really good reason to do otherwise. We're not headed to the spaceport and we're sitting ducks in the air. The faster we're on the ground, the safer we are. We won't be safer if we hit the ground at this speed. We'll be splattered. He grinned at me with a flash of white teeth. Trust me, sweetheart. I know what I'm doing. Trust was earned. And so far, Marcus Locke had done some, but not nearly enough to earn mine. I debated trying to override the lockout on my control panel while I watched the ground hurtle closer. But trust was a two-way street, and I didn't think Locke was suicidal. So I clutched the edge of the control panel and did nothing. Giving up control of my fate was harder than I anticipated, even though I knew Marcus must have a plan, doing nothing went against everything in my nature. Proximity alarms blared to life. 
Locke was laser-focused on the control panel. I dug my fingernails into my palms and said nothing. Distracting him would not help us land. We were coming down in a gently rolling area gouged by deep canyons. Flat areas big enough for the ship were few and far between. As we got ever closer, I realized the canyons were both deeper and wider than I first thought. And we were aiming directly for one. We were nearly even with the ground at the lip of the canyon before Locke fired the thrusters to slow our descent. The ship shuddered and groaned under the strain, but Locke only cranked the thrusters higher. We were nearly at the thrust level that would be used for takeoff, and still we descended deeper. The engine whine ratcheted up a notch and our descent slowed. My screen showed our landing location to be a relatively flat spot at the bottom of the canyon, still a hundred meters away. At fifty meters, the engines screamed as Locke pushed the thrusters to their maximum output. Brace! Locke shouted. I crossed my arms over my chest and pushed my head back into the headrest designed for exactly this scenario. We achieved a survivable rate of descent just two seconds before we slammed into the ground. I felt my chair give on its pedestal, absorbing some of the impact force, but we still hit hard enough to stun me for a few seconds. The engines shut off, leaving behind a cacophony of alarms. I hurt. I wiggled my fingers and toes before moving on to my arms and legs. Nothing appeared to be broken, but my whole body felt bruised from the inside out. You okay? Locke asked after he silenced the alarms. You crashed our only escape vehicle, I said. My voice sounded eerily calm to my own ears, like someone else was speaking. I heard him groan and unclip from his seat. The sound of his pain did nothing to calm my temper. I unclipped my own harness with clumsy fingers. I felt heavy and slow. Only part of that was due to the crash. This planet had slightly stronger gravity than the Earth standard most ships and stations used. You crashed our escape vehicle, I said again. The landing was within tolerance, Locke said. Now get moving. Anyone who saw us come down is going to come investigate, and we don't want to be here when they arrive. I locked the pain and fear and anger behind a wall of icy calm. I found my rucksack and started filling it with food rations and water from the emergency supply. Water was heavy as hell, but I'd seen no indication of surface water, so I'd only have what I carried until we reached the city. I also threw in the ship's first aid kit. It was heavy, too, but worth the wait. A quick check of the outside temperature proved that I was underdressed. I grabbed a second set of clothes from the storage locker. They were too big, but they'd work as an extra layer. The clothes and several emergency foil blankets went into my pack. I'd kill for a heat field or two, but Captain Pearson had been too cheap to equip the escape shuttle with him. There were no winter clothes at all in the storage locker. I put on two long-sleeved shirts and shimmied into a pair of two big pants. A belt kept the pants up, the shirts tucked in and the drafts out. I wrapped a final pair of pants around my head and neck like a weird scarf-hat combo. I looked ridiculous, but I hated being cold. I was slightly gratified to see Locke was wrapping himself up in much the same way. Ready, he asked. I downed a bottle of water and dropped the empty container. My pack was close to 20 pounds and not designed to carry that load. It would be uncomfortable, but it would get lighter as I went along. Ready, I said. Locke nodded and picked up his pack. We headed to the exit at the back of the ship. He checked the tiny embedded window, then opened the door. Ice cold wind with a slightly acrid smell blasted through the opening. It cut through my layers like I was naked. If the city was more than a few hours away, we were going to be in deep trouble. Locke disappeared through the door without a backward glance. I followed him out into the dim light. Chapter 6 
Brown rocks, brown soil, brown grass. Even the sky seemed vaguely brown in the twilight gloom. We'd been walking for what seemed like forever, but it was impossible to judge time because the sun hidden just behind the horizon never moved. At least it worked as a compass. The extra gravity dragged at me, making every step a little harder than it should be. The cold bit at any exposed skin, and I couldn't feel my hands, even though I'd pulled them into my sleeves long ago. My nanos would be healing any frostbite, but unfortunately they didn't help regulate body temperature or give me any extra energy. The sides of the canyon were steep and rocky. We were still on the canyon floor, trying to find a way up. I wasn't sure I'd be able to climb out at this point. Locke stopped and scanned the area. I dropped my pack and dug out a bottle of water. The air here was oxygen-rich, but extremely dry. I'd be out of water before the end of the day. I laughed to myself, a little loopy. The day never ended here, so technically I'd be dead before the end of the day, too. I pulled out an emergency blanket and wrapped it around my chest and waist between layers of shirt. Even with the constant movement, I was getting dangerously cold. I fumbled with my belt, but finally got it secured. I ate an energy bar, then shouldered my pack and turned to lock. If we don't find shelter and heat in the next two hours, I'm going to be in bad shape, I said. I hated to admit weakness, but I knew my limits. Even another two hours was going to be pushing it. He looked me over, then nodded. We're almost there. This canyon runs next to Gamma Mine. We need to exit on the left, so keep an eye out for a route. I'd rather not scale the walls if we can avoid it. Oh, I can avoid it, I grumbled. I regretted our hasty departure from the ship. If it came down to it, I'd head back there and wait for rescue slash capture. At least I'd be warm. Locke didn't bother with a response. He just turned and walked off. If he felt the cold, he didn't show it. He moved easily, with a spare, efficient gait that was beautiful to watch. He looked like he was out for a Sunday stroll, not like he was trudging through the bitter cold and inadequate clothing. By the time Locke stopped again, I could barely feel my legs. If I didn't get warm soon, I was going to collapse. We'll climb here, Locke said. I looked at the wall of the canyon he was studying. It wasn't vertical, but it was steep and rocky. The canyon floor had been climbing for an hour, so the rim of the canyon was only about 50 meters up. It was going to be a brutal 50 meters. I followed Locke with single-minded determination. I stared at his feet, willing my own to step in the same places, climb over the same rocks. I didn't look up. I didn't want to know how far we still had to go. Locke pulled me up over a large rock. I tried to keep climbing, but he clamped an arm around my waist. Stop, he whispered. We're nearly at the top. His arm was so warm. I turned and huddled into his chest, uncaring that I was snuggling a criminal. He was a warm criminal, and that was all that mattered right now. Shit, he said. When did you stop shivering? I shrugged. I didn't realize that I'd stopped. My whole focus had been on putting one foot in front of the other. I told you I had two hours. It's been two hours. I wasn't lying. How are you so warm? He didn't answer. Instead, he said, The city is surrounded by a fence, but not a good one. Stay here. I'll find a way through. I shook my head. If I stop moving, I'll die. If you want me to find my own way through, I will, but I can't stay here. Can you run? If I have to, and not for very long. He pushed me away from his chest. Frigid air stole the little warmth I'd collected until I felt colder than before. Stay here for two minutes while I do an initial recon. You literally have two minutes. Then I'm heading for the city with or without you, I said. Your time starts now. I started counting in my head. It kept me focused. My thoughts were slowing. 
I'd pushed myself too far, and now I was dangerously close to making a fatal mistake. Locke stepped a meter up the canyon, then froze. He didn't even seem to be breathing. He held statue still for thirty seconds, then slowly sank down. There's a hidden door. Just saw a kid sneak out and head for the canyon farther down. I don't think he saw me, but we need to move. I didn't see any guards. We'll run for the fence. I stomped my feet and promised myself the largest cup of real hot chocolate I could find. It would be an extravagant expense on a planet this isolated, but worth every penny if I survived long enough to claim it. Okay, let's do this, I said. Locke grabbed my wrist and pulled me up the final rise of the canyon. The fence was only about twenty-five meters away, but nothing gave us any cover. It looked like a hodgepodge of whatever the citizens had left over rather than a true fence. Old doors and windows, pieces of plastic, and scraps of wire were all held together by welds, ropes, and prayers. We pounded across the open space. It took all of my concentration to run. Twice I stumbled, and Locke's grip on my wrist was the only thing that kept me upright. Exhaustion clawed at me with soft, sweet fingers. We reached the fence and Locke dropped my wrist. His hand left a band of heat on my flesh. I wanted nothing more than to curl up next to him and leech away his warmth. I shook off the images of our naked limbs entwined and followed him down the fence line. The door was only visible once you were standing right in front of it. A bit of rope worked as a pull, and two pieces of barbed wire tied around a fence post were the hinges. This stretch of fence was on rocky ground, so no footprints gave away the location. Locke opened the door, peeked through, then reached back to pull me through with him. It was immediately clear that this was not the best part of town. Trash littered the street and the Plastec houses were dark and shuttered. Cheap and easy to build, Plastec houses were the first buildings to go up on any new planet. It seemed the local residents then decided to take matters into their own hands, adding levels with mud bricks and closing off alleyways with the same. It was either very early or very late because the streets were empty, or this section of the city had been abandoned. Well, that would help us hide... Mercs generally didn't seed sections of the city without a reason. Locke led us through the streets like he knew where he was going. I did my best to keep up, but the world was hazy around the edges by the time he stopped in front of a decrepit building. He paused at the door, then swung it inward and stepped inside. The inside wasn't any warmer than the outside, but at least the walls blocked the cutting wind. Stay here, he said. I blinked, and he was gone. How long had I been standing here? I forced myself to walk around when I wanted nothing more than to curl into a ball and sleep. In the faint light that filtered through the filthy windows, I saw that the front rooms of the house were mostly empty. A few pieces of broken furniture proved that someone had once lived here, but they seemed to be long gone. Come on, Locke said. I found a room with a heater. I followed him deeper into the house. It was dark enough that I couldn't see what I was stepping on. He stepped into a dimly lit bedroom, complete with a tiny bed and thin, bare mattress. It looked a lot like the bed in the cell on the Mayport. True to his word, the heater in the wall was struggling to warm the room. The overhead light panel produced enough light to see by, but it must have been set to its lowest setting. Locke shut the door and dragged what looked like a broken dresser in front of it. My heart rate spiked, and adrenaline cleared away some of the cobwebs in my mind. I'd followed him like a puppy into a room with a bed and only one exit. An exit he'd just blocked. Strip, he said. He started pulling off his own clothes. Oh, hell no. I backed away. He was strong and fast and not half-frozen. Even if I could grip a knife, it wouldn't do much good. That didn't mean I was going down without a fight. Locke glanced at me, then froze. He straightened. His eyes dropped half-closed and his mouth curled into a melting grin. 
My heartbeat kicked up and not from fear. The man could stop traffic with a look like that. Ada, he drawled. If I wanted to fuck you, I wouldn't have to lock you in to do it. He stopped across the distance that separated us while I stood frozen. I prefer my women warm and willing. And since you are neither, you're just going to have to imagine how good it could be. He cupped my jaw with a warm hand and glided his thumb over my lips. Now strip before you die of hypothermia and leave your underclothes on. By the time I'd shed clothes down to a short-sleeved shirt, bra, and boxer briefs, Locke was down to his own boxer briefs and had laid out several emergency blankets on the bed. He raised an eyebrow at my clothing, but didn't say anything. In you go, he said, holding up the edge of a blanket. I slid across the crinkly foil blanket to the edge of the bed facing the wall. Lights on or off? he asked. On, I said. Definitely on. I needed to be able to see him. Okay, he said. He slid into bed behind me and the mattress dipped under his weight. I tensed and held myself still on the very edge of the bed. A warm arm around my waist dragged me back against scalding skin. He cursed the air blue. You should have told me you were this cold. Modesty forgotten, I pulled his arm farther around me and wiggled to get as close to him as possible. With the emergency blankets covering me from neck to feet and a large, warm body at my back, I finally felt like maybe I would survive the day. I don't know how long I'd drifted in and out of sleep before the shivering started. But once it began, sleep was a distant memory. I shivered so hard my teeth chattered. Locke turned me over so I faced him and tucked me into his chest with my head on his arm. He wrapped both arms around my back and threw a leg over my lower body. Hours, or perhaps days later, my shivers slowed down, and I dropped into an exhausted sleep. When I awoke, I was alone in the bed. And I was warm. In addition to the emergency blankets, I was covered by two long cloaks. I rolled away from the wall and every muscle protested. Apparently shivering was a full-body workout. Marcus sat propped against the wall by the door, studying a small comm tablet. Do you want the bad news or the worst news? He asked without looking up. What happened to the good news? You're still alive, aren't you? He continued without waiting for a response. There are exactly zero commercial flights out of this shithole. Three days from now, a Merc ship is leaving for the nearest station. But for reasons that should be obvious, that's not our best option. Is that the bad or the worse? Wait, did you do a sweep of this stuff to make sure it's clean? That's the bad news. And yes, I checked for bugs. All of it is clean. The worst news is that Rockhurst's team landed two hours ago. So far, they don't seem to have alerted the locals to who they're searching for. But it may be only a matter of time. They landed the Santa Celestia here and no one blinked an eye? Yamato may have left the planet to the mercs and smugglers, but that didn't mean they'd overlook a rival house landing a battlecruiser on their planet, worthless or not. No, they left the Santa Celestia in space. It's too large to land here. They're in a smaller, unflagged Merc ship, probably one they kept in the Santa Celestia's hangar for covert planet landings. Mercenaries weren't required to flag their ships to one of the high houses unless they wanted to announce that they were under that house's protection, so an unflagged ship wouldn't raise any eyebrows. It was the perfect cover to land on an enemy planet, and one that House von Hasenberg had been known to use as well. Could I buy a ship before Rockhurst's men found me? Possibly, but it wouldn't be easy. I don't suppose you bought an extra comm while you were out, I asked. I was sorely tempted to yell at him for leaving me alone while I was sleeping, but it wasn't his job to be my babysitter. I should have woken the moment he moved. The fact that I hadn't meant I'd been in much worse shape than I'd realized. 
He gestured to the floor near the top of the bed. I slid over until I could see where he was pointing. My pack sat with yesterday's clothes folded on top. On top of that was a small comm tablet like the one Locke was using. It was a cheap, mass-produced model. I had a moment of silence for the top-of-the-line unit I'd left on the station where I was captured. Thin, handheld devices made of glass and metal, comms were the glue that held the universe together. I'd felt naked for the last couple of days without mine. This one was produced by a Yamato subsidiary, so it was in no way secure. I reset it, touched my right thumb and pinky finger together, then held the comm up to the tiny chip embedded in my right arm. The tablet chirped, then the screen lit up with welcome, Irina. Irina was one of my middle names, and Irina Hassan was a burner identity that hadn't yet been compromised. This tablet now belonged to her, along with all of her accounts that had been linked from the chip in my arm. The tablet synced to both local and universal time. Because the sun never set on this planet, they had conveniently decided to stick with universal time. It was approaching noon. I had a feeling that my internal clock was going to have a hard time adjusting to constant twilight. I checked my messages and found several from my older sister Bianca. I tried to keep her informed of my aliases and whereabouts, at least in general terms. In return, she let me know where house security was searching for me. Hannah and Bianca were my two oldest sisters. Neither had married happily, and they didn't want their little sister to suffer the same fate. They'd quietly cheered my escape and funneled me money on the sly. Bianca's messages contained neither names nor specifics, but I knew everyone at home was fine just from the way they were written. However, there was an undercurrent of unease and an implicit plea for caution. That was worrisome. I sent off a quick reply, letting her know in very oblique terms that Rockhurst was after me, but that I was okay. We were both using insecure alias accounts, so there had to be a lot of reading between the lines. I checked the news feeds and didn't find any mention of unusual Rockhurst activity. If they were willing to risk House von Hasenberg's wrath to capture me, I assumed that we were on the brink of war. Instead, it seemed like business as usual, a tense, hostile truce hidden behind a facade of friendship. Digging deeper... I found hints of Rockhurst movement, but nothing big enough to set off any alarms. Was I reading more into it than I should? Either way, I needed to escape this planet. The bank account I'd set up for this identity had plenty of funds to live on, but not enough to buy a ship. Even paying off Locke would be a stretch. I'd have to access my true account for additional funds which meant I needed to have an escape plan ready or I'd get scooped up before I left the bank. Did they find our escape ship? I asked. I slid out of bed and started pulling on yesterday's clothes. Muscles throughout my body protested, but I was up and moving, so I'd work out the soreness before too long. Locke glanced up, then returned his attention to his calm. I guess slowly pulling on a pair of men's pants while moving like a little old lady wasn't super alluring. I didn't see it at the spaceport, he said. But I assume so. If they're smart, they left it in the canyon and either disabled it or put trackers on it. So returning to the escape ship was a non-starter. A crazy idea occurred to me. How nice is the unflagged Mark ship? I asked. Locke looked up with a knowing grin. It's nice. I did a little recon earlier. I wouldn't be surprised if it had house ship internals. That was both good and bad. If it really did have personal house Rockhurst engines and systems, then it would be fast and capable. But it would also mean I would need much better and more recent information to steal it. I need a new comm, I said. Not that I don't appreciate this one, but I need a secure model, preferably one made by House von Hasenberg. It'll cost you, he warned, and put you under scrutiny. If I'm going to steal their ship, and I am, I need a secure channel. If you'd like to help, I'd appreciate it, but I understand if you want to take your money and run. The bank will be watched, 
but I'll get it for you somehow if you want hard credit chips. I sat on the edge of the bed and pulled on my socks and boots. I promised to get you to a planet or station with an interstellar port. This hardly qualifies. I shrugged. It's close enough, and you helped me escape the ship, which was my main objective. It would be safer for you to disappear into the dark half of the planet. Stealing a ship from a house is frowned upon. Locke laughed. You're good, he said. I can't tell if you're intentionally trying to manipulate me into helping you steal the ship or if you really think I should run. In point of fact, I wasn't sure which I was doing either. It would be much harder to take the ship on my own, but spending more time with Marcus Locke was dangerous in its own right. Either way, he said, I'm a man of my word, and I don't think I've upheld my part of the bargain. You're stuck with me a while longer. I would feel better about his help, and his honor, if it didn't come with the calculating look. Okay, thanks, I said. First things first, I need a new comm. Did you see anything that might work while you were out? There are a couple options, but this town is mostly dead. This whole section is abandoned. It seems smuggler hunting isn't paying the bills like it used to. Most people have moved on to greener pastures. A smaller town was worse for us. Getting lost in a big city was easy, but a new person in a small town always drew attention. No one questioned where you came from? The people I dealt with don't question their customers. I spent credits and that's all they cared about. I wasn't sure that honor among thieves would hold once Rockhurst started throwing money around but I had to hope we were long gone before Richard became that desperate. I ate an energy bar from my food stash, drank a half liter of water, then stood and pulled one of the cloaks off of the bed. Thanks for the cloak, too, I said. Keep a total of what you've spent and I'll add it to your payment. Made of a heavy black material, the cloak fell from my shoulders to my ankles. The front clasped together to keep out drafts, and a deep hood both protected my head from the elements and helped to hide my face. And it was still deliciously warm thanks to the built-in heat field. No hypothermia today. I sighed and happily snuggled deeper into the warmth. I loved this cloak to pieces, but I knew it was expensive. Locke stood. Consider it a gift, he said. Or an investment, if you prefer. I have to keep you alive long enough to get paid, after all. Despite his gruff words, I thought he was pleased that I liked the cloak. He pulled on his own cloak and his face dropped into shadow. The cloak did nothing to detract from his size, though. He looked like the kind of man who would shoot first and ask questions never. It was a good look for a mercenary planet. Ready? He asked. When I nodded, he continued... There are mercs literally everywhere once we get to the main part of town. Keep your hood up and stick to me. You're dressed like them, so as long as you don't do something stupid, they won't pay any attention to you. This wasn't my first rodeo. I had long ago perfected the walk that made me just another downtrodden worker bee who was absolutely uninteresting. It was a move that, done correctly, made you invisible in plain sight. Let's go get me a calm. Chapter 7 Locke opened the door, then ushered me into the cold twilight. The wind still howled through the streets, but the cloak blocked the worst of it. For the first time since we'd arrived, I was outside and not freezing. Hallelujah. We walked toward sunset for ten minutes before I saw signs of life. A few buildings had lights, and a shadow moved behind one of the windows. Another five minutes and we were skirting around the edge of the central commercial district. Such as it was. Enough people were on the street that we didn't stand out. But a bustling city this was not. Nearly everyone was on foot, and thankfully, many were cloaked and hooded against the cold. At least our hidden faces wouldn't be cause for suspicion. I mentally mapped out our path in case Locke and I were separated. 
The comms should be doing the same thing, but comms could be lost or stolen. As the number of people increased, I dropped back to trail along behind Locke's right shoulder. Wearing men's clothes, cloaked, and with my hair covered, I would pass for a junior merc tagging along with his captain. The streets got dirtier and the buildings shabbier as we kept going. Even the Plastec buildings, which I had thought were basically indestructible, were worn and mudded over with clay bricks. Men with darting eyes slunk through the alleys, and a few brave women shivered in high hemlines and plunging necklines. Locke must have been gone this morning for longer than I thought. Either that, or he had an innate sense that led him directly to the shadiest of shady districts. We turned down an alley that stank of urine and worse. A lanky man, several centimeters shorter than Locke, detached himself from the wall and stepped into our path. He was younger than me, but old enough to know better. A smirk twisted what would be a moderately handsome face into something cold and cruel. See here, he said. This is my alley, and I charge a toll for its use. Another man, bigger, older, and stronger, stepped out behind us. I half turned, so I faced both threats. A hundred credits each, and you can be on your way, the young man said. Move, Locke said. He seemed completely unconcerned. Oh, we've got a tough one here, Vance the young man said to the bruiser behind us. What do we do with tough ones? We break their knees, boss, Vance said. He brandished a half-meter length of pipe in his meaty hands. Vance would be slow but devastating if he landed a blow. The boss would be sneaky and underhanded, but would probably break down in a true physical fight. I drew my knife and kept it hidden under the cloak. I didn't know what Locke's plan was, but I doubted he'd turn over the credits. Do you know what I do to young upstarts who try to shake me down for money? Locke asked as he rolled his shoulders and cracked his neck. His tone was terrifying, and I was on his side. Unfortunately for the young upstart, Locke didn't wait for an answer. In an incredible flash of speed, he spun and punched Vance in the throat then took his pipe and swung it with sickening force at the young man's torso. Vance went down with heaving gasps, and the young man crumpled at Locke's feet. Locke picked him up by the neck. New deal, Locke said. I won't kill you and you'll crawl back under whatever rock you came from. Try any revenge bullshit, though, and it'll be the last thing you do. Understand? The young man muttered something that might have been a scent. What was that? Locke asked with a shake. I understand. Locke dropped him on the ground. Let's move, he said. He stopped off, and I followed without comment. Once I was sure we were alone, I closed the distance between us. I'm not sure that was wise, I said. We need to be invisible, to be overlooked. You put a target on us. Sweetheart, Locke drawled. I've been running from mercs for far longer than you've been slumming it. If I want to know what fort to use at a consortium dinner, I'll ask you. If we're dealing with mercenaries, I'll handle it. I clenched the hilt of the knife and told myself I absolutely, positively was not going to bash Marcus Locke in the head with it. But I imagined it. Oh, I imagined it with great relish. One of these days I was going to take the cocky bastard down a peg or two or twenty, and he was going to deserve every second of it. The fence's shop was behind an unmarked door in an unmarked alley. We were led into an empty room where Marcus had a quiet conversation with an older woman. After a few minutes, we were led through a series of rooms and passageways until I was positive we had left the original building. Twenty minutes of mind-numbing twists and turns later, we entered the shop. I had a fairly good idea of where we were, but wouldn't be able to confirm until we were outside. 
The shop looked like any high-end boutique in the verse, with glass counters protecting the valuable merchandise and everything else displayed on shelves. The only difference was that everything of value was placed on cloth rolls or cloth sacks for easy grab-and-go convenience. Portability was essential when the law came to call. A tall, slender woman with warm brown skin, long black hair, and round, rose-colored spectacles stood behind the far counter. Several guards were scattered around. Clearly the fence didn't want her own goods stolen. I started by looking at the knives. I had dealt with fences before, and you never wanted to tip your hand too early. Most of the knives were mediocre combat blades, but a nice little stiletto dagger caught my eye. My younger sister Katerina would love it. I worked my way halfway around the room, spending time looking at things I had no intention of buying. When I got to the comm units, I saw that they had only one option that was going to work for me. The shopkeeper wandered closer, smelling blood. Do you need a new comm? She asked. Her voice was soft and melodious. I bet she'd talked many a person into spending extra money with that voice. Perhaps... I said. Do you have anything decent? Her lips tipped up in a small smile. Ah, a woman, she said. Women get discounts in my shop. I am Veronica. And to answer your question, yes, I have many decent things. But if you're looking for the best, this is it. This calm just arrived yesterday. She pulled out the exact comm I knew I needed. It was a top-of-the-line House von Hasenberg model, very much like the one I'd left behind on the space station. In fact, there was a chance it was the one I'd left behind. May I see it? Of course, Veronica said. She pulled it out, powered it up, and handed it over. Device locked to Maria Franco was the only thing shown on the screen. Well, I'll be damned. It seems it is locked, I said, and therefore useless. Veronica waved her hands. It is a small matter to unlock it, she said. I didn't have to fake my dubious look. If she could unlock this device, then I would hire her for the house on the spot. How much? Five thousand credits, she said. I laughed. Even knew it hadn't cost that much. I will give you 2,000 if you can unlock it. Otherwise, I will give you 200, because trying to unlock it might be an interesting challenge. But most likely, it will end up a paperweight. You give me too little credit, she said. 3,500 if I can unlock it in the next five minutes. Otherwise, 750 locked. 3,000 unlocked, or 500 locked, I countered. Plus, I will see what other things I might want to purchase from your lovely shop. The fence inclined her head. You drive a hard bargain, madam, but I accept. I will start a timer. I glanced at my current comm. This room and probably the entire compound blocked the signal, but I could still check the time. I went back to shopping. Locke remained standing by the door. Apparently, he was playing silent bodyguard. I found a bracelet and necklace, a pretty scarf, some clothes, and several other odds and ends. I pointed at the stiletto, and an assistant materialized from the back to pull it from the case. A couple of anonymous hard credit chips, ridiculously marked up, naturally, rounded out my purchases. I'd spent a fortune, but by the way Veronica was frowning at the comm, she wasn't having any success. It had been well over her five-minute allotment at this point. She sighed in defeat. I wish you luck, madam, she said. This calm is locked more thoroughly than any I've ever seen. I feel bad selling it to you. No worries. I agreed to purchase it. Plus, I found all of these other lovelies to soothe my frustration when I can't unlock its secrets. Twelve fifty for the lot of it, she said. It was a more than fair price, so I nodded. I tapped my right thumb and pinky finger together under the concealment of my cloak. Hard credits, she asked. When I shook my head, she held out a chip reader. 
Then scan here, please, she said. I checked the total, then modified it to 1500, and scanned the chip embedded in my right arm. The machine beeped. I picked the correct amount, and then I handed the reader back to her. I added a little token of appreciation, I said. I do love a woman who barters well. Veronica smiled in acknowledgement. She produced a plain white card with a number embossed in a beautiful antique font. She leaned across the display and tucked the card in my overshirt pocket. If you need anything, anything at all, call me, she said. Her smile turned sultry. Any time, day or night. Once we were outside, Locke took the lead. Do not say anything, and do not return to the house. I murmured to him. I need a secure space. We walked for ten minutes in a direction I knew was opposite from where we'd spent the night. A few curious eyes followed us at first, but soon we were once again in an abandoned part of the city. Locke stopped outside of a seemingly random Plasdeck building. Now that I wasn't freezing... I could see what drew him to the buildings he chose. For this one, the walls were solid, and dust around the entrance showed no signs of footprints. He picked the lock in record time, and soon we were inside. The living room was right off the entry. I set the bag of items I'd bought, the card the fence had given me, the cloak and my overshirt in a pile in the middle of the floor. It might be overkill, but I didn't think so. I need your cloak. I said. Locke added his cloak to the pile. Without the heat field or extra shirt, the temperature in the room was bitingly cold. I'll see about some heat, Locke said. I picked up the new comm, touched my right thumb to my right ring finger, and held the comm up to the chip in my arm. The highly illegal, highly specialized, highly secret chip in my arm. Most people were embedded with a single identity chip at birth. I had that one, my main identity chip, in my left arm, but it was dormant most of the time. The chip in my right arm was a House von Hausenberg family specialty, though I had no doubt the other houses had something similar. The chip could hold multiple identities, and each identity could be selected by a series of finger movements. Designed for spying, the chip also worked great for staying a step ahead of father's trackers. Purchase a new identity with untraceable funds, and voila, a clean break. The trackers would eventually find the new identities, but it took time and gave me a chance to escape. The comm unlocked. Some sneaky bastard had stolen the comm from my abandoned room on the station, realized it was locked beyond hope, and sold it just in time for me to buy it. And here I thought the universe didn't love me. Granted, this was the second closest planet to the station, and the shadier of the two. But I wasn't going to look a gift horse in the mouth. Not only was this a top-of-the-line communication device, it was also designed especially for von Hasenberg family members. Though you would be hard-pressed to notice based on the design. It had a few extra features, too. I set the comm to run a self-diagnostic and when that came back clean, I turned on scanning mode. Designed to secure a space for communication, this mode would find any trackers or bugs the fence had managed to attach to us. Most comms had some form of bug-sweeping functionality, but this one was much more sensitive than standard. The card and shirt came back clean. Much to my surprise. Our cloaks were a different matter. Each had a tiny tracker attached. I used my comm to connect to the trackers and reconfigure them. Whoever was monitoring the trackers just saw them go offline. I, however, could now see their locations overlaid on a map. It wasn't a standard comm feature, but it proved useful enough that von Hasenberg family comms always came equipped with it. I attached the two trackers to Locke's cloak, one high near the neck and one at the bottom edge. It wasn't that I didn't trust him... But I didn't trust him. The rest of the stuff I bought was clean, including the shirt, pants, necklace, and bracelet that were all mine originally. It wasn't everything I'd left behind, 
but the comb, necklace, and bracelet were definitely the most important bits. I scanned myself and didn't find any new trackers. Lock? I called. He'd left the room to find heat, but hadn't returned. When he didn't respond, I put on my overshirt and cloak. I stored the small items in a cargo pocket and then put the clothes and Locke's cloak back into the bag. Something felt off, but I wasn't going to freak out without reason. The entry was empty, as was the dining room on the other side of the house. A hallway led deeper into the building, much like the house we'd stayed in last night. It was dark and silent. Locke? I tried again. Silence answered. Normally, when presented with a choice between going deeper into a dark, creepy, abandoned building or stepping out the front door into the admittedly low light, I'd choose the light every time. But Locke had disappeared down this hall, and while I didn't necessarily think he was in trouble, it was weird that he wasn't responding. The flashlight built into the comb wasn't great, but it cut through the darkness better than nothing. I drew my knife. If Locke was just in the bathroom, I was going to feel really silly. An open door on my right led to the empty kitchen. My stomach grumbled, reminding me that I hadn't eaten enough to cover the calories I'd burned. I ignored it and continued deeper into the house. The next door was closed. This would be so much easier if I had a gun, because clearing a room with a knife was a terrible idea. Still, I couldn't leave a room unexplored. Not if I wanted a valid retreat option. I stood on the hinge side of the door and reached across to the handle. It turned easily, and I pushed the door open, then stepped back so I was hidden by the frame. Silence. I risked a peek, and the part of the room I could see was empty. I cleared the other side of the room, including behind the door. Three more rooms proved to be empty, until only one room remained. I pushed the door open, not sure what to expect. What I did not expect, however, was another empty room. Weak light spilled in through the frosted window, illuminating an empty utility room. A door led out to the backyard. Boot prints in the dust proved Locke, or someone, had been this way recently. To follow or not to follow. It had been fifteen minutes since Locke disappeared. He could be out scouting the perimeter because he expected me to take longer. Or he could have decided to double-cross me and I'd walk out into an ambush. Only one way to find out. I turned off my flashlight, pulled up the hood of my cloak, and touched the button next to the window. The window pane changed from frosted to clear. The backyard was a tiny brown square covered in dead grass and surrounded by a low, broken-down fence. No mob waited for me to appear. I stood at the edge of the window and let my eyes roam over the scene. If anyone was out there hiding, unless they were trained, they would eventually fidget, and the movement would give them away. Nothing moved, other than the grass blowing in the wind. So where was Locke? Just as I was going to turn away to check the front, something drew my eye to the top of the next house. I froze and focused on the area. Nothing else moved, and the low light made it difficult to identify what had caught my attention. My patience was rewarded as someone moved again, just the slightest shift, but it was enough. Friends generally didn't linger on in the shadows on top of adjacent buildings, so the only remaining question was, who was it? We could have picked up a random tail, a random merc squad, the boss from earlier, a tail from Veronica the Fence, or the Rockhurst squad. We were collecting enemies faster than I could keep up. I retreated to the darkened hallway. For now, I would give Locke the benefit of the doubt and assume he was out scouting when the other people moved in. That meant he was either captured or holed up somewhere waiting to see what happened. I briefly debated the merits of leaving sooner versus having better protection. I opted for better protection. 
Only time would tell if it was a wise choice. The necklace and bracelet felt heavy for their size. The bracelet was a wide silver cuff, and the necklace had heavy silver links connected to a round silver medallion inlaid with turquoise. Both pieces were pretty, but nothing indicated they were anything more than normal jewelry. When I'd fled home, I'd only taken a small bag of possessions. These pieces of jewelry were two of the things in that bag. On the station, I hadn't had them on because I'd just popped over to the nearby shop to pick up an early dinner. Unfortunately, Captain Pearson had ruined that plan. I performed the complicated left-hand motion that activated my true identity chip. I held the necklace to the chip. Nothing happened. But that was expected. I turned the necklace over twice, then rotated the center of the medallion like I was opening a combination lock. The center of the medallion sprang open, revealing a DNA tester. I clasped the necklace around my throat, then pricked my thumb on the embedded needle. The medallion clicked closed, and once again it appeared to be a normal necklace. Now it was authorized until I unclasped it. I held the bracelet up to my real identity chip for a count of ten. It had less stringent security because it wouldn't work without the necklace being authorized. I clasped the cuff around my right wrist and deactivated my real identity chip. Now to face whatever awaited me outside. I delayed long enough to put on the jewelry not only because of the extra protection it would provide, but also because I was hoping Locke would return if I gave him more time. He did not. So now I was on my own. I'd try to meet him at our original house if I made it out. If he didn't show. I'd have to find out if he got caught and by whom. I needed to check the front. With the back door watched, it was unlikely they'd left the front door open. But I didn't have to dodge a fence in the front. I crept back through the hallway. I'd like to think that I would hear anyone who had breached the house, but highly trained men and women could be alarmingly quiet. The front window showed a deserted street, and though I watched for five minutes, I couldn't catch a hint of movement. Doubt crept in. Had I really seen someone on the roof in the back? I took Locke's cloak out of the bag and put it on over my own. It was less cumbersome to wear than to carry. I tied the bag of clothes I'd bought around my waist. Both hands needed to be free if I was going to have to fight. I so did not want to fight. I opened the front door and stepped out as if I was going for an afternoon stroll. Make something of that, you bastards. Nothing moved. And I finally realized what bothered me about this planet. There were no animals. No birds singing or dogs barking. It was eerily still except for the sound of the wind. I turned left, back toward the main part of town. No one tried to stop me, but I had an itch between my shoulder blades like someone watched my progress. I took a meandering path, but I couldn't shake the tail. Whoever tracked me was good, because I couldn't catch a hint of them, even when I doubled back on my path. I would have to risk the central district to try to lose the tail in the meager crowd, I angled back toward the spaceport. Hopefully I could catch a glimpse of the Rockhurst ship while I was out. As the number of people in the streets picked up, I dropped into my invisible persona, subtly altering my gait and posture. I also picked up the pace until I was just another harassed underling off to do an urgent task for a demanding boss. I slipped down alleys and through a busy trading street. I looped back and changed course at random until the watched feeling faded away. I kept at it for another twenty minutes, even pausing to stop in a tea shop and then exiting out the back. When I was completely sure that I'd lost any tail, I started working my way back toward our original house. I was on the edge of the central district when Richard Rockhurst stepped out of a restaurant with a calm to his ear. Richard wore a traditional mercenary outfit, complete with cloak, but the hood was thrown back. He was tall and fit, with the blonde hair and blue eyes I'd so envied as a young girl. I'd recognize him anywhere. He was in the middle of the block I'd just entered. 
There was nowhere to go without drawing attention to myself, and it took everything I had not to freeze and give myself away. And the man with Locke? Richard asked with deceptive calm. Someone on the other end must have responded, but I wasn't close enough to catch it. So you're telling me that you have neither Locke nor his contact on this godforsaken planet. You had one job, and you failed. Another pause as the person on the other end tried to save their life. Now I was within a meter of Richard. I ducked my head, dropped my eyes, and thought invisible thoughts. I passed him close enough that our cloaks brushed. Find Ada, he said. That is priority one. Locke is our only lead right now, so that makes him priority two. We know he's here in the city. Now it's just a matter of finding where he stashed her. I didn't breathe until I turned the next corner. I kept my pace even and continued on my way. Whoever had been following me thought I was Locke's contact. Unless Locke had another contact somewhere else. Either way, Locke had also avoided capture. Ten minutes later, I stopped in the darkness between two buildings and scanned myself for trackers. I came up clean. My tail had been following me the old-fashioned way. Which begged the question, why? It was clear they'd arrived after us but not by too much if Locke left the house while I was scanning for bugs. Maybe Locke had drawn off the main set of men, leaving behind a skeleton crew to watch what they thought was Locke's contact's house. If so, we'd gotten extremely lucky. Locke was a fickle bitch, though, and I'd used up my monthly allotment in the last two days. I needed to be more careful. Chapter 8 It took me over an hour to return to the house. I could have covered the distance in ten minutes if I took a direct path. But after the scare with Richard, I wanted to be absolutely sure I didn't have a tag along. Entering a potentially compromised building with only a knife was stupid. But I checked the perimeter twice, and no one else lurked in the shadows. Stationing your entire team in the compromised house was equally stupid. We'd see who's stupid one. The back door was unlocked. I slipped inside. Lock? I called. It gave me away, but it also meant I wasn't sneaking up on the devil of Fornax Zero in the dark. And if it wasn't Lock waiting for me, I'd rather know that while I still had an easy exit at my back. And here. We really should have had a secret. I promise there isn't a room full of mercs in here, keyword. I muttered to myself. I promise there isn't a room full of mercs in here, Locke called back. I could hear the grin in his voice. I locked the back door and approached the room we'd used before. The door was open and the light was on. Locke sat on a barstool that hadn't been in the room before. He clutched a bloody rag to his upper left arm. Holy hell, are you okay? Energy bolt grazed me he said, just deep enough that it didn't cauterize. It looks worse than it is. That's good, because it looks terrible, I said. Why didn't you get the first aid kit? Didn't know we had one, Locke said. I'll be fine by tomorrow. Can't say the same for the bastard who shot me. What happened? I asked. I pulled out my comm and checked him for trackers and bugs. He was clean, as was the room and our packs from the ship. The two trackers I'd attached to his cloak didn't set off the alarm since they were mine now. Assuming neither of us had been tracked the old-fashioned way, we wouldn't have to leave tonight. I rummaged around in my pack from the ship until I dug out the first aid kit. Locke grimaced, but didn't object. He was right. The wound looked worse than it was. It was shallow, but as wide and long as my finger... I bet it stung like nobody's business. I cleaned the wound and put a healing bandage on it. I went to look for heat only to realize the heater was missing. I had been feeling twitchy, so I went outside to check the perimeter. Rockhurst's men are sneaky fuckers. I'll give them that. They moved in before I could warn you. 
so I did what I could to draw them away. He shrugged his bad shoulder. It worked a little too well. If the crew is from the Santa Celestia, and I don't know why they wouldn't be, they are some of the most highly trained troops in House Rockhurst. I can't believe they didn't hit you worse than that if they had time to get a shot off. He was preoccupied with the direction of my blade, Locke said. I'd seen Locke in action. I knew he had to have been military at one point because he was part of the team suppressing the Fornax Rebellion. But to know he'd gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with one or more of Rockhurst's elite soldiers and come out relatively unscathed, well, that was just plain scary. So who sold us out? I asked. I shrugged off the extra cloak and untied the bag of clothes from around my waist. I should have grabbed some real food while I was out. Another energy bar held the appeal of eating dirt. But I needed the calories. And I needed to drink more water. I could feel the first signs of dehydration creeping in. The punk who tried to shake us down. I found his rat right before Rockers closed on us. Said he heard a new crew was looking for a big guy and thought he'd take care of the problem for his boss. He didn't mention you to Rockhurst because he was afraid they wouldn't come if there were two of us. I got tagged on my way out. Managed to lose him in the Central District. Did you know Richard is on planet? Locke's gaze sharpened and he sat straighter. How do you know? That was a clever dodge of the question. I nearly ran into him on the street. How did you know? I doubled back on the soldiers. Heard them talking about how Richard was going to have their asses if they didn't find me. Plausible, but not entirely true. I'd been reading people for a long time. Locke lied better than most, but I'd bet anything that he was lying now. So what did he gain by lying? Was he trying to work a double cross with Richard? Did Rockhurst see you? Locke asked. His own suspicion was obvious now. Clearly, our road to trust was progressing not at all. I don't think so. He didn't stop me, and no one followed me. But we're going to need to move fast, or they'll catch us again. How many do you think are guarding the ship? At least two. Even with the ship's security, they'll leave a couple men behind. But I wouldn't be surprised if it was a six-man team, to give them rotating shifts and backup. I sat on the bed and dug out an energy bar. This one was blueberry-flavored. At least it was less objectionable than the mango one from this morning. I drank the last of the water from the ship. Any idea if the tap water is drinkable? Should be. These houses are still on the main water system. I'd let it run for a while first. That was a project for tomorrow, along with a laundry solution and a shower. Tonight, I needed to contact one of my siblings and sweet-talk them into giving up prized family intel over moderately secure channels. We were all close, as if making up for our parents' distance, but I was closest to my sisters. I could ask them for the moon and they'd do their damnedest to deliver, just as I would do anything for them. So they were the most likely candidates for a huge, dangerous favor. It would have to be Bianca. She had moved back to House von Hasenberg after her husband's death, and she always seemed to have information that no one else could find. Plus, I was closest to her. Even among family, we all played the game, though not as ruthlessly. I activated my true identity chip and held the new com up to it. Verify, a computer voice demanded. Ada von Hasenberg, smartest of all the von Hasenbergs. Yeah. We got to pick our own verification phrases. I held the camera up to my eye for a retina scan. The comm beeped. What are you doing? Locke asked. I'm setting up this comm to be able to send and receive on the secure house channels. Then I'm going to ask my sister for a huge favor and hope she comes through. Then I'm stealing a ship and leaving this freezing rock behind. What are you doing? Trying not to bleed to death. I glanced up sharply to find him staring at his calm and not bleeding at all. He looked up and laughed. I'm kidding. But if you don't let me in on the plan, that might as well be what I'm doing. I just told you the plan. When and if you need to know more, I'll let you know. 
If you have a better plan, I'd love to hear it. It was somewhat gratifying to see that Locke liked giving up control just about as much as I had when we were landing. That is, not at all. I quickly typed a message to Bianca, letting her know in as much detail as I dared what was happening and what I needed. I didn't think she'd rat me out to father, but if she thought my plan was too dangerous, she would send our brother Benedict in to save the day. And Benedict was exactly what this situation did not need. I sent it priority, but even so I didn't expect a response until tomorrow morning at the earliest. I checked the rest of the family chatter. There were a few rumbles of trouble with Rockhurst over some planet in the distant Antlia sector. Nothing overt in the family chatter indicated that Rockhurst was on the brink of war, but the very lack of such information and speculation was telling. Any posts about Rockhurst were carefully neutral. What was going on? It would be so much easier if I could just call Richard up and ask, but he'd track the signal before the first word was spoken. If I could just get him alone for two minutes, I could ask him in person. Hmm. I set that thought aside to let it simmer in my subconscious. Getting him alone for a chat would be dangerous, but it might be necessary. If I could figure out his motivation, it would help me and House von Hasenberg. My thoughts kept circling. I needed sleep. There wasn't anything else I could do tonight, except give my body the rest it required. Do you know if there are any other beds in the house? I asked. Locke looked up from his calm with a lascivious grin. Afraid not. But don't worry. I don't mind sharing. Sharing a bed with Marcus Locke when I wasn't near death was a recipe for disaster. Hot, sweaty, naked disaster. Heat spread across my face and lower. Definitely lower. Lord, help me. Locke's grin was just knowing enough to make me want to punch him. It tempted me to play with a fire that I knew would burn. I removed my boots while I fought the desire. I crossed the room and closed the door. I dragged the broken dresser in front of it. It was harder than Locke had made it look yesterday. Locke snagged my wrist as I walked past him. With him sitting on the bar stool, we were the same height. He usually moved so quickly and quietly that it was easy to overlook his size. But standing next to him, he was a solid wall of muscle. Will you give me a judgment-free minute? I asked him softly. His expression went guarded, but finally he nodded. I stepped closer until I was standing between his legs. Desire lit his eyes. I felt it too, but he was about to be disappointed. I needed this more right now. Slowly I wrapped my arms around him and rested my head against his shoulder. He froze. After a few seconds, I whispered, You're supposed to hug me back. His arms came around me like I was made of spun glass. I gave him a little squeeze. I'm not that fragile, I said. Give me a real hug. He crushed me to his chest. I sighed in contentment and fought the ridiculous urge to cry. Mother and father might be as distant and untouchable as the moon, but my sisters and I were always physically affectionate. With them, hugs were frequent and touch always conveyed love and comfort. It helped to balance out some of Father's more merciless training programs. As we got older, hugs were often replaced by cheap kisses and handshakes, but they were busted out in cases of extra stress or emotional turmoil. I'd say this week counted. Sometimes a simple sign of affection was more powerful than a whole host of words. Even the illusion of affection from a man I barely trusted was enough to ease my heart. I straightened and met Locke's eyes. True to his word, I didn't see any judgment in them. Thank you, I said. Locke's arms remained around me, though they'd loosened enough that I could step out of his embrace if I wanted to. You're welcome, he said. 
His head tilted and I knew he was going to kiss me. It was my turn to freeze, torn between staying and going. His thumb caressed my lower back. Easy, he murmured. Just a kiss and nothing more. I stood my ground even as logic dictated that I was emotionally vulnerable and this was a terrible idea. Then his lips ghosted over mine and logic lost. A second pass as light and teasing as the first and I'd had enough. I wrapped a hand around the back of his head and pulled his mouth to mine. He groaned and obliged as if it was the sign he'd been waiting for all along. His lips were warm and firm. The hot slide of his tongue against mine caused my hand to clench against the back of his head. Lust slammed through me, and I stepped closer, trying to meld my body into his. We were both breathing hard when he gently pushed me back. I promised you just a kiss, he growled. My hormones begged me to convince him that I wanted more than a kiss. So much more. But with distance came a minute spark of clarity, and I was glad for his control. Go to bed, he said. I'm going to do a perimeter check. He paused, then muttered very quietly. And stand in the icy cold wind until I'm not acting like a fucking idiot. I refused to feel hurt that he thought kissing me was idiotic. You're injured, I said. You go to bed and I'll do the perimeter check. Honor made me offer. And maybe the tiniest desire to run and hide. His gaze was scorching. If I get into that bed right now, there's only one thing I'm going to be doing. And it's not sleeping. My nipples pebbled under my shirt as renewed lust blazed through my system. Okay, maybe it wasn't the kissing he thought was dumb. Warmth bloomed in my chest even as I told myself that being happy just because he hadn't insulted me was no way to act. He ran a hand down his face. But I made you a promise, and I'm keeping it, which means I'm leaving. He moved the dresser with much less effort than I'd used and slipped out the door into the darkened hallway without another word. The door clicked closed behind him. I sank down on the edge of the bed and touched my lips. That just happened. And I would have happily climbed into bed with him. Consequences and tomorrows be damned. The thought sobered me. I hadn't had this much trouble controlling myself since I was first allowed into consortium events as a green girl. Marcus Locke was dangerous for more reasons than I'd initially thought. I decided to go to bed fully clothed. It was safer for both of us that way. I wrapped the cloak around me, crawled between the emergency blankets, and huddled on one side of the bed. It took a long time to fall asleep. Once again, I woke alone. I had vague memories of Marcus in the night, but I wasn't sure if they were real or imaginary. My dreams had been fraught, I knew that much. The emotional turmoil of the day had followed me into sleep. I sat up and checked my calm. Bianca had responded. Her response involved a lot of sentences in all caps and threats of death and dismemberment. But in the end, she said she'd find the codes for me, though it would take a day or two. She also dropped some veiled hints that things with Rockhurst were not as they seemed. But the message required a lot of reading between the lines. If she was being this careful, even on the secure house accounts, then things were bad. I needed to be extra cautious. Then she proved once again that she was two steps ahead of everyone else by including the following. Locks can be good protection, but shouldn't be trusted completely. I stared at the screen for a solid minute in wonder. I hadn't mentioned Locke in my message, so was she fishing, or did she know? Either way, she had felt it necessary to warn me not to trust Locke. But why? The problem with all of the reading between the lines was that it was difficult to communicate effectively. But this was vague even for Bianca. 
I had no doubt she was frantically trying to find my location, but I'd bounced the message through several different systems to obfuscate the trail. It wouldn't stump her for long, but maybe it would be long enough for me to escape without her sending in the cavalry. With that in mind, I decided to see what I could do about a shower and laundry. I would need to hit a shop first. From what I saw yesterday during my wander about the downtown area, there were only two or three general goods shops left. And if I was Richard, I'd have a man watching each of them. Everyone needed food and supplies sooner or later. I changed into the clothes I'd bought yesterday. A long-sleeved pale blue tunic went on over narrow, dull gold pants. A blue and gold scarf wrapped around my head and neck until just my eyes were visible. It was a risk going out dressed as a woman, but I'd seen several women out on the busier commercial streets. My outfit wouldn't attract undue attention. The slit in the side of the tunic allowed plenty of movement, and also allowed me to attach a knife to my belt and still access it relatively easily. The hard credits went in a pouch with my comb. I attached the pouch on the opposite hip from the knife. What are you wearing? Locke asked. I'd heard him a bare second before he spoke, so I managed not to jump into next week in fright. My heart rate still needed a second to recover, however. It needed quite a bit longer when I saw he'd showered and shaved. Did you buy soap or shampoo yesterday? That would solve one problem. Locke looked at me like I was crazy. Okay, then. I guess I was the only one who cared that my shower involved actual cleansers. I'm going out. I need shampoo, even if you don't. And laundry detergent. And food. And you're going dressed like that? Yes. With the cloak, of course. What's wrong with this? I saw several women dressed similarly to this yesterday, and everyone left them alone. That's because the men all know those women belong to Mr. Goswami, who will break any man's face who so much as looks at one of his wives or daughters wrong. You, however, are neither wife nor daughter. And before you try it, no. You're much too tall to pass for either. How could you possibly know that? I was warned, he said, when it appeared I'd been staring at the lady in question for too long. In fact, I was watching the door behind her, but the merc who warned me didn't know that. Well, then I guess the men will have to learn that I, too, will break any man's face who tries to start shit with me. And you think a random woman wearing a full-face veil and kicking ass is just going to fly right past Rockhurst? He'll snatch you up before you set foot wherever you're going. Very well, I said. With the understanding that I will buy shampoo, laundry detergent, and food today, what would you suggest instead? I suggest you eat an energy bar and give up on soap, Locke said. The more often we're out, the more dangerous it is. He was right. Damn it. But if I had to sit and dawdle in this room all day, I'd go crazy. And while I could think of one delicious way we could pass the time, that would complicate matters even more. Especially with Bianca's warning fresh in my mind. I changed back into the clothes I'd taken from the escape ship. I was frustrated enough that I didn't even care that Locke was in the room though I changed my pants under the cover of the tunic and turned my back on him to change my shirt. The drab camo and black mocked the beauty of my former outfit. Impatience and annoyance nipped at me. I needed to recenter myself before I did something stupid. And while seated meditation was always an option, I needed movement. I moved to the center of the room, closed my eyes, and inhaled deeply through my nose. I held the breath for a few beats, then released it through my mouth. Five more deep breaths, and I fell into the beginning stance of my short, meditative martial arts form. Solo, weaponless martial arts forms could be done anywhere with no equipment, so it was something all the von Hasenberg children were taught from a young age. We'd had thirty minutes of practice in various styles before class every day. It helped to build strength and flexibility but it also helped to calm and center the mind. I focused on the movements and let the rest of the world fade away. Tension faded, 
replaced with strength and calm. I finished the sequence and closed my eyes. When I opened them again, Locke stood in front of me. Care to spar? He asked. Chapter 9 There are moments in your life when you absolutely know what you should do, and then you absolutely choose to do something else entirely. This was one of those moments. I would love to spar, I said. No face, no eyes, no balls, and for the love of God, pull your punches. Agreed? Agreed, he said. He dropped into a typical mixed martial arts stance. I mirrored his stance and nodded my readiness. Even obviously slowed down, he moved like lightning. I went defensive, dancing out of his reach and deflecting the blows I couldn't avoid. His form was tight, and he didn't leave openings in his guard. My self-defense tutor would have loved him. You gonna hit me, darling, or are you just gonna dance around? He asked a few minutes later. I dodged a slow jab at my side. Hand-to-hand -hand fighting is a last resort for me, and I generally learned how to do it just long enough to make an opportunity to run. I blocked a stomach blow, then float away from a right cross that would have clipped my shoulder. Which means I fight dirty, then run away. Since neither of those is an option right now, I'm biding my time. Locke stopped attacking and stepped back into a defensive stance. Your time is now, he said with a grin. Bring it on. I fainted a right, then got through his guard low with my left fist. That was well done, he said. You didn't telegraph your intentions at all. My self-defense tutor could be a bitch, but she had my best interest at heart. She taught me well. It's not her fault that I didn't take to fighting. I jabbed at him a few more times, both straight punches and feints, but now he was on guard and blocked or dodged all my attempts. That was why, in a real fight, the first feint would be followed by the hardest punch I could throw. You only had one chance to surprise an opponent with skill. Locke struck out with his left fist. I saw the blow too late to do more than tense my ab muscles. Even pulled it landed hard enough to smart. I backed away into a defensive stance. Don't run away, Locke said. I just told you that running away is one of the core pillars of my fighting strategy. Okay, he allowed. Run away in a real fight, but don't run away from me. I promised to pull my punches. Yeah, but I didn't promise to stand around as a human punching bag, I said as I dodged yet another attempt at my midsection. You're quick, Locke said, and good at reading your opponent. With a little more training, you wouldn't have to worry about running. I laughed. Don't think my tutor didn't try. I have the knowledge, but not the desire. I will fight viciously to save my life or rescue a friend, but most other situations can just as easily be solved by evasion. How are you at grappling? Worse than terrible, I said. I watched him closely, because I had a feeling he wasn't asking just for the fun of it. I wasn't lying. If he caught me, it was over. I avoided him for a minute, but then he snagged my arm and used my own momentum to spin me around until I was trapped with my back against his chest. My arms crossed in front of me and he had a hand clamped around each of my wrists. How do you get out of this hold? First, I headbutt you, I said while I mimed doing it. Then I stomp on your toes if you're not wearing boots. Then I hook my foot here, I said, wrapping my foot around his lower right leg, and throw my weight back while you're off balance. That would probably work, though then you'd be on the ground. How about this one? He spun me around until my back was against the wall, then pressed close. I hit him with my sexiest smoldering glance. First, I said, I look at you like this. Then I run my hand up your chest like this. I demonstrated, but kept going until my hand rested on the back of his head. Then I pull your head down to mine, I said. I licked my lips and his eyes dropped half closed. And head but your nose gouge your eyes, and knee you in the balls. I whispered a centimeter from his mouth. Locke froze, 
then burst out laughing. That definitely would work. He let me go and backed away. I fought the urge to pull him back and kiss him for real. I changed the subject to safer topics. So now you know why running is the core tenet of my defense, I said. You don't give yourself enough credit, Locke said. I was moving slower than my normal speed, but I've sparred at that speed with many trained soldiers who couldn't dodge and deflect as well as you did. I smiled at the compliment, but shook my head. It's because the mindset is different, I said. Soldiers don't retreat by default. I do. Between the martial arts warm-up and sparring, I was feeling nearly relaxed. My muscles were warm and pliant with none of the residual soreness I'd been carrying for the last couple days. Even my mind was clear and focused. So the fence yesterday did not carry any ranged weapons, I said. Any idea why? Supply is locked down. Mr. Goswami, of the wives and daughters fame, has the only shop in town. And he prefers it that way. Even the fences won't cross him. Those who do disappear. Security? Guards, 24-7. Electronic locks and surveillance equipment with redundant fail-safes. All with internal battery backups. And you know that how? Sometimes I wondered if Locke just made shit up to see if I'd believe him. You aren't the only person in this group who'd like to have a gun, he said. I checked out the situation yesterday morning. The door I was watching was the one to Mr. Goswami's shop. Okay, so the shop is out. Surely some merc on this planet is stupid enough to have both guns and bad security. We just need to find one. Locke held out his calm. The address of one Vance Burnham and his boss, August Chisholm, both of whom are currently in the med bay. No, I said with a disbelieving gasp. Indeed, yes, Locke said. Even better, it's nowhere near the central district. Why didn't you just lead with that? We could be there already. Even in the shadier districts, it's generally frowned on to break into someone else's house at high noon. Personally, high noon seemed like an excellent time. The shadier elements were probably fast asleep from their late night shenanigans. But maybe if people were out causing trouble, they wouldn't be home to see us sneaking into their neighbor's house. For now, I needed water, food, and a shower. Definitely water first, though, if I had to choke down another energy bar. I collected my empty bottles and made my way to the kitchen. The hallway was dark, but dim light spilled through the frosted glass front window. The endless twilight was starting to get to me. How did people live here? Unfortunately, I knew better than to turn on a light that could be visible from outside, and since the kitchen opened to the dining room window... I had to feel my way around until my eyes adjusted. I turned on the sink full blast and let it run for five minutes. We were lucky that frontier towns like this generally didn't meter water or power and didn't shut them off when the occupants left. Yamato owned the whole town, both buildings and infrastructure, so it was easier to just leave everything hooked up for the next tenant. I filled the bottles and carried them back into the bedroom to check the clarity before I risked a drink. The nanobots in my blood would knock out any waterborne pathogens before they had a chance to take root, but I still didn't relish the thought of drinking dirty water. The light revealed clear water, so I drank a bottle while choking down two energy bars. They did not improve with familiarity. I had enough to last me a few more days, but I wasn't exactly relishing the prospect. Next up, shower. My delight at a real water shower dimmed significantly when I realized there was no hot water. Someone had probably scavenged parts off of the water heater. The lack of soap worked in my favor, though, because I didn't have to stay in the frigid water long enough to rinse away soapy residue. Even with the brief shower, I was shivering violently by the time I was done. I dried quickly, then draped the heated cloak around me while I dressed in the black pants and long-sleeved black shirt I'd bought from the fence. The chill settled into my bones. This sucked. Admitting it helped. There was a lot to be said for pushing on without complaint, but sometimes it was nice to just stop and admit things were terrible. 
Embracing the terrible made it more manageable. At least for me. I spent the rest of the day catching up on news. There was no mention of the Mayport. The SOS beacon should have activated as soon as the emergency ship undocked, so it was unlikely that it hadn't been found. Unless the override Richard's soldiers had used to disable the ship's computer had also disabled the SOS beacon. The Mayport wasn't due at the next jump point for another couple days, so Father wouldn't be searching for me yet, which gave Richard time to act. I'd thought he'd been in the area and I had been a convenient political target, but with everything I'd learned from Bianca, I wasn't so sure. I checked my accounts to see if Richard had reached out. He hadn't, not even to my personal account, which he knew was secure from the rest of the house. With nothing else to do, I settled in for a few hours of sleep. It was still early, but I'd learned to catch sleep where I could. I was nearly out when Lot joined me, a wall of warmth against my back that I could feel through our clothes. I hummed in appreciation and snuggled back against him. The man was better than a heat field. Go back to sleep, Ada, he murmured. And I did. Hours later, Locke and I slipped into the twilight and skirted around the central district. We headed for the same seedy area we'd visited the first day, but we took a much longer route. We kept to the shadows and darkened alleys when possible. Because we were at the inflection point between late and early, only a handful of people were out. As we got into the more residential areas, even those few people disappeared. No witnesses was nice, but it also made us stand out. Is there a curfew? I whispered to Locke at the next corner. Not that I know about, he whispered back. But I'm avoiding the lawman just the same. Good plan. We wound through shabbier and shabbier neighborhoods until the Plastec buildings were more boards and mud than Plastec. We circled the same block twice before Locke stopped behind the middle house on the block. He checked his comb. This is it, he said. The house was dark, as were the two beside it. Either luck was with us or the occupants knew better than to let light escape. I peered into the twilight while Locke opened the door. Nothing moved, but I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. I think we should abort, I whispered as soon as we were inside. Locke was a dark shape against the deeper darkness of the room. Why? he asked. Just a feeling. To his credit, Locke didn't scoff. Five minutes, he asked. I nodded reluctantly. If someone was watching us, I doubted five minutes would make a ton of difference. But for us, it could mean the difference between finding guns or going home empty-handed. We moved quickly through the house. I set my comm flashlight to the lowest setting and turned it on. It was hard to tell if the house had already been ransacked or if the people living here were just slobs. Once we checked the house for occupants... Locke and I split up. I searched one bedroom while he searched the other. I found two well-used blaster pistols in the top of the closet, as well as a small cache of energy cells. No holsters, though, so I shoved one gun in my pocket and left the other out for Locke. I was shoving energy cells into my other pockets when Locke entered the room. Trouble, he said. You were right. I handed him the gun and ammo. How bad? Rockhurst's men. At least a squad of six. We'll have to split their attention. You should take your hood down. They'll never leave me alone if they know who I am. I pulled out the pistol and loaded it. I had a feeling I was going to need it before the night was over. I tucked it back in my pocket. It wasn't the safest way to carry it, but a better option didn't present itself, so I went with what I had. But they also won't shoot you in the back, Locke said. It was hard to argue with that logic. We'll make it seem like you escaped from me. If they capture you, I'll come for you, he said. You still owe me. Don't do anything stupid. He should have taken the money and run, I said. I tried to warn you. Why, this is the most fun I've had in years, Locke said. 
His eyes gleamed in the dark, and I almost believed him. We both go left, then split at the next corner. You go right. You're not going to be able to lose them in the crowd. Run hard and fast. Be careful, I said. Your bounty doesn't specify that they need to keep you alive. But they will, Locke said arrogantly. Rockhurst won't be able to resist parading me in front of the consortium before he kills me. Ready. I wasn't. Not even close. But giving Richard time to move more men over here was not going to improve matters. So I nodded. Look like you're fighting me without actually slowing us down, Locke said. Remember, left, then right. Run like hell. I got it. I'll meet you back at the house or nearby. I left my hood down and followed Locke when he grabbed my wrist and pulled me through the door. Two men were in the alley across the street. One on the roof. Probably more I couldn't spot. Two pistol blasts slammed into the side of our building close enough to heat the air before I heard my name shouted. The blasts stopped. The men across the street moved to intercept, but Locke was already sprinting. I tugged on my arm and did my best to appear terrified. It wasn't too difficult. At the corner, I realized that if I split from him, Locke would lose his human shield. I tried to follow him, but he hissed, Right! at me, then darted left before the soldiers knew we were separating. I swiped my left hand across the cuff around my right wrist, first inside to outside, then the opposite. I held my hand over the cuff for two seconds. It buzzed once. My lungs burned and the cold air stabbed at my throat. The cuff pulsed, and a wall to my left danced with a shower of electric sparks. These men hadn't forgotten their stun pistols, and the cuff could only repel two more shots. At the next corner, I pulled the gun from my pocket and spun. The man behind me was nearly a block away. I aimed and fired in one motion. The energy bolt went clean through his thigh. It wasn't exactly what I was expecting to hit, but he went down. So good enough. I ducked behind the corner just before the second man could hit me with a stun pulse. I had to put distance between us, then go to ground. I didn't know how many men Richard had on planet, but it couldn't be enough to sweep an entire section of city, or even the oblivious mercs living here would know something was up. I kept my turns erratic so they couldn't radio ahead for men to intercept me. These soldiers weren't encumbered with heavy armor, and they were in excellent physical shape. Outrunning them proved difficult. Picking them off one at a time worked, but every time I stopped to aim at one, the others surged closer and I risked getting stunned. Since I'd surprised the first, I'd had a much more difficult time with the other three. I wounded one enough that he dropped back, but the final two were persistent as hell. I hoped Locke was having better results. It took nearly an hour of hard running before I lost them. I ran flat out for another thirty minutes, then stopped to check myself for trackers. I didn't find any. The cuff's repulsive field had done its job. I pushed my exhausted body into a jog and looked for a place to hunker down for the night. I was at least an hour away from the house, even at a jog. And after that run, I needed rest more than I needed to return to base. The next block revealed more cookie-cutter houses. I randomly chose the third one down as my palace for the night. I made sure I hadn't left any tracks, then picked the lock and eased inside. Gun first. The house was cold, dark, and empty. None of the rooms had any furniture, so I selected a bedroom and stationed myself inside against the door. The constant wind whistled eerily around the abandoned buildings. I was alone in a vast, abandoned city. I pulled out my comm and checked on Locke's location. His trackers were offline, but the last known location was near the edge of the central commercial district. The log showed they'd stayed in that same location for 15 minutes before being disabled. Dread twisted my gut. I went further back in the log. His path out of the house had started erratic, dodging around corners at random, but then he stopped entirely for five minutes before making a straight line to downtown. He stopped smack in the middle of the central district for ten minutes, then continued to his final location. Several possibilities arose. None of them great. Most likely, 
Locke had been captured by Richard's team. And damn if I didn't feel responsible. I should have been more adamant about leaving when I'd felt something was off to begin with. I had to be careful, though, because it was also possible that Locke was working with Richard to double-cross me. It absolutely fit his personality, but it just didn't ring true. However, that could have been my own selfish desire for him to be honorable clouding my judgment. There was nothing I could do about it tonight. Tomorrow I'd go back to our house and pray Locke showed up. After all, a double cross was much easier to deal with than a rescue mission. Chapter 10 The perpetual gloom had one upside. It made sneaking around in the afternoon infinitely easier. I'd returned to the house to find it exactly as we'd left it, and with no signs of Locke. So now I was positioned on a rooftop three blocks down from the building where Locke's tracker had first stopped, playing a game of Spot the Spotter. The building had probably once been the home of the Yamato diplomat in charge of the planet. It was made from real wood, with delicate sliding doors and a beautifully curved tile roof. The fact that it was still in pristine condition was not terribly surprising. You crossed a high house at your own peril. Even when you thought they were gone, they weren't really gone. If Richard had taken up residence, he either had permission or enormous balls. If he had permission, then this whole situation was far worse than I realized. One house potentially planning a war with us was bad, but if two houses were colluding, I would have to set aside my personal desires and contact Father immediately. The warning I'd given Bianca would no longer be sufficient. It took three hours, but eventually my patience was rewarded. Richard Rockhurst emerged from the house flanked by two men. They turned left, toward the spaceport and Locke's final location, and walked with purpose. The urge to follow them was nearly irresistible. I vibrated with the need to move, but my training hadn't been for nothing. I stayed put. Less than a minute later, a shadow detached itself from an alley a block down. Another minute, and a new man had taken up the position. Definitely Rockhurst's men, and definitely watching for anyone approaching the house. I needed information and equipment and I knew just who to call. After I'd carefully extracted myself from the central district, I headed away from home base. I had no doubt that the call would be tracked, and I didn't want to lead them back to where I slept. I pulled out the embossed card the fence Veronica had given me, as well as the original insecure comm Locke had purchased. I connected voice only. Hello, Irina, Veronica answered on the second ring. Frustrated already? The fact that she'd connected my identity to my comm just proved that she was the right lady for the job. Something like that, I said. Can we meet? A long pause followed. I let the silence linger. I should not, Veronica said at last. But I find myself intrigued. I will send you the location. Be there in twenty. The line went dead. A few seconds later, an encrypted message arrived with an address at the edge of the central district, nearest to her shop. I'd have to hustle to make it early enough to scope out the location. With no time to waste, I headed straight for the meeting point. Enough people were on the streets that I could blend into the normal hustle and bustle. I stopped two blocks away. Our meeting place appeared to be a tiny tea shop tucked between two boarded-up buildings. The shop had a steady stream of business. I activated my cuff into the same defensive mode I'd used yesterday. If I got close to someone, they might feel an odd sensation, like the air before a storm, but it wouldn't activate unless someone shot at me. It was a paltry defense, but it was the best I had. I approached the shop with unhurried steps. Nothing appeared out of place, and I didn't feel watched. A bell over the door announced my entrance. A lovely older lady stood behind the counter taking orders. An older gentleman, her husband, perhaps, prepared each order. 
Veronica was not in the store. It was dinner time, so I ordered a pot of jasmine green tea, a lemon scone, and a plate of tea sandwiches. I considered paying with the currency chips I had, but Veronica knew I would be here. I'd save the chips for when I truly needed to be anonymous. After I paid, the old woman peered up at me, then nodded. She is waiting in the bag, she said with a wave. Go on, I will bring your food and tea. Thank you, I said. I pushed through the curtained door, not entirely sure what to expect. Veronica sat on a floor cushion next to a low table. A cup of tea steamed softly in the cool air of the room. She was dressed much the same as I was, except her hood was thrown back. Join me, she said. Her voice was just as lovely as I remembered. I knelt on the cushion that put my back to the wall. It put me adjacent to Veronica instead of across from her. She smiled into her cup but didn't comment. The woman from the front brought my pot of tea and a delicate porcelain cup. She poured the first cup, then went back to get my food. She placed it on the table, bowed, and returned to the counter. I swiped my identity chip over the tabletop reader and added a generous tip to my order. I'd recently spent four months as a waitress and bartender. It was one of the longest times I'd been able to stay in one place, hiding in plain sight. After all, no one expected Lady Ada von Hasenberg to be running plates and dealing with drunks. I hadn't needed the money, but after more than a year on the run, I had needed the companionship. The ladies I worked with were amazing, and unlike my experience with the Merck squad, I enjoyed their company. But it had been eye-opening just how little a full-time job could pay. So now I was even more conscious about tipping well. Veronica set a circular device on the table and clipped the middle. I took a sip of tea and pretended ignorance. I didn't know where she'd gotten her hands on a silencer, but I would dearly love to. All communications from inside a six-foot radius from the silencer would not transmit outside that radius. Voices, comms, bugs, nothing. Yet we could still hear the faint murmurs from the front of the shop. They were so illegal that I hadn't even bothered to steal one when I'd left home. Because while Ada von Hasenberg had permission to carry one, neither Irina Hassan nor Maria Franco did. And getting caught with one was an automatic ten-year sentence. You may lower your hood if you like. It's safe here. And would you prefer Irina or... She paused delicately. If it was meant to shock me, it worked. I pulled myself together and refocused on my purpose. I lowered my hood. Irina is fine. Thank you for agreeing to meet, I said after another sip of tea. At least the tea was good. I picked up one of the delicate triangle tea sandwiches and was transported back to my mother's afternoon tea parties. The women of the consortium were just as bloodthirsty and power-hungry as the men, perhaps more so, and entertaining a lady's tea always struck me as entering a nest of pretty vipers. I am still not sure it was a good idea, she said, breaking me from my thoughts. Probably not, I agreed. She grinned. The expression made her look years younger. Perhaps she was not that much older than me after all. But all the same, I'm glad you did, I said. I need... assistance. I am willing to pay. Money is only an incentive if I'm alive to enjoy it, she said. And considering I have an idea of the trouble hounding you, that's a pretty big if. I'm not asking for involvement. Just a little information and perhaps an item or two, if you happen to have them sitting around. She took a sip of her tea. I let the silence settle around us. I'd said all I was willing to at this point. The rest was up to her. Finally, she said, And if I want to be involved? I would strongly discourage it, I said immediately. I paused, reconsidered. Unless you are special ops, I said. Then I could use the help. Her laugh was even more entrancing than her voice. 
You are not what I expected, she said. Let us discuss details. As I'm sure you're aware, the silencer will keep our conversation private. I will begin. I want off this planet. Warning bells went off. What is preventing you from doing that now? I asked. From the look of her shop, she was highly successful. Successful fences were not poor. Shadows darkened her eyes. No one will take me. Even new visitors are warned off before I can book passage. Okay, I said slowly. If I take you, do I need to worry about an angry husband hunting us? It won't affect my decision, but I need to be able to prepare for it. He is not my husband, and he is off-planet now, so we should not have to worry about him. But yes, he will follow me if I leave a trail, so I will not leave a trail. And when I am safe, I will deal with him. She smiled with vicious intent. I finished the last of the tiny sandwiches and broke off a piece of scone. I am not opposed to taking you off planet, but my own escape plan is shaky at best. There are many things that can go wrong. Most probably will. And even if it goes off perfectly, we won't be safe. You should know that before you commit. She tilted her head and studied me for a few seconds before her eyes widened. You're stealing a ship, she breathed. You're stealing Rockhurst's ship. I neither confirmed nor denied the claim. She laughed, caught between delight and astonishment. What do you need to pull this off? First, I have reason to believe my companion has been captured. I need to know his location, as well as the building blueprints. Guard locations would be helpful, too. Do you know who he is? She asked. I gave her a pointed look. She smiled, then sobered. He is being held at the detention center the mercs use before they ship out their bounties, she said. News travels fast here. So far, his identity remains secret, but it won't for long. Same for you. I am hoping to be gone before it becomes a problem. I also need these items, I said. I held up my comm display so she could see the list. Her eyebrows climbed her forehead as she read, but she didn't balk. I can get most of those today. The last two will take a bit longer. Maybe by tomorrow. I nodded. Good. I'd like to be ready by tomorrow night if possible. The longer I stay, the worse the danger becomes. I let frost creep into my expression. And if you betray me, your nod husband will be the least of your worries. She remained unruffled. I would not have met with you if I hadn't already decided to throw my lot in with yours. We succeed or fail together now. Do not let me down. The weight of responsibility settled around me. Now I had two people counting on me. And while I was sure both of them would be fine without me, I always felt responsible for those in my care. According to my father, it made me a terrible von Hasenberg. We separated and left through different entrances. Veronica promised to contact me tomorrow when she had all of the items I'd requested. That left me the rest of the day to do my initial prep work. I turned off the insecure comm Locke had bought for me. It wasn't that I didn't trust Veronica. It was that I didn't trust anyone. Leaving the comm off meant it couldn't be tracked. It also meant she couldn't contact me in an emergency. But the trade-off was worth it. I wouldn't sleep if I had to worry about a sneak attack. The detention center was at the edge of the central commercial district near the spaceport. It also matched up with where Locke's tracker went silent. So either they were being super careful to make it look like Locke was being held, or he actually was being held. The trick was figuring out which before I barged in and got myself killed. I cut through the opposite side of the central district from where I needed to be using the same invisible walk I'd used to walk within a meter of Richard. No one paid me any mind. I came at the detention center from a diagonal. Without a clear line of sight down the streets, I could get closer before I risked discovery. Six blocks away, 
I slipped into a narrow alley. It had been wider until some enterprising soul had extended their business. The close walls worked for me, though, and I climbed to the roof without breaking a sweat. I kept the chimney between me and the detention center. I didn't think Richard's team would be surveying this far out, but underestimating them was a one-way ticket to Captureville. I'd never been a quitter. It wasn't in my DNA. But I was looking forward to the days when I wouldn't be stuck on a cold, dark roof trying to figure out if my current favorite fugitive was being held captive inside the building in the distance, all while avoiding an entire city of mercenaries. For now, I had to be careful. Because if I could see the detention center, anyone there could see me, too. I flattened myself to the roof and crawled around the chimney. With the chimney behind me, my silhouette wouldn't be as noticeable. Probably. Hopefully. The buildings in this area were all originally single-story, so only chimneys and creative mudblock additions obscured my view of the detention center. The center took up an entire block and had a wide-open plaza around it. It offered no cover and no reason to approach. I pulled out the digital scope Veronica had given me as we left. It was the first item on my list. Staying as low as possible, I quickly scanned the detention center's roof. I didn't see anyone, but I did see a shit ton of cameras. There would be no access from the roof unless I wanted the whole city to know when I'd arrived. Until I got the blueprints, there was no way to know if underground access was a possibility. But based on everything I saw, I would assume not. So I'd have to waltz up to the front door, break in, break lock out, and waltz back out again before reinforcements arrived. Right. No problem. The spotters here were either too well hidden, non-existent, unlikely, or hidden behind some of the surrounding roof adornments that blocked my view, because I couldn't find any of them, even after watching for two hours. I stretched sore muscles and crept back around the chimney. Climbing down was way more difficult than climbing up. Luckily, foot traffic in this area was low and no one wanted to risk the dark, narrow alley. I took a fairly straight path out of the central district. I wasn't headed in the direction of the house, so I was not concerned about covering my path just yet. I had nearly made it when three men stumbled out of a building in front of me. They weren't Rockhurst soldiers, so I ignored them. They did not return the favor. Hey, buddy. Got any creds? The one in front slurred. Help a brother out. That bastard kicked us out. He was stocky, with dark hair, and he reeked of the distinctive chemical odor of cheap synthol and tobacco. His two lankier buddies were in even worse shape, leaning against each other just to stay vertical. Whoever that bastard was, he or she should have kicked them out a long time ago, even though the night was still young. They were all six sheets to the wind, and it wouldn't take much to push them over the edge into violence, especially if they got kicked out because they were broke. Nothing made a drunk meaner than taking away the booze. I kept my head down and stepped around the men. Stocky didn't appreciate my lack of enthusiasm. Hey, buddy! I'm talking to you. Sorry, I said gruffly. If you're not going to help us out, I guess we'll just have to help ourselves, he said. He pulled a wicked-looking blade, and suddenly his companions looked a whole lot more sober. Fantastic. I backed away, but Lackey One flashed a blast pistol. Running just became a non-option. Hey, I said. I don't want any trouble. Stocky squinted at me. You a woman? A lecherous grin spread across his face. Looks like our luck's changed, boys. I stood straight, throwing off my invisible persona. It hadn't protected me, so I needed a new plan. I do not have time to deal with you right now. Move, I said in my most commanding tone. Stocky took a half-step back before straightening his own spine and closing the distance between us, waving the knife in his right hand. 
it would have been more threatening if he came up higher than my chin. Still, I could work with this. I ignored what his mouth was saying. It was hardly polite, and watched his body language. The next time the knife came my way, I struck. I clamped my left hand onto the wrist of his knife hand and pulled it across my body to the right. Without releasing his wrist, I used my right hand to deliver a fast, sharp blow to the back of his hand. He dropped the knife. The synthol reek must not have been entirely fake, because his reflexes were slow. I pulled him the rest of the way between me and his lackeys, then transferred my grip to the back of his collar. I drew my pistol and jabbed him in the kidney with it. It took less than five seconds. The lackey with a pistol gaped at me. He tentatively raised the pistol, but lowered it again when Stocky frantically shook his head. Now you've made me late, I said. And I hate being late. We didn't mean nothing, Stocky whimpered. Oh, I think we both know that's a lie. And you know what else I hate? Liars. So, this is your last chance to get in my good graces. Tell your friends to drop their weapons. I could tell by the way he stiffened that he had a plan that didn't involve dropping the weapons. I mourned in the second before he moved. Then I let him go as he dropped down toward the knife on the ground. Lackey One brought his blaster up, but not fast enough. I shot him through the chest. Lackey Two broke and ran. I let him go. It was a bad tactical decision, but I just couldn't shoot him in cold blood. And unless he had reinforcements in the next block, I'd be gone before he returned. Stocky lunged at me with a knife. I shot him point blank. The energy bolt punched a hole through his head. I scanned for new threats. No one had come to investigate, but that luck wouldn't hold for long. I steeled my emotions and quickly searched both men being careful not to leave fingerprints. I took the blaster and extra energy cells from the lackey. Nothing else was worth stealing. I left the two men sprawled on the ground and faded into the shadows. Chapter 11 After checking myself for trackers and coming up clean, I slid down the wall. I was in a hidden alcove far into the abandoned section of the city. Control slipped away and hot tears flooded my eyes. I bowed my head to my knees and let them flow. Those two weren't the first people I'd killed, but it was cold comfort. And while it was tempting to push the pain away, to bury it deep, I knew that way lay demons. Taking another person's life even in self-defense, was an event worth mourning. If I lost the ability to feel that pain, then I lost myself. I poured the pain out one tear at a time until I was empty inside. Then I dried my eyes and pieced myself back together. By the time I stood, I had myself under control. Sadness still pulsed in time with my heart but my outer armor gave away none of my inner turmoil. In a high house, only the facade mattered, so we each became experts, in our own ways, of hiding behind serene faces and sharp eyes. It was a skill that served me well now. I worked my way home, being extra careful. The little bedroom was just how I'd left it, but tonight it felt especially empty. I mentally went through rescue scenarios. None were great, and all depended heavily on information from Veronica. If she double-crossed me, I was sunk. When I could no longer keep my eyes open, I gave up and dropped into a fitful sleep. Bianca's message had arrived overnight. It once again came with many sentences and all caps and dire warnings about my future health if she got her hands on me. But she'd gotten the information I needed and had not told father. She had, however, passed along my concerns about a looming war. Based on her oblique references, it was not the first warning they had received, but they were keeping it off the family systems. If they were worried about a spy at that level, 
Things were dire indeed. I decrypted the files she sent with our personal shared key. Pegasaurus. It was a magical creature we'd made up as children, a cross between a dinosaur and a pegasus. It looked like a winged, scaly horse with an extra-long neck and extra-sharp teeth. Each family member had a secret key shared with one other family member. It kept our communications safe, even from the family. Because sometimes a meddling family member was worse than an enemy. The list she'd sent me contained six potential override codes. Richard was known to use his own codes and change them with some frequency. The latest codes in the list had been changed less than a month ago. My entire plan rested on these 60 digits. If one of these keys didn't work, I didn't have a backup. And that was a problem. Today I would scope out the spaceport, see what other ships were available for commandeering at a moment's notice. Another ship wouldn't get us very far, but if we found one with a little offensive weaponry, we could at least slow Richard down enough to escape to a busier planet. Hopefully. I ate two energy bars and drank a bottle and a half of water. If everything went according to plan, I wouldn't be back here tonight. I raided Locke's bags and shoved all of the extra energy bars and clothes into mine. I would leave the pack with Veronica when I busted Locke out. He might appreciate a spare set of clothes. With everything ready, I set off. Ten minutes out, I turned on the insecure comm. I had an encrypted message from Veronica with meeting instructions. She had managed to acquire all but one of the items I requested, and she was working on the last item. Traveling with a pack made it harder to blend in, so I decided to head to Veronica's before checking the spaceport. Plus, if she was going to double-cross me, it was better to know now. Her house was on the edge of the central district. It was a nicer area, where the plastic buildings were well-maintained and not augmented with mud bricks. Most of the buildings on this street were two-story houses. Lights were on in several houses, and a few people were out in the street. Nothing set off any alarm bells, but I kept my guard up. I walked the block, then turned and came up behind the house. I knocked on the back door. A few minutes later, it cracked open to reveal Veronica. I should have known you wouldn't use the front door like a normal person, she said. Never mind that this is more suspicious looking. She stepped back and gestured me in. Just be glad I didn't pick the lock, I said. The house was a minimalist's wet dream, with white walls, faux wood floors, and just enough furniture to prove someone lived here. One look and I knew this was not her house, not with the way her shop was arranged. I found the blueprints to the detention center. There weren't any surprises, so if you were hoping for a secret entrance, you're going to be disappointed. I did have a few little birdies report on men loitering around the center, though, so I know the location of two of the outside guards. Any info on whether Locke is actually inside? A big man with a shaved head was dragged inside by four of those new guys. He hasn't come back out, but the men come and go. Well, damn. I had half hoped Locke had betrayed me because then I wouldn't feel responsible for rescuing him. And while it was still possible I was walking straight into a trap, I just couldn't leave without trying. Your little birdies say how many of those new guys are floating around? At least a dozen, she said. But nobody can get a good enough look at them for an accurate count. Even the working ladies haven't seen them, and that's unusual for a Merc squad on planet. Richard was keeping his troops on a tight leash. You have a plan? She asked. I have a plan, I confirmed. A crazy, ridiculous, outlandish plan, but a plan nonetheless. Now I just had to pull it off without getting myself or either of the people counting on me killed. No problem. I have all of your stuff in the study, she said, if you want to take a look. I nodded and followed her, just to ensure that someone wasn't going to pop out and shoot me. Luckily for me, there was nowhere to hide in the study. 
A lone desk made from wood and glass held the place of honor across from the door. An uncomfortable-looking white chair sat behind it. Someone had pulled in a folding table and loaded it down with the supplies I'd need for tonight. It was an unsightly blemish on the pristine minimalism of the room. The contrast jarred, but I'd take the messy clutter over the sterile desk any day. Looking through the items on the table, I had to give Veronica credit. She had pulled in a lot of strange items on very short notice. Perhaps I'd offer her a house job after all, assuming we made it off planet. I shrugged off the pack. I'll need you to bring this to our meeting point because I can't carry it while I'm rescuing Locke. Veronica nodded. I'll make sure it gets put with my stuff. For now, I'm going to scope out the spaceport. I will go with you. She held up a hand when I would have protested. I am frequently at the spaceport, either to meet traitors or to attempt to find passage, and I often bring a companion. If I go, you are much less likely to be found. I dug the holster I'd requested out of the pile on the table and strapped it around my waist, then slid in my original blast pistol. The new pistol I'd picked up last night I kept hidden in my offhand pocket. It wasn't the safest or most convenient, but the element of surprise would be worth it. Let's go, I said. True to her word, people nodded at Veronica, but few stopped to question her. Those who did ignored me entirely. My fingers remained clenched around my pistol grip, sure every time that this time would be when she would point at me and announce me to the world. When we entered the spaceport terminal, I finally hissed at her. What are you doing? Trust me, she murmured. She headed straight for the exit out to the ships. The older man in a security guard uniform looked up and smiled, then remembered to frown. Veronica, he said softly. You know no one will take you. Come on, Tabo. I just want to look. Let a woman dream, won't you? He sighed, but nodded. Don't cause any trouble. Veronica's smile was brittle. Do I ever? She asked. Tabo opened the door and waved us through. Once we were out of earshot, I whispered, I can't believe that worked. I told you, I come here often. Her voice was wistful. Tabo is too nice for his own good. He can't stand to see a woman in pain. He told me once that if he had a ship, he'd take me off planet in a heartbeat. If there is any way to avoid hurting him, please do so. I will do my best, I said. The launch pads were arrayed in a set of three arcs leading away from the terminal. A wide road split each arc in two and allowed ships farther out to have a safe passageway for ground travel. In total, a dozen ships could land at once. Today, three were berthed, and it seemed like that might be an unusually high number, based on the state of disrepair most of the pads were in. Larger ships docked on the farthest arc, and Richard's ship was the only one out there. It wasn't big enough to require the extra space, so they'd dock it for privacy. The ship practically glowed with good maintenance and money. I'd seen maybe three mercenary ships ever that looked that good. No wonder Locke immediately picked up on it being one of Richard's ships. The cargo ramp was lowered, but the door was closed. Two small ships both older and in dire need of exterior maintenance, sat in the closest arc, one on each side. If we had to abandon Richard's ship, we would need to run back toward the terminal to take one of these two ships. That was less than ideal, but I couldn't see a way around it. The ship on the left was a Yamato ship. It was impossible to tell its age just by looking, but I guessed at least fifty. Meant for short-range jumps only, it would truly be our last resort. The right ship was a von Hasenberg ship that we'd stopped producing before I was born. It was marginally newer than the Yamato ship, but that wasn't saying much. It was equipped with a long-range FTL drive, but it took forever to charge. If they jumped it on the way here, it was likely still charging. Fuck. 
Based on these two backups, it was imperative that we take Richard's ship. There was no way I could take on six or more elite soldiers on my own, even if my harebrained scheme worked. If Locke wasn't in fighting shape, then we would have to abort and settle for the von Hasenberg ship. I've seen enough, I said. Veronica cast one more wistful glance at the ships, then turned and headed back to the terminal. I followed. We need to walk by the detention center, I said. The side farthest away from everything else. Then you need to find a reason for why we walked by, even if it's to stop for tea. I regularly shop in the market nearby. The detention center isn't exactly on the way, but I often stalk through this district after a visit to the spaceport. We exited the terminal and turned right. A two-meter plastic fence marked the edge of spaceport property. The holes were too small to use for climbing, so we'd have to go through. That would be the least of our problems. Five minutes later, we walked past the detention center. It was just as bad as I feared. No cover, cameras everywhere, and only two main access points. This would have to be a quick and dirty rescue. We stopped in the street market while Veronica bartered with a few vendors. I reined in my impatience. Diverting suspicion was worth the extra few minutes, but I breathed a sigh of relief when we headed back to the house. Once we were inside, I went straight for the desk. A hand wave brought up the display, and the flat keyboard embedded into the desk's surface lit up. Is this secure? I asked Veronica. No. I bounced my connection through a variety of universal servers until I was happy that, while not secure, it would at least be difficult to track the connection back to this address. Then I got down to work. The detention center server was easy to find. It was harder to breach. I kicked off my cracking scripts while I manually poked around. It took longer than I would have liked, but the scripts finally found an overlooked, vulnerable service. I set up a back door, and then I was in. I pulled up the various video streams. The outside of the building showed from all angles. No blind spots. The inside was the same story. I flipped through the cameras until I found Locke. He was in a solid-sided holding cell in the middle of the building. Shackles connected his spread arms to the wall, and his ankles were attached to a short chain and leg shackle. By the way he slumped, he was sleeping, passed out, or dead. Blood ran down his arms from his wrists. Bruises and swelling marred his face. Richard had not been kind. Rage burned hot, and my decision to rescue Locke cemented. I pushed the rage back and focused on the other cameras. The lack of interior guards was an unexpected surprise. The house Richard was staying at was less than five minutes away at a flat run, so they must figure they could get there before any escape attempt succeeded. I would have to prove them wrong. Locke shifted. Still alive, then. But I didn't know how hurt. If he couldn't walk, then we were royally fucked. I could only deal with one problem at a time, so I prayed he looked worse than he felt and moved on. Veronica poked her head in the room. I received word that the last of your supplies just arrived. They were not cheap, and I didn't have room to bargain. They're worth it, I said without looking up. I'll reimburse you. She lingered. Is this really going to work? I met her gaze. I don't know. But I'm going to do my damnedest to make sure it does. And I need you to do the same. You good? I'd be better if I knew what you were planning. All in good time. Are you packed and ready? Nearly. Good. We're going tonight. She sucked in a breath. I'm almost afraid to hope, she said very quietly. Then I'll hope enough for both of us. I strapped on the thin ballistic armor designed to deflect energy bolts. It only worked about half the time, but with the backup of my necklace and cuff, I hoped it was good enough to keep me alive. Ideally, it wouldn't even be needed, but I'd never be that lucky. 
Pistols went in holsters on each hip. A pair of flashbang grenades went next to them, along with two modified smoke grenades and a set of six mini vaporizers. A knife and a plasma cutter rounded out my easily accessible equipment. Each had a distinct shape so I wouldn't grab the wrong one by accident. A backup battery snugged against my low back and connected via inductive charger to my cuff. With the extra boost, the cuff should protect against six or seven glancing shots and two or three direct hits. Lock would not be protected, and I couldn't afford to be slowed down by an extra set of armor. I'd just have to stay between him and any shooters. A small pack with the rest of my supplies went on. Then my cloak would go over the whole lot. Veronica would be responsible for my big pack, as well as her things. Locke and I would meet her two blocks from the detention center. I picked up the control tablet of the first drone. The drones were the last items on my list and the most expensive and difficult to find. I had no doubt that Veronica reached out to contacts on the smuggler side of the planet to purchase them, because they weren't something that normal people had just sitting around. The fact that she hadn't needed me to transfer money to pay for them said a lot about her financial situation. The size of a shoebox, these drones were flying EMP bombs used by police and military forces to shut down the electronics of a single building or small block. Depending on the layout and shielding of the target building, either the electronics inside would go down permanently until replacement parts were ordered, or they would experience a temporary hiccup that could be corrected in a matter of minutes. I hoped for the former and planned for the latter. And there was a sort of beautiful irony in the fact that these were Rockhurst drones. I logged into the control tablet, changed all of the default codes, and set the mode in target. I watched as it took off and circled high away from the city. I did the same with the second drone, except I set it to attack 15 seconds later. The first would hit Richard's house. The second would hit the detention center. Both control tablets went into my pockets. I now had an hour to get in position. Adrenaline blitzed through my system. My fingers trembled as I set up the last of my scripts on the detention center's server. My backup plans had backup plans. I padded all of my gear one last time. I was as ready as I was going to be. I pulled on my cloak and settled the smart glasses over my eyes. The glasses synced to my comm and could overlay info on the transparent screen. The time ticked away in the upper left corner of the display, along with a countdown timer. You know where we are meeting, I said to Veronica. She nodded, but she was pale and sweating, with a hunted expression. Are you okay? Her throat moved as she swallowed. I'm worried you won't show. That this is all for nothing. And I'm worried that you're going to double-cross me at the last minute, I said bluntly. She looked appalled. It was better than the stark fear she'd worn before. I continued. So we're both worried. But I will be there. If I don't die first. I didn't say that aloud because it wouldn't help her. Okay, she said. I will be there too and I will not betray you. See you in an hour, I said. I slipped into the alley and prayed for success. Chapter 12 It took forever to work my way around the city to the centuries, but I had planned that time into my schedule. It was late enough that the streets were deserted. This sentry was trying to pass as homeless, but he was too clean, his gear too nice. At five minutes to the first attack, I palmed a vaporizer and stumbled down his alley. I hummed a body song in my lowest tone. The soldier glanced at me, then dismissed me to continue watching the detention center. It would be his last mistake of the evening. I stumbled into him, then activated the vaporizer under his nose. Even training was no use against human nature. He inhaled in surprise. His eyes rolled back and he slumped against the wall. Depending on his metabolism, he'd be out for 20 to 40 minutes. One minute until the first EMP drone hit. I moved as close as I could while still being in the shadows of the surrounding buildings. 
I'd already taken the other sentry out. He would be waking up in as little as ten minutes, but a stronger dose would have likely killed him, so I'd just have to work with the time I had. My calm vibrated as the displayed countdown timer hit zero. Drone strike one should have just happened. A new timer popped up on the display, counting up. This was our escape timer. At 15 seconds, a loud pop came from the detention center roof. Now that the danger to my own electronics had passed, I sprinted across the plaza to the back door. The electronic keypad was dead and the door was unlocked. I sent up a fervent prayer of thanks that the service scripts had done their job in the 15 seconds between attacks. The breaching charges in my backpack might not be needed after all. I drew my pistol and eased inside. The glasses immediately adjusted to the darkness, and I could see down the hallway. It was empty. Based on the video feeds and the blueprints, Locke's cell was about halfway down on the left. I didn't have time to clear all of the rooms. The video feeds had shown them empty, so I would just have to trust that they'd stayed that way. I passed several sets of offices, then large, open-barred cells. The solid cells were clustered together in the center of the building. When I reached the block of solid cells, I confirmed all of the doors were open. I stopped at the first one in case I needed quick cover. Lock, I whispered. The cavalry has arrived. Time to go. Marcus stepped out of a cell that was definitely not his. He clutched a length of metal and moved with obvious pain. I must say, Ada, darling, I did not expect to see you again. I figured you'd be long gone by now. Would have been the smart move, I agreed. We have three minutes, more or less, to vacate this building before the backup arrives. Then we're meeting a friend and stealing a ship. Can you do it? I have a single dose of Foxy if you need it. A mix of stimulants and painkillers, and Foxy, street named Foxy, was a common battlefield panacea. It wasn't very good for the soldiers taking it, though, because they'd be more likely to hurt themselves further while they were hyped up and feeling invincible. But if it got Locke from here to the ship, it would be worth it. He walked over with only a slight limp. I don't need it. Nice glasses. You got a spare gun. Thanks to the high-tech lenses, I had forgotten that it was completely dark in here. But watching Locke, I'd never know it. I vowed to get a closer look at his ocular implants before we parted ways. I handed over the spare pistol, a knife, and a radio earpiece, then turned and ran back down the long hallway. Locke kept up without even a grunt of pain. It had been two and a half minutes since the first drone strike. I stopped by the door and peeked out. No obvious snipers and no one took a pot shot at me. Locke tried to stop me before I stepped outside, but I darted out of reach. I'm wearing ballistic armor, I said, and we need to move. No one shot at us as we crossed the plaza to the shelter of the nearby buildings. We're meeting Veronica the fence, I said. Don't shoot her unless she has betrayed us. I heard that, Veronica's quiet voice said through my earpiece. Another minute, and I slowed. Veronica should be just around the corner. Now is the time of truth. Either she'd be there alone, or Richard and his crew would be waiting. You think she'll betray you? Locke asked. It's a possibility. I said at the same time she said, no. A quick glance around the corner revealed Veronica. An overloaded, tarp-covered sled floated beside her. She saw me immediately and smiled a huge, relieved smile. Told you, she said. The three of us made our way to the wall around the spaceport. I pulled out my portable plasma cutter. Will your sled go over the wall? Yes, Veronica said. That made things easier. Portable cutters didn't have as much power as their full-sized counterparts. Precious seconds ticked by as I cut a hole big enough for the three of us to squeeze through one at a time. The timer had climbed past five minutes by the time we made it through the fence. Richard would be at the detention center, and he would likely guess our next target. Not to mention the spaceport security forces. Can you fight the soldiers on board Richard's ship, or do we need to take the von Hasenberg ship instead? I asked Locke. I can fight, he said. 
His heaving chest and pinched brow threatened to undermine his words. But the resolution in his expression said that come hell or high water, he could get it done. I took him at his word. We arrived at Richard's ship just as the spaceport alarm sounded. Stay here, I said. I climbed the cargo ramp and slid open the control panel. On a whim, I hit the door open button. When the door actually started opening, I stared at it in shock. Was the door unlocked because of hubris or because I was about to face a platoon of men? As soon as the door cleared ten centimeters, I pulled a flashbang grenade and rolled it into the cargo bay. I followed it with one of my modified smoke bombs. Masks! Veronica handed us each a nose and mouth mask from her bag. Give me the foxy, Locke said. I handed him the injector and he jabbed it in his thigh. The rush would hit in thirty seconds and last for twenty minutes. I will need cover, I said. I'll be stuck at the access panel in the cargo bay until I override the ship's control. Don't take your mask off, even if the smoke clears. If we need to retreat, give me a warning. He nodded, then ducked under the door and disappeared. I took a deep breath, threw back my hood, and followed him. It was time to do or die. The cargo hold was piled with various pieces of equipment lashed to the floor. Locke was nowhere to be seen, and neither were any Rockhurst soldiers. I heard an occasional shot through the earpiece, but Locke was eerily silent. Once Veronica and her sled cleared the door, I hit the manual close button. When that closes, I said, lock it. I pointed to the lock control. It wouldn't keep out someone with the access codes, but it would prevent spaceport security from opening the door as easily as we had. I dropped my backpack by the door, then found the internal access panel and slid it open to reveal the control terminal. While I had access to the door functions, everything else was locked down. I pulled up the diagnostic screen and started entering the override codes from memory. The standard Rockhurst code failed. Richard had changed the default codes, which made my job infinitely harder. I kept trying. I had just entered the third unsuccessful code when my bracelet pulsed and sparks flew from a deflected stun shot. Shit. I turned to find the assailant, but he'd already ducked back into cover. Can you shoot? I asked Veronica. She nodded, so I handed her the gun. Stand close to me and keep him pinned down for another couple minutes. She was also wearing ballistic armor, and if she stayed close, the soldier wasn't likely to switch to deadly ammo because he'd risk hitting me. The fourth code failed, and Veronica fired on the soldier. Angry butterflies took flight in my stomach and my heart rate picked up. Only two codes left. Come on, come on. Shit! Veronica yelled. I heard her hit the deck at the same time my cuff pulsed and another shot bounced away. One or two more shots like that and I'd be done. I steadied my hands and typed in the fifth code. Failure. Veronica fired on the soldier's position, but everything felt distant and fuzzy. I typed in the sixth code. The last code Bianca had included. If this code didn't work, I had no backup. We'd have to haul ass to the von Hasenberg ship, assuming security didn't already have us surrounded. I entered each digit with extreme care. Veronica shouted something, but I didn't have time to bother with her. My cuff pulsed weakly, and an energy shot exploded near my head. Had they moved to deadly force? After entering the last digit, the world paused for an eternal moment. Then I was in, and everything snapped back into real time. I immediately set up my new override codes and wiped the ones Richard had set. I did not use my preferred codes because I had no doubt House Rockhurst's spies knew what they were, and I didn't want Richard to be able to take the ship back as easily as I'd taken it from him. I deleted all authorized users and added myself as captain, but voice command authorization would have to wait until we weren't under attack. I locked the ship down and retracted the cargo ramp. If Richard wanted in now, he'd have to take a plasma cutter to the cargo bay door. Even with a heavy-duty system, it would take hours. Unusual movement in my peripheral vision caused me to spin around. A Rockhurst soldier was valiantly trying to lift a stun stick in my direction, 
but it appeared my smoke grenade was finally getting to him, because he blinked blearily and wove on his feet. Veronica was down, but she appeared stunned instead of dead. I wrestled the stun stick away from the soldier and hit him with it. Yeah, it was low, but the bastard had shot at me. I didn't feel too bad. Locke, I'm in the system. Are you okay? How many are left? I'm busy, Locke growled. Just stay put. No can do, I'm afraid. I have to get us in the air. Keep your mask on. I stepped back to the access terminal, turned on the internal ventilation systems, and turned off the filtration. Then I found an air intake vent and cracked my last smoke grenade in front of it. Don't kill the downed soldiers. We'll dump them before takeoff. Locke didn't respond. I checked on Veronica. She was starting to come around. She must have gotten stunned. Keep your mask on, I said. I'm heading to the flight deck. I'll let you know when it's safe. She nodded weakly. Once all of the Rockhurst soldiers were knocked out, I'd have to purge and replace all of the air before we left the atmosphere. But it was safer than fighting the soldiers outright. I picked up the discarded pistol and kept the stun stick. This was a Rockhurst ship. I had a basic idea of the layout, but unlike Yamato, Rockhurst frequently tweaked their ship designs. Still, the flight deck was generally in the same place. I headed out of the cargo deck toward the front of the ship. Two more disoriented soldiers met the business end of the stun stick before I made it to the flight deck. The door was locked, but thanks to my newly minted captain status, I overrode the lock. The room was empty. I entered and locked the door behind me. No reason to let someone sneak up on me. I dropped into the captain's chair and logged in. First, I added myself to the ship's voice authorization. Infinian, this is Ada von Hasenberg. Authorize. Welcome, Captain von Hasenberg. You are authorized. Thank you. Show me the outside cameras. The screens in the walls came on with a 360-degree view of the surroundings. Two security guards stood behind the ship, talking on handheld comms. The rest of Richard's team had not shown up yet, which meant his communications must still be down. Infinian, sweep the ship and show me the locations of all life forms on board. A translucent 3D model of the ship appeared above the captain's console. More than a dozen red dots appeared, indicating people. Holy shit. Four were in the cargo bay alone. Veronica, are you okay? I asked. I see two extra people in the cargo bay. Are you under attack? I am not under attack, she said. That was a dodge of the question, but the two extras weren't moving, so I focused on the only moving dot. I assumed it was Locke, but one of the red dots near him blinked out. Locke, what are you doing? He didn't respond. Shit. Infinian, transfer this map to my comm and prepare for takeoff. Yes, Captain. The computer responded. The map overlay came up on my glasses display. The moving dot was down a level near the crew quarters. I slid down the nearest access ladder. Two soldiers, dead, not sleeping, slumped in the hall. I stepped around them and closed on the moving dot. Locke spun and crouched as I came around the corner. His pistol came up, but he paused before firing. He was not wearing his mask. He should not still be awake. But I could tell by his expression that the foxy had a deep grip on him. Infinian, I said under my breath. Turn on air filtration. Purge and replace all of the ship's breathable air. A chime confirmed my command. Then the ventilation system turned on high enough to produce a draft in the hallway. I held my arms out in a careful gesture. Locke, it's me, I said. Put down the blaster. We won. He stood up but didn't put away the pistol. He frowned at me as if I was someone he distantly recognized. Foxy generally made the user more focused and able to ignore pain. There had been a few reports of odd side effects, but since the results couldn't be reliably reproduced, it hadn't been enough to prevent its use. I had a feeling I was seeing a new side effect firsthand.
I took a step closer, but Locke brought the pistol up in a defensive move. Okay, then. No closer. I would have to talk my way out of this one. Or wait out the effects. Locke, it's me, Ada. You remember me, right? I need your help. But you have to put the pistol down first. Ada, he murmured, testing the word. He blinked, holstered his gun, and closed the distance between us in two long strides. He backed me up against the wall and pressed his big body up against mine. He lifted me slightly and slid a thigh between my own. I settled with delicious friction against the hard muscles of his leg. I bit back a moan. Foxy did have one well-known side effect. In the right dosage, it was a strong aphrodisiac. It was one of the reasons it was such a popular street drug. The military doses were designed to work around the flaw, but it appeared that Veronica had procured a street dose. When I wouldn't let him remove my mask, Lot trailed burning kisses across my jaw and down my throat. I arched into him with a hiss before I could stop myself. I had to focus, damn it. Locke, you're high as a kite, I said. The foxy is fucking with your head. You're going to crash and burn in about ten minutes, and before you do... Uh... I moaned as his hand slid up my ribs and settled under my breast. His thumb traced a tantalizing line over my nipple, and it took all of my control not to just say fuck it and go with the flow. Before you crash... I need help, I said. My voice wavered. I'll help you, he murmured against my neck. He shifted, and I felt him, hot and hard against my thigh. I was going to be nominated for sainthood after this. Not that kind of help. Uh, trust me, if you weren't high as hell, I'd consider it. A neglected libido could only be suppressed for so long, and I'd passed the point of no return three kisses ago. I struggled to keep my thoughts on target. I pushed against his chest. I need you to help me move all of these soldiers to the cargo bay. I grabbed his head when he would have bent back to my neck. Lock. Focus. Richard is going to be here any second, and you are slowing us down. If Richard catches us, we're done. He'll kill us. He won't kill me, he said. And I'll protect you. That's sweet, but does not help me right now. I just hope you're high enough to forget this, I said. Then I hit him with a stun stick. He snarled at me and batted the stick out of my hand. I was so surprised that I let it go. I'd never seen anyone not go down when directly hit. Even the toughest von Hasenberg soldiers hit their knees. Locke just looked pissed. You better have a damn good reason for attacking me, sweetheart. I smiled in relief. You're back? He scowled at me, but then paused to take in our positions. His face went completely blank. Then he backed away like I was diseased. Okay, that stung a bit. I need you to help haul soldiers, I said. If my voice was icier than usual, he didn't call me on it. We'll put them out the cargo bay before we take off. We have to hurry. Or we could purge them, Locke said. No, help carry or get out of the way. I moved to the closest soldier. He outweighed me by at least 40 pounds, but he wasn't going to move himself. I pulled him up to a seated position then squatted down and wrapped my arms around his waist. A heave up and he was standing enough for me to duck down and get a shoulder under his waist. I gritted my teeth and wobbled to my feet with him balanced in a fireman's carry. One down. A dozen to go. I would never make it through all of them like this, but at least I'd dump this guy in the cargo bay while I thought of an alternative. Locke cursed behind me. Veronica, if you're up, get a sled out. I said. We'll pile these gentlemen on it, then toss the beacon out the door. Sleds were designed for hands-free operation, so they followed a paired beacon. If the beacon went out the door, the sled would follow. 
and as long as we were close to the ground, it would deal with the altitude adjustment without dumping the cargo. On it, Veronica said. The cargo bay stairs presented a challenge, but I still said a prayer of thanks that I didn't have to maneuver down a ladder carrying this much dead weight. True to her word, Veronica had a sled out when I walked up, sweating and trembling. I dumped the soldier on the sled and turned to retrieve another. Instead, I nearly ran into Locke. You stack them, he said. I'll carry them. He dumped the two men he was carrying with less care than I would have liked. But he carried two at once and didn't look close to death. So I kept my mouth shut. Veronica and I sat the first two men with their backs against the vertical back of the sled. The rest we sat in front of them, between their legs, leaning back. It was the only way I thought we could fit them all and also not accidentally suffocate one of them. Once they were all in the sled, we strapped them down as best we could. A peek at the cargo bay displayed showed that Richard had arrived and had spread his men out in a wide arc around the cargo bay doors. He was in for a surprise. Infinian, take us up six meters and hold. A chime answered me, and the engines roared to life. Richard's shocked face stared out of the display. Once we were at altitude, I partially opened the cargo bay door, then chucked the beacon out through the opening. The sled sailed after it and landed softly in front of Richard. Fury darkened his expression, and he shouted orders I could almost hear. I blew him a kiss on the display, closed the cargo door, and ordered the ship to take us up to 15 kilometers. That done, I turned to Veronica and drew my pistol, but kept it pointed at the ground. Now, I said... Would you care to explain why there are two extra people in here? Chapter 13 Veronica's chin tilted up to a stubborn angle, but she didn't deny the accusation. When I continued to stare at her, waiting, she sighed and went to her sled. She pulled off various bags and boxes until the top of a perforated box appeared. It's okay, Ima she said. Open up. The click of a lock, then the top of the box swung open. A young boy of four or five with straight black hair and huge dark eyes peeped over the top of the box. He had on a mask identical to the ones Veronica had procured for us. On seeing Veronica, he smiled and reached for her. Mama, he cried. I was very quiet for Ima, just like I promised. Wasn't I, Ima? An older woman in a mask stood stiffly and looked around with suspicion. She put herself between a scowling lock and the kid in an unconscious gesture of protection. You were very good, Baba, she said. The little boy beamed. See, Mama? Veronica blinked away tears and reached for her son. Yes, Pumpkin, you were very good. I'll get your surprise in a little while, okay? We have to unpack first, and I have some friends for you to meet. Veronica helped Ima out of the box, then led the little boy over to me. I holstered my gun before they reached me. Veronica said, Lynn, this is Lady Ada. Lynn swept into a respectable bow for a youngster, and the suspicion growing in my mind solidified. Veronica and I would be having a very long discussion once the kiddo was asleep. But the kid wasn't at fault, so I dropped into my most formal curtsy. It looked a little ridiculous in pants, but Lynn smiled shyly at me. I inclined my head. Lord Lynn, it is a pleasure to meet you. He giggled and pressed against Veronica's leg. She turned him toward Locke. That is Mr. Locke. Lynn slipped from her grasp and darted over to the larger man. Veronica's jaw clenched, but she didn't call him back. Lynn held out his tiny hand. It is a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Locke, he said, carefully mimicking my earlier words. Locke uncrossed his arms and shook Lynn's hand. Nice to meet you too, Squirt. Will I grow up as big as you? Lynn asked in awe. You might. 
if you eat your vegetables and listen to your mother. Lynn raced back to Veronica. Can we have vegetables for dinner? She smiled and ruffled his hair. We can have whatever you want, Pumpkin. But I don't want you to bother Mr. Locke, okay? He's very busy. Lynn's face fell. He kicked a toe at the floor. Yes, Mama. Now that I knew Veronica wasn't planning a mutiny, I needed to get us off planet stat. I'll leave you to unpack and settle in. I'm going to get us out of here before Richard regroups. Locke followed me to the flight deck. The kid is going to be a problem. I know, I said. But you're not leaving them. No, I said. Didn't figure you would, Locke said. Wouldn't let you anyway, he muttered. A quick glance confirmed the foxy had finally run its course. Locke wavered on his feet. I pulled him over to an empty chair and he slid bonelessly into it. I needed to grab a med scanner to make sure he didn't have any hidden injuries, but it would have to wait until I'd plotted our course. I dropped into the captain's chair and pulled up the navigation control. The FTL drive was fully charged and would be able to jump as soon as we cleared the atmosphere. Now for the moment of truth. How far could we go? I pulled up a list of reachable locations. The list included the space station I'd started at, the closest gate, and a few planets up to 3,000 light years away. This ship definitely had house internals, and good ones at that. Richard would be foaming at the mouth to get it back. The gate was the obvious choice. I had no doubt Richard had an array of tracking devices attached to this ship, and I'd never find them all. But if I could get far enough away, the tracking beacons would take so long to reach him that they would essentially become useless. I plotted a course to Earth, just to see how long the computer thought we'd have to wait at the gate while the FTL drive reset. I frowned at the estimate and changed the destination. But no matter how many different locations I tried, the estimated wait time was the same. One hour. I plotted a course with two jumps, and each jump was only going to require an hour's wait. An hour turnaround on an FTL drive was impossible. House von Hausenberg scientists were shaving minutes off of six hours and calling it a breakthrough. What we'd heard from the other houses was the same. And as far as I knew, even if you had the power stored for a second jump, there was no way to cool the FTL drive sufficiently in so little time without damaging it. So... Crap. Either the estimate was wrong, which would make us sitting ducks for an indeterminate amount of time, or, more worryingly, the estimate was right, which meant Richard would blow us out of the sky at the first opportunity rather than letting me steal the secret. Incoming communication, the computer chimed. The screen showed it originated from ground control, but I would bet good money that it was Richard. I weighed the pros and cons, then pressed the answer key on my console. It would keep the video on me rather than the entire room. Richard wiped the fury from his face, but not fast enough. Hello, Richard, I said. My aristocratic persona was firmly in place. Ada, what are you doing? I am leaving. What are you doing? He ran a hand down his face, and suddenly he looked more tired than I'd ever seen him. I'm trying to stop a war. You are not helping. You have an interesting way of going about it. I didn't want it to come to this, but you're the one who ran away. If we were already married, this wouldn't be happening. If we marry quickly, we may still be able to prevent it. If not, well, you would make an excellent bargaining piece. I ignored the last part because that was just standard house policy. The first part was more intriguing. We are both far down the house hierarchy. What does our marriage have to do with anything? Richard's expression closed. Ah, something about that was important. What did he stand to gain from our marriage? He would gain the contents of my dowry but I didn't know what all it entailed or how it would prevent war. I made a mental note to look into it. 
I will tell you the same thing I told father. I will not be forced into marriage. He did not believe me. He thought I would bow to his wishes if he applied enough pressure. He was wrong. I suggest you learn from his mistake. You would rather send your house to war than marry me? We were friends once. Richard seemed genuinely hurt. I refuse to believe that the only two solutions are our marriage or war. I do not understand why our marriage is so important, and until I do, I will not be marrying you. If you would clarify, perhaps I could help you find another solution. Then let me be clear. If you leave in that ship, it will mean war. You mean this mercenary ship that I found on a Yamato planet? This ship? The one I had to borrow after my transport was attacked unprovoked by House Rockhurst? I think the Consortium will be more than happy to hear the entire story from the beginning, along with the surveillance footage from the Mayport. I can call them up now, if you like. Richard's eyes narrowed. You always were spoiled. If you have no concern for your people, then I don't see why I should. I am not the one threatening war, Richard. You know how to contact me if you want to discuss a mutually beneficial solution. I closed the link before he could respond. If the Santa Celestia was in orbit, or at least nearby, then Richard could call down a new transport ship in as little as fifteen minutes. I had to clear the atmosphere and jump before he made it back to his ship or we would be in deep trouble. Will you marry him? Locke growled. I spun around. Locke still lounged in the chair where I'd left him, but he was clearly awake and more alert than he'd been. How much had he heard? Enough to know that Richard wanted to marry. Would I? That was the million-dollar question, wasn't it? I sighed. I don't know. I do care about our people. If it really would prevent a war, I would have to trade my happiness for theirs. What's one person compared to the verse, huh? The words were more bitter than I had anticipated. You know it won't be that easy. I know. That's why I'm still running. I'll run until I can't. Then I'll either stand and fight or resign myself to my fate. I shook off the bitterness and refocused. For now, I have to get us moving before Richard decides to blow us up for the fun of it. Do you have a destination in mind? I was thinking Alpha Phoenix's Dwarf Zero. APD Zero was a large, well-known black market in planet form. Anything that could be bought resided on APD Zero, and everything could be purchased for the right money. The houses turned a blind eye to the less-than-legal dealings because they all got a cut. And while I normally would choose a space station to disappear, with the addition of Veronica, Lynn, and Ema, my contact on APT-0 might come in handy. That would be my choice as well. There are plenty of smaller options, but it will be easier to get lost on APT-0. I punched in the destination but routed us through two gates, the engines ramped up as we prepared to exit the atmosphere. As soon as we were clear, the FTL would engage to jump us to the first gate. I shouldn't have any difficulty withdrawing your money when we get there, I said. Then you'll have your choice of destinations. I'd gotten used to having Marcus around. When he was gone, I would miss him. A few minutes later, my stomach dropped as the FTL drive engaged. The transition was butter smooth, though. The lights didn't even flicker. Infinian requested a jump point from the gate. Once given, a gate jump point was reliable for two hours. We were 80th in the queue. With the FTL cooldown showing an hour, it would be a race to see if the drive would be ready before the gate gave us the end point. There's nothing else we can do here for now. Let's get you down to the med bay, so I can run a scan on you. I'm fine, Locke grumbled. You had a very odd reaction to the Foxy, and you looked like hell when I came to get you at the detention center. Let's just make sure everything is okay. It'll only take a second. Please? Fine. But don't think I've forgotten how you tried to stun me. That gave me pause. 
You remember that? He smiled a slow, heated smile. I remember everything. But you were acting so strangely. At first it was like you didn't even recognize me. Then... I trailed off with a blush. I'll admit I was out of it at the time, but my memories are fine. If I'd known it was a street dose of Foxy, I would have been more careful. Sorry, I didn't know either. Veronica got it for me at the last second after I saw you on the surveillance camera. I thought I might need it just to get you out of the detention center. I heal fast, Locke said. Richard was just toying with me, trying to get me to give up your location. He hadn't started getting creative. Why didn't you? Give up the location. Because I figured you'd go back there looking for me. And I made a promise to help you escape. And because Richard would have beaten me anyway. I skipped the ladder and led him down the stairs. The main part of the ship consisted of three levels. The upper level contained the flight deck and captain's quarters. The middle level included the crew quarters and mess hall. The bottom level was the med bay, exercise room, and the maintenance access for the engine and life support systems. The med bay door slid open. As modern as the rest of the ship, the med bay glowed with polished metal and white plastic. It barely looked used. Locke eased himself up on the diagnostic table without being asked. He might put on a strong front, but by the way he moved, something hurt. He lay down gingerly. I set the scanner to run a full-body diagnostic. Is there anywhere in particular that hurts? I asked while I waited for the scan to finish. Well, doctor, he growled in that deep, sexy voice. I do have one area that's giving me a hard time. Think you could give me a hand? It took a supreme effort of will to keep my eyes glued to his face. I think that perhaps the Foxy isn't out of your system yet. The scanner beeped, saving me from further comment. My eyes widened at the list of injuries, listed from most to least severe. I had to scroll to see the entire list. Bones in various stages of healing were scattered throughout his body, with many in his hands and feet. Both legs had been broken and were still healing, along with a set of cracked ribs. His kidneys had deep bruising around them. Cuts on his sides and back needed to be cleaned and bandaged, and a knife wound to his shoulder still seemed to be bleeding. I looked for the hole, but it was concealed under his torn and dirty black shirt. How are you moving? I whispered to myself. Even if he had nanobots and they were operating at full capacity, most of these wounds wouldn't be this healed unless they were days older. But he'd been fine on the ship. Hadn't he? Something didn't add up. Am I going to live, Doc? He asked as he sat up. Of course. But first you need to take off your shirt so I can bandage the worst of it. Then you need eight hours of downtime, minimum. The shirt I can do. He pulled the tattered shirt off over his head with a grunt. Even his killer abs couldn't distract from the extensive dark purple bruising that covered most of his torso. I made a pained sound and reached out to touch him. He caught my hand. It looks worse than it is. I mutely shook my head. There was no way he could brush this off. Someone had beaten him savagely, most likely while he was shackled and unable to defend himself. He should have told them where I was. He tilted my chin up until I was forced to look away from the bruises. It wouldn't have mattered. This is not your fault. I pushed my emotions down behind a wall of icy calm. Of course it is, I said briskly. I stepped around him and opened drawers and cabinets until I'd found the supplies I needed to bandage him. The knife wound in his shoulder oozed blood as I dabbed at it with disinfectant. Now you've helped me escape twice, so I shall pay you twice. As soon as we land on APD Zero, I'll make the transfer. Or get hard credits, if you prefer. Then you can disappear before Richard shows up. 
You seem awfully keen on getting rid of me. Why? I don't want you to get hurt again because of me. And the longer you stay, the more likely you'll get caught. I have at least two houses and a host of mercenaries after me. And if it really is going to come to war, I'll have to return home. As one of the expendables, I'll be expected on the front to bolster morale, if nothing else. Something shifted in his expression. He went from teasing to predator in the blink of an eye. I stilled, my hand frozen halfway to his shoulder. Do not mistake me for a little lost lamb. I've been dodging mercs for a very long time. I am here because I want to be. I will leave when I'm ready. Nothing you can do will change that. And if you call yourself expendable again... His voice dropped into a deep, dangerous rumble. You won't like the consequences. We clear. I swallowed and nodded. I had treated him too familiarly. Somewhere along the way, I had started to see the man and had forgotten about the devil. I finished cleaning and bandaging his wounds with quick clinical detachment. If only I could rein in my emotions as easily. The wall was harder to build after you already knew someone. I retreated into my public persona. I have done what I can, I said. Would you like a shot for the pain? Locke slid off the table and invaded my space. I straightened and stood my ground. His fingers slid along my jaw in the softest caress. Don't hide from me, Ada, he said quietly. It is better this way, I said. Help yourself to whatever. I waved a hand at the cabinets behind him, then beat a hasty retreat. I stopped to check in on Veronica on the way out to the flight deck. She and Lynn and Ema had settled into two side-by-side -side rooms. Veronica cast nervous glances my way, but I was too tired to deal with her tonight. Tomorrow would be soon enough. The flight deck was quiet. Thirty minutes and we could jump. We'd moved up to tenth in the gate queue. The first jump was to a busy gate on the opposite side of the universe from our destination. Two jumps was a risk, but I needed time to scrub the ship's registration to leave a false trail, especially before we landed on APD-0. While we waited, I kicked off a full-system diagnostics test. It might reveal some of the trackers Richard was no doubt using. I also pulled out my comm and searched for bugs the old-fashioned way. I found two, a location tracker and an audio bug. I'd have to go through the ship one room at a time if I intended to keep it. I checked the captain's quarters while waiting for the diagnostic results. The comm didn't find any bugs. I guess Richard valued his privacy. The diagnostic came back with a few questionable items. None were critical, so I disabled them all until I could dig deeper into their functions. A chime announced the gate had given us a location. Five minutes until the FTL drive was ready. I dozed until the jump woke me. I checked our location and surroundings. We were exactly where I'd requested. I rubbed my eyes and got to work on the first registration change. By the time we landed in Sedition, the largest city on APD-0, Infinian had been renamed and re-registered twice. Now named Polaris, it was registered to one of the many dummy corporations I owned. It wouldn't pass a deep dive but no one was likely to look that closely. And because it was supposedly a Merc ship, the name wasn't written on the outside. Bonus. The name changes would make tracking us a little more difficult, but I doubted they would slow Richard that much. Much more interestingly, each FTL jump actually had required just one hour of downtime, even with two jumps back to back. That would require looking into, but not tonight. I just didn't have the mental capacity to dive into an unknown engine system tonight. I locked the ship down tight. In universal time, it was morning and I'd been up all night. On APD-0, it was just after 11 at night, so no one would expect us to leave the ship tonight.
I'd already paid the docking fee for a week. Now I needed at least a few hours of sleep or I was going to fall on my face at the first opportunity. I stumbled toward the captain's quarters with a jaw-cracking yawn. I closed and locked the door. I didn't really think anyone on the ship would attempt to take me out. But you never know how a scared mother will react to a situation where her kid could be at risk. I continued through the sitting room into the bedroom, only to stop in the doorway. Marcus Locke lay sprawled across my bed, wearing only black boxer briefs and barely covered by the sheet. He hadn't been here earlier when I checked for bugs. My eyes were gritty with lack of sleep. I was entirely too tired to deal with this shit. The urge to kick him out was nearly overwhelming. But he was injured. I sighed softly. The sofa would have to do for tonight because I didn't think I could make it downstairs to a crew bed. Come on, Locke said. The bed is big enough to share. Sleeping only. His teeth flashed white in the dark. Unless you have other ideas. I entered the room. Why are you here? I wanted to talk to you but you were so deep in whatever you were doing you didn't even notice me enter the flight deck. So I waited here. Then when you still didn't show, I decided if I was here anyway, I should sleep. Doctor's orders. We already said all that needed to be said. No, we didn't. Locke said quietly. But that is a discussion for later. Get in bed before you fall down. If you want, I'll sleep on the sofa. Spite and hurt almost had me blurting the demand. Only the memory of the livid bruises stilled my tongue. No funny business, I said. I stripped down to my t-shirt and underwear, put my smart glasses on the nightstand, then crawled into bed. Locke hauled me close when I would have hugged my edge. I protested and tried to wiggle away. Just sleep, Ada. He murmured against the back of my neck. I've got you. I focused on relaxing each muscle, one at a time. I had only made it halfway before the warmth and security of Locke's body at my back lulled me into sleep. Chapter 14 I awoke with the pleasant stiffness that meant I had slept deep and long. I had forgotten to set an alarm, so no telling what time it was. An arm tightened around my middle when I would have rolled over, and Locke nuzzled the back of my neck. Morning, he murmured. I stiffened. I could count on one hand the number of times I'd woken up with a man. As the daughter of a high house... I had to be careful, both because I was completely defenseless during sex and because many men thought they could use my body to win my heart, and therefore my name. My hookups had been with men I'd trusted, but even then it wasn't usually a stay-the-night kind of event. Locke's thumb drew a distracting little circle on my waist, and all thoughts of being careful scattered. He slid his hand under my shirt and his palm blazed a trail of heat up my body. When he stopped at my ribs, I arched an invitation. His hand remained where it was. I huffed in annoyance, and he chuckled. Did you want something? I wanted his hands on my breasts, his mouth on my nipples. I wanted him inside of me. The sheer force of my desire shocked me. I took a deep breath and reined in my wayward body. I want many things, I said honestly. But I should get up. Locke pulled me over onto my back and pressed up against my right side. His hand slid out from under my shirt and I shivered from the loss. His grin told me that I wasn't playing it as cool as I thought. It also made him unbearably sexy. Down, girl. What is your plan for the day? He asked. 
I shoved aside my desire and mentally sorted through all of the things that needed to happen today. The bank first, I think. Then I can decide if it's worth renting a room or if I should just keep running. Plus, it'll be done if I get caught. I will go with you, Locke said. What else? Talk to Veronica, scan the ship for trackers, figure out what supplies I'll need and purchase them, update my sister. Really, the list goes on forever. What time is it? Almost ten, local time, Locke said. Shit. No wonder I felt like I'd slept hard. I'd been asleep for nearly eleven hours. That was plenty of time for Richard to catch up with us if he'd managed to track me straight here. I pushed myself up and out of the bed. Shower first. But for that, I needed my bag of clothes. While I stood thinking, Locke rolled out of bed. All of that gloriously exposed skin drew my eye. But the bandages refocused my attention. His abs were barely bruised this morning. Just a faint yellow hinted at what had been. Even with nanobots, healing that fast was incredible. Maybe he'd spent some extra time in the med bay before he came up to talk last night. My eyes dropped lower. His boxer briefs did very little to conceal the impressive erection tenting the fabric. Sweetheart, you keep looking at me like that and we're going to be back in the bed in two seconds flat. I lingered for a long second torn between keeping my distance and gobbling him up. It was already going to hurt when he left. What was a little more pain? He must have sensed my hesitation, though, because he turned away with a growl. I put your clothes bag in the bathroom. After you get dressed, I'll meet you in the mess. I showered. With hot water, soap, and shampoo then put on the pale blue tunic and dull gold pants I'd tried to wear on TSD-9. I draped the blue and gold scarf over my shoulders. Before I went out, I'd wrap it around my head and neck until just my eyes were visible as extra insurance against recognition. The mess hall was half dining room, half galley. Two long tables that each sat eight took up most of the room. They were upgraded models with plastic tops modeled to look like wood. A gleaming industrial kitchen lined the back wall. A state-of-the-art commercial food synthesizer was placed next to an old-fashioned fridge and stove. The extra weight alone proved that this was Richard's personal ship. No merc captain would bother with real food prep when a synthesizer could do it for a fraction of the cost and weight. Locke sat at the end of the first table and gestured me to a seat with a covered plate. I sat and removed the thermal cover. I was greeted with steaming eggs, bacon, and toast. I looked up in awe. Thank you, I said. The corner of Locke's mouth tipped up. While I appreciate the fact that you think I can cook, you should thank Veronica. I just saved you a plate before Tiny ate it all. I took my time and savored the first real food I'd had since the Mayport. Though simple... The eggs and bacon were delicious. Where is Veronica? I asked when I was finished. Last I heard, she was planning to let the kid burn off some energy in the fitness room. Okay. I need to stop by and see how much I owe her and how she'd like the money. Then I'm ready. You? I'm ready. I could hear the shrieking laughter even before I made it all the way downstairs. Veronica's voice came from the fitness room artificially low. I'm gonna get you. By the time I made it to the door, Veronica had Lynn pinned on the sparring mat and was tickling him breathless. Sorry to interrupt, I said after Veronica had helped her son up, but I'm getting ready to go out and need to talk to you for a second. Veronica pushed her messy hair behind her ears and came over, expression wary. Should I get Emma to watch Lynn? She asked quietly. No, this is not that talk. I'm headed to the bank. How much do I owe you for the supplies, and how would you like to be paid? Shock, surprise, then mild offense chased each other across her face. You don't owe me anything, she said. If anything, I owe you. But no, she snapped, 
low and fierce. I would have paid anything to get off that planet. I would have given up every last penny. Paying for the supplies that allowed my escape is the least I can do. She looked like an avenging angel, and it transformed her from pretty into stunning. I bowed low. Thank you, I said. I accept your gift with gratitude. She smiled, and the stunning goddess was once again a pretty woman. I should have known you would understand. She returned my bow. I did understand. Knowing whether to accept a gift on first offer or to refuse once or more was part of my lessons, so I didn't embarrass our house. And if I had refused her generosity, it would have been an insult. But not only that, I also knew about the burning desire to be the master of your own future. Do you need anything while I am out? I asked. Or do you want to go with us? She thought about it, then shook her head. No, I will stay here with Lynn and Ima. She paused. Unless you need protection. I may not be special ops, as you requested, but I am not unskilled. I've got it covered. Locke rumbled from behind me. Stay. Play with your kid. We'll talk when I get back. Figure out what the plan is, what I can do to help, I said. I've shut down the ship's external communications, so if you need to contact me, use your comm. You have one, right? I do. Okay. See you in a little while. I wrapped the scarf around my head while we waited for the cargo door to open. It was a bit tricky without a mirror, and I fiddled with it until Locke grabbed my wrist. It is fine, he said. When we get out, I'll be playing your bodyguard. He pulled on a dark cloak he'd found. You'll roast in that, I said. Heat already poured in from the narrow opening in the cargo door. I dreaded going out in long sleeves. It's temperature regulated, he said. Rockhurst kitted this ship with only the best. Damn, now I'm jealous. Maybe I'll buy myself one while we're out. Maybe one in blue, I mused to myself. I like you in blue. Locke said. I hoped the scarf covered my blush. Today I'm Irene while in company. What should I call you? He shrugged. Guards don't have names. Just call me guard. Or better yet, just point at whatever you want me to do. My guards always had names. I suppose Marcus will have to do. It's common enough that people shouldn't immediately associate it with the bounty. I straightened my shoulders, tipped my head up just a bit, and settled firmly into my public persona. It's scary how easily you do that, Marcus said. I raised one imperious eyebrow at him and looked faintly bored. He grinned. That's the whole consortium in a single expression, he said. I had years of practice, I said. We wield expressions like soldiers wield weapons. One disdainful sniff from a house representative to a lower noble, and the whole room will turn on the recipient. But we have to be careful, too. Wars have been started over unintentional insults. Sounds tedious, Marcus said. Incredibly. Are you ready? At his nod, I stepped out into the bright midday sun. Stifling heat seared my face. It would be better on the city streets where a combination of building shades and thermoregulators would be hard at work to keep the heat tolerable. The transport I'd called waited at the bottom of the ramp. I made sure the cargo door closed and locked, then slipped into the transport's cool interior. Locke followed me in and sat across from me. I touched my right thumb and middle finger, then ran my secondary identity chip over the reader. Take me to the nearest von Hasenberg bank. I requested. A location popped up on screen, five minutes away. I confirmed, and the transport glided away from Polaris. The spaceport I'd chosen was tiny, with just a single berth perched on top of a middling building. Hundreds or thousands of such ports existed across the city, and ports for the larger ships ringed the outskirts. Buildings towered around us, 
protecting our little port from all but the most eagle-eyed spotters. Once we glided off the edge of the 200-story building, the glass panel in the floor of the transport, ostensibly for tourists but used most frequently to make sure no one was tracking you from below, revealed the chaos inherent in a city of over a hundred million crammed into an area just under eight square kilometers. Sedition was the largest city on APD Zero by population, but one of the smallest by size. Situated on an island, it had grown vertically when the land ran out. Transport traffic was constant and mind-boggling at every level. Our transport slid into the flow heading down. In sedition, the closer you were to the ground, the better off. Only the highest-end luxury brands and the most world-class smugglers and privateers could afford ground-floor rent. The reason was simple. The lower you went, the better shielded you were from the ferocious sun. It also meant that if you tossed so much as a drop of water over the side of your balcony, you faced up to a year in prison. The rich didn't appreciate dodging detritus from the sky. We were headed to the largest von Hassenberg bank in sedition. It took up an entire ground floor block. The rent would have been astronomical if the house didn't own the entire building. The other houses also owned their own blocks for similar reasons. APD Zero might be a smuggler's haven, but the houses wanted everyone to know that the black market flourished only because of their benevolence. The transport settled onto a wide, tree-lined avenue. Men and women in expensive clothes strolled sedately along the shops. If you wanted to see and be seen, this was the place, which was a little tricky for someone who wanted to remain anonymous. Luckily, I wasn't the first person reluctant to show my face on a street full of wolves. We rounded the corner and entered the private garage reserved for bank customers. And Irene Marie was quite a long-standing customer. Once the transport stopped, I told it to wait for us to return, then moved to exit. Lock. Marcus. Blocked my way. Bodyguard first, he said. He climbed out, all dark clothes and radiating danger. After a few seconds, he reached in to help me out. He fell in behind me as I headed for the VIP doors. I hit the doorman with my mother's stare before he could embarrass us both by asking for my credentials. He turned magenta and opened the door so quickly it hit him in the face. Inside, the VIP lobby was done in tasteful shades of cream, brown, and gilt. The whole place screamed old money, including the man moving to meet me. A middle-aged gentleman in a suit that cost more than most people made in a year. He would be easy to dismiss if you didn't notice his shark-like eyes. Those eyes took in my simple clothes in a single glance. Madam, I am Mr. Stanley. How may I be of service today? He asked. Perhaps I could direct you to our regular lobby? He all but oozed false obsequiousness. Unfortunately, I knew his type. If I let him help me, he would poke his nose so far into my affairs that I'd never escape the bank. I settled more firmly into my aristocratic persona. Nothing got bankers moving like an angry aristocrat. No, you will not do, I said with a sniff. I looked around. A harassed-looking young man walking by carrying a stack of papers. Him, I said, pointing. But, madam, Mr. Stanley started. No, I said. When he didn't move, I let my expression, mostly hidden by the scarf, go glacial. Perhaps you did not hear me, I said in a saccharine voice. Guard, I snapped my fingers at Marcus. Do you think he has gone deaf? Help him with his hearing. With pleasure, my lady, Marcus rumbled. He stepped out from behind me, a towering wall of muscle covered by a dark cloak. There is no need, madam, Mr. Stanley said nervously. I'll go get him and be right back. I inclined my head a fraction. Sometimes playing a bitch was awesome. Having fun, are you? Marcus murmured to me. Oh, yes, I said. My smile was hidden by the scarf, but he could probably see it in my eyes. 
Excellent work, by the way. He nodded once and returned to his position behind my right shoulder. Mr. Stanley returned with the younger man in tow. This is Mr. Rochester. How may we help you? Mr. Rochester, take me to a private room. The young man looked a little bewildered, but he knew an order when he heard one. The older man tried to follow us. You are not needed, I said. I turned away without another word and followed Mr. Rochester to one of the rooms set aside to conduct sensitive business. Um, here is the room, madam, Mr. Rochester said. He held the door open while I swept inside. Once we sat, I checked the room for bugs and found none. Excellent. I sat in one of the plush chairs facing the desk. How long have you been with the bank? He moved to sit behind the desk. Four years, madam. I assure you, even though I am a junior banker, I can assist with whatever you need. Very good. I need to make several large withdrawals from a private account. Please set up the terminal for an immediate withdrawal from a numbered account and then wait outside. The young man's eyes widened, but he started typing on the terminal in front of him. FTL communication was expensive and finicky. Only financial institutions and houses had enough at stake to make it worthwhile. Everyone else waited for their messages to bounce through gates, carried by passing ships and communication drones. But it meant that in order to move large amounts of money, you had to physically be at a bank or wait up to two weeks for the transaction to be confirmed. I didn't have two weeks. Accessing my house account would alert Father to my location, and if he happened to be near an FTL comm terminal, he could order the bank employees to detain me until a retrieval team arrived. So that account was out, even though it was the one with the most money. Fortunately, I had more than one account, including several numbered accounts. Not tied to any identity chip, numbered accounts were anonymous, but also dangerous. If you forgot the account number or access code, the money was gone forever. Luckily, I was very good with numbers. The terminal is ready, madam. Are you transferring between accounts or do you need credit chips? I will take it from here. My guard will alert you once I am finished. Mr. Rochester turned the terminal toward me, bobbed a half bow, then exited the room and closed the door behind him. That was the nice thing about junior bankers. They knew how to follow orders and not be a nuisance. I laid two anonymous credit chips on the desk, then pulled up the privacy screen. The other problem with numbered accounts is that anyone with a number could access them. And while I didn't think Marcus would rob me, better safe than sorry. I typed in the account number and access code. A second of delay, and then my balance appeared. This account had just under a million credits. I withdrew 200,000 and fitted the first credit chip into the reader. A pleasant beep confirmed the transaction. With Marcus taken care of, I considered how much money to withdraw from myself. The account linked to the identity I had chosen for this planet had nearly a 100,000 credits in it. It was unlikely that I would need more, but another trip to the bank would be an additional risk. I withdrew another 100,000 credits onto the second chip. Numbered accounts did not keep transaction records. Oh, they kept the running balance and showed when money had been added or removed, but they kept no records of where that money came from or went to. Because anonymous money transfers were so ripe for abuse, opening a numbered account required a house ID. You didn't have to give the banker your name or let them scan your ID chip, but if you couldn't produce a house seal, then you couldn't open the account. The lack of transactional records meant that when these credit chips were used, the money couldn't be tied back to my numbered account. So I could transfer the money from the credit chip to Irene's account without compromising the secrecy of the numbered account. It was the same way I got money into the numbered account in the first place. I logged out of the account and carefully wiped the terminal screen clean of fingerprints. I lowered the privacy screen and placed the two credit chips in internal zippered pockets, keeping them separate. Time to go, I said. Marcus opened the door and stepped out. At his signal that it was clear, 
I followed him. Mr. Rochester snapped to attention. Madam, is there anything else you need? No. Thank you for your assistance. I am leaving. Mr. Rochester bowed and escorted us to the door. Marcus and I entered the waiting transport without incident. I sighed and let my public persona fall away. Do you need anything while we're out? I asked. I was thinking about buying some new clothes, but I can drop you at the ship first if you'd like to head out early. I go where you go, he said. I could use some more clothes, too, assuming you're not shopping down here. The thought of Marcus Locke in a suit derailed my thought process for a solid minute. All of that muscle and menace hidden beneath a bespoke suit would be a sight to see. Yum. I shook myself out of thoughts of getting Locke out of said suit and handed him the credit chip with his money on it. This is what I owe you, I said. There's no transaction history, so don't lose it. Locke pocketed the chip without comment. Handing the money over was bittersweet. My obligation was finished. But now he had no reason to stick around. I guess today is our last day together, I said, hoping he would deny my words. He did not. I pushed aside my hurt and directed our transport to a shopping district in the 200s. High enough to be cheap, but not so high as to be poor quality. Most of the middle class shopped in this district. And around the periphery was a thriving black market where you could buy anything from jewelry to weapons to pleasure. The transport dropped us on a landing pad on floor 215. I ended our ride and confirmed the fare deduction. Once we were out, the transport glided away to pick up the next passenger. I'd order a new transport when we were done shopping. This was not my first trip to sedition. But even so, the sheer scale boggled the mind on every visit. Looking around, it was easy to forget that we were hundreds of meters in the air. Even the harsh sun was partially blocked thanks to the higher levels. Shops opened out to wide walkways bustling with pedestrians. Plazas dotted with small trees connected adjacent buildings, both on our level and above and below us. With the exception of the tall plastic and glass wall that prevented accidental falls, this could be a shopping street on any planet. I moved away from the transport pad. The better deals were found when you had to walk more than two meters to get to the store. Locke followed me, just off my right shoulder. You don't have to play bodyguard here, I said. I can look after myself, and we can meet up later. You can shop for whatever you need. I'm not playing, Locke said. That bastard is still after you, and I am looking forward to meeting him again. Locke's expression filled with so much predatory anticipation that I almost felt bad for Richard. Almost. Yes, but that bastard will likely be after me forever. You can't protect me forever. And despite what it looked like when we met, I do a decent job of keeping a low profile. Locke remained stubbornly silent and glued to my shoulder. At least walk beside me, I said. In case you haven't noticed, bodyguards are not plentiful at this level. 
We'll draw more attention if you keep stalking along behind me. Locke grumbled something unpleasant but moved up next to me. Other pedestrians still gave us a wide berth. I purchased a temperature-regulating cloak at the first shop we stopped at. Cream with blue trim, it was in no way practical. But it was beautiful, and it kept the sun from making me sweat. So I bought it. It would be destroyed the first time I took it anywhere near a dirty ship. So I also bought a dark gray cloak as a backup. We crossed over a pedestrian bridge to the next building. I passed all of the little boutiques with their bright colors and cute outfits with barely a glance, until a red dress in a display caught my attention and wouldn't let go. I wandered over to the window. The dress had a fitted bodice with short cap sleeves and a v-neck. A full skirt hit the mannequin just above the knees. I loved it. But if a cream cloak was impractical, this dress was wildly unsuitable. You should try it on, Locke said. Where would I wear it? In the engine room? It's just something I'll eventually have to leave behind. I suppressed the sigh that tried to escape. One day I would wear dresses like this whenever I wanted. It just wasn't today. I walked away from the dress without looking back. On the next block, I found the store I was looking for. It carried both men's and women's styles in simple cuts of sturdy fabric. I wouldn't win any fashion awards, but the clothes would stand up to whatever I threw at them. Locke wandered off to the men's section while I dug through the women's options. I found a few shirts in my size in various sleeve lengths. The pants I needed to actually try on because it was difficult to find something that fit without sagging. I grabbed a few pairs and headed for the dressing room. After a frustrating ten minutes, I found one pair of pants that weren't horrible. I went back to see if they had more of that style. And of course they didn't. So I settled for what I had and went to find Marcus. He lounged by the door, package already in hand. I paid for my purchases and joined him. We exited the shop and kept going, drifting farther and farther from the good parts of the district. You're looking for something or just trying to find trouble? Locke finally asked. Can't it be both? I asked. He didn't even grin. If you must know, I'm looking for a weapons dealer that used to be around here, but he must have moved. I don't know what's on the ship, but I'd like a new blast pistol and some more ammo. In that case, we'll need a transport. I've been here before. I ordered a transport to meet us at the next landing. We climbed in and Locke set the destination. We crossed the city, then descended to the ground. I raised an eyebrow. Reese has done very well for himself in the last few years, Locke said. I only knew of one Reese who sold weapons in sedition but I kept the knowledge to myself. An old friend? I asked. Something like that. Let me do the talking and try to look inconspicuous. What kind of blaster do you want? Small. A mosier catch him if he has one. Otherwise, anything that is small enough to be easily concealable. I don't need any fancy extras, but I won't turn them down as long as they don't make the gun bigger. Anything else? Nothing specific, but I'm not opposed to buying more. Really depends on what he has. The transport rolled to a stop in an alley. A single steel door broke up the expanse of wall. Yeah, this seemed like an ideal place to get murdered. If I wasn't pretty sure we were meeting Reese Sebastian, I would have bailed. I'll go first. You stick close. If anyone gives you shit, let me deal with it. I paid for the transport, then touched my thumb and pinky, reverting to the likely compromised identity of Irina Hassan, just in case. No reason to burn a perfectly good identity, because while scanning identity chips without notice was against the law, I doubted a black market arms dealer much cared. Locke stepped out but didn't offer me a hand. I pulled up the hood of my cloak and climbed out on my own. The transport slid away. Locke pounded on the door. What do you want? A rough voice asked from a hidden speaker. Tell Reese that Locke is here to see him. We waited in silence. Finally, the door swung inward to reveal a long, dim hallway and nothing else. We stepped inside and the door slammed shut behind us. Locke didn't even pause. 
We climbed two flights of stairs, then came out in a small foyer. A beautiful brunette sat behind a gleaming, spotless desk. Please sit, she said, indicating the leather chairs behind us. Mr. Sebastian will see you shortly. Locke crossed his arms and didn't move. The receptionist shrugged a delicate shoulder and turned back to her comm terminal. Time ticked past in tiny, frozen increments. Standing behind Locke, I settled in for a long wait. Perhaps twenty minutes later, the brunette looked up from her comm terminal. Mr. Sebastian will see you now, she said. She indicated the door to her right. I trailed Locke through the door into a richly appointed office. Real wood floors covered by antique Persian rugs led to a wall of windows looking down on the main avenue through sedition. And between us and the windows sat Rhys Sebastian. Rhys and I had started off as friendly acquaintances and had slowly morphed into true friends. Rhys had acquired a few hard-to-find items for me back when I worked for House von Hausenberg. Thanks to that acquaintance and my knowledge of his skill and discretion, he was one of the first people I'd turned to when I escaped. But back then, he'd been operating from up in the 200s. Reese had definitely done well for himself. We'd kept in touch regularly over the last two years. He had mentioned his business was doing well, but he had failed to mention how well. And he knew Marcus. I smiled under my scarf. This would be interesting. Reese stood. He was as tall and nearly as broad as Locke, with the same sense of contained violence that his expensive suit did little to hide. His hair was blonde and cut close to his skull. But where Locke was roughly attractive, Reese was perfectly, classically handsome, a statue of an ancient god brought to life. Locke, what brings you to my piece of the world? Reese asked as he came out from behind his desk. Reese's age had always been difficult for me to estimate, but after seeing him with Marcus, I guessed they were the same age. Mid to late twenties. My friend needs a little something for personal protection, Locke said. I figured you could help out. Reese flicked a dismissive glance at me, then paused and looked again. He pulled a blaster seemingly from thin air and pointed it at Locke. Move away from the lady. Locke crossed his arms and stepped closer to me, blocking Reese from view. No. It was not a request. Move or I will shoot you, and I won't be aiming for a limb. You can try, Locke said. I peeked around Locke's shoulder. Gentlemen, while this is all very amusing, perhaps we could get to the business at hand. Reese, put the gun away unless you're planning to shoot me, in which case, Marcus, you have my permission to shoot back. Reese nodded, and the gun disappeared as quickly as it had appeared. Lady Ada, I had to be sure you weren't being held against your will. You two know each other, Locke said, something strange in his voice. Surprise, I said. I stepped up beside him. In my defense, you didn't specify which Reese we were going to see, and these are new digs. Very nice, by the way. It was your money that helped me get here. So you have my thanks. I tilted my head. Does that mean you won't alert the authorities now that I have a substantial price on my head? Locke cursed quietly, but Reese just grinned. I'm rich as hell now. I don't need your father's money. And that would be a poor way to show my gratitude. But in return, I insist you have dinner with me tonight. A pointed glance at Locke. Alone. Like hell she will. Locke growled. I pushed back my own urge to accept just because Locke refused to let me make my own decisions. It was clear Reese had added the alone stipulation just to yank Locke's chain. Meeting Reese again for dinner would be a risk, but he'd helped me before and nothing indicated he would betray me now. Plus, he wouldn't have offered if he didn't have a reason. I'd be delighted, I said, as long as I can bring a guest. Locke settled slightly, correctly guessing that he would be my guest. I continued, And as long as you understand that my wardrobe is lacking, what you see is what you get. You look lovely as always, Reese said. 
but I would be honored to send over some dresses for you to choose from, if you desire. I still have your sizes from last time. A world of insinuation saturated his tone. Locke went stone cold. Reese noticed it as well, because he half turned into a defensive position. I hooked my hand around Locke's bicep, just above his elbow, like he was escorting me on a walk. His arm felt like touching sun-heated granite. I wasn't sure what I could do if he decided to attack. But for all of his needling, Reese was a friend and I didn't want to see him killed. Thank you for the kind offer, but I must decline, I said. I happen to like these clothes. I felt like I was wading through a consortium gathering where one wrong step could mean war. The last time I'd talked to Reese in person, he'd been at turns aloof and amusing. I narrowed my eyes at him. This new persona was annoying and unwelcome. Reese watched the entire interaction with sharp eyes and a half grin. When it was clear neither of us would comment further, he sighed and smiled. Luck, you know you're always welcome at my table. I'm just messing with you. And it was quite illuminating. I thought you'd gotten smarter over the years, Reese. Locke rumbled. Don't make me kick your ass, because I won't hesitate to do it. Dinner with both of them seemed like torture. Perhaps I could bow out and the two of them and their egos could dine? Do you have a gun for the lady or are you all talk? Locke asked, exasperated. What happened to the last one? Reese asked me. I had it until Father dropped the bounty on my head. Then I had to leave it when Merck started sniffing around. Been traveling light ever since. I shrugged off the pain. Leaving things behind bothered me. I could live a nomadic life, but I didn't enjoy it. I was more of a home and hearth kind of woman. My offer still stands, you know, Reese said, almost gently. Locke's arm which had started to relax under my hand, returned to granite. It would be a miracle if these two didn't come to blows. I squeezed Locke's arm slightly. I know, I said, and it means a lot, but my answer remains the same. In that case, let's see what I have in the armory. We managed to leave without bloodshed. I picked up two tiny blast pistols and Locke bought a few bigger guns including a shotgun. He seemed to be loading for war. As the transport slid away from Reese's door, Locke asked, What did Reese offer you? Just let it go, Marcus, I said. What did he offer you? He demanded. I huffed out a frustrated breath. He offered me a home, I said. Locke's jaw clenched but not what you're thinking. He offered to make me a silent partner in his business, which he had just started to rapidly expand. He offered me a place to stay, not his house, and vowed to misdirect anyone following me. He was entirely honorable. Locke grunted. If he thought he was getting off that easy, he was so, so wrong. Care to explain what all that was about? And how do you know Reese in the first place? Locke's expression shuddered. We've known each other for years, he said. I waited for him to continue, and when he didn't, I pointed a finger at him. No, you don't get to demand answers from me, then blow off my questions. He hit me with a cold stare and remained silent. It felt like an unexpected dagger between the ribs. I blinked hard and retreated into my public persona where nothing could get close enough to hurt. It took a lifetime, but the transport finally dropped us at the ship. I activated the correct ID chip and waved it over the reader. Then I stepped out into the afternoon sunshine. Thanks to the cloak, the heat was no longer stifling, so I enjoyed the sun on my partially covered face. The urge to get in the ship and fly off to the ass end of nowhere rode me hard. Maybe Veronica would like to go with me. It would be a lot of work but the two of us could manage a ship this size. 
Then the current bane of my existence stepped out of the transport and snapped me out of my dreams. I moved ahead of him up the cargo ramp. Polaris, status report, I said as I approached the door. No one has entered or left the ship, Captain. Currently there are three souls on board. The computer responded from the speaker near the keypad. Open the cargo door, I said. The door slid upward, revealing the cool, dim, empty interior. It wasn't until then that I realized I was gripping my blaster with white knuckles, as if I thought a whole horde of mercs, or worse, Rockhurst soldiers, would be waiting. I stepped inside and Locke followed me. But when I stopped at the door control panel, he disappeared deeper into the ship. While I waited for the cargo door to close, I remotely locked the captain's quarters. Locke could find a new place to sleep. We had a few hours until we needed to leave for dinner. Reese had tried to persuade me to stay, but I needed to talk to Veronica, and I'd put it off long enough. After all, why stop now when I could make this the grand slam of terrible days? I found Veronica in her room, frowning at a calm. The door was open, so I knocked on the jam. Hey, you have a minute to talk? Yes, come in. Let me tell Emma that I'll be busy for a little while. She stepped next door and murmured to the other woman. I swept the room for bugs and trackers and found one. I destroyed it, then sat in the guest chair and ordered my thoughts. Veronica returned and closed the door. She sat cross-legged on the bed. Ask, and I will answer what I can. You are running from Lynn's father, I said. She nodded warily. Which Yamato is it? She looked unhappy, but not surprised that I'd guessed. House Yamato had just three heirs in my generation, two sons and a daughter. None had children of their own yet, so if Lin was the firstborn son, even a bastard, it would be very, very bad. She ran a hand down her face. It is Hitoshi, she said quietly. I half expected it, but the confirmation landed like a punch to the gut. Hitoshi was the eldest Yamato heir, and if I was honest, the one most likely to keep a woman hidden on a backwater planet. Hitoshi was so sweet at first, Veronica continued. It was perfect, and naturally I was thrilled to have caught his attention. But once it became clear that I was pregnant and going to keep the baby... He went insane. I sat back and tried to tamp down the tension her confession had caused. It reminded me of my own disastrous dating experience. Did anyone in the consortium have a normal relationship? How did he get you to TSD-9? I asked. He kidnapped me from my apartment. My parents had kicked me out when they found out I was pregnant. We were well off, and I had been saving my allowance in a private account. It's all I had. Hitoshi dumped me on TSD-9, and since House Yamato controlled it, he prohibited anyone from removing me from the planet on pain of death. When I finally contacted my parents, they didn't care. She spread her hands in an unconscious, helpless gesture. Her parents' decision had hurt. So how did you become a fence? It took a while. Hitoshi sent me a pittance every month, but it was barely enough to feed myself. I knew once the baby was born I'd burn through my savings. So I started working. I started with legitimate goods, but with so few people in the other stores, it was hard to make money. Moving stolen items was much more profitable. I had some close calls, especially early on, but I learned as I went. I knew something about learning as I went. The first few months after I left home, I'd found that theoretical knowledge didn't always translate into practical ability. I couldn't imagine having to learn that lesson while also pregnant. She continued. After a couple years, I'd built enough of a reputation that smugglers from the dark side of the planet started using my shop to sell to the very men who hunted them. That's when my business truly became profitable. What about Ima? Do you trust her? 
If I was Hitoshi, I'd be keeping an eye on Veronica and Lynn by any means possible. And a nanny would be a perfect opportunity. She was my nanny growing up. We kept in touch over the years. When my parents kicked me out, she was the one who helped me find an apartment. She's like my mother. I asked her to come to Gamma Mine, and she did, even though I could barely pay her. She took a deep breath, sighed, and looked down. But even so, I looked into her communications, family, and finances. I'm not proud of it, but Lynn's life was on the line. She's clean. I trust her completely. I nodded. What's your plan now? And how can I help? She leaned forward, her face wary. I need to stay mobile for a while before we settle, or Hitoshi will be able to pick up the trail. I was hoping you would allow me to book passage with you. That's a really bad idea. I felt obligated to point it out. As I already have two houses after me, and this is a stolen ship, it's not safe. No, but nowhere is safe for me right now. You know better than most the reach a high house has. Hitoshi can find me wherever I go unless I obscure the trail completely. And you have reason to stay hidden, too. I'm not saying no, but you should think about it for a while longer. I have a contact on this planet who could likely whisk you away to safety. A brilliant idea occurred. In fact... Why don't you come to dinner with us? I don't... No, this is perfect. You can meet Reese and see if he offers a safer alternative to traveling with me. I don't want you to feel trapped into this decision. Veronica raised an eyebrow with a cool look, and she was once again the capable businesswoman, leaving the scared mother behind. This is not a decision I made lightly, she said. I had planned to take this route as soon as I agreed to help you. Just because you planned it doesn't mean you won't feel trapped, I said gently. I know what I'm talking about. Just come to dinner and see if Reese can help. You don't have to agree to anything or even tell him who you are. Very well. I will attend. What should I wear? She had on dark pants and a pretty green blouse. Your current outfit is perfect. I already told Reese I'd be wearing this, I said indicating my clothes. I stood. We leave at seven. 